Okay, I am Sean Arrington. I am chairing this first session. I'm from Arise and the Labour Assembly Against Austerity. And I am really pleased to welcome you to the start of this day long event, Socialist Solutions to the Crisis. Um, this opening session is called No to Tory Class Warfare for an Economy that Delivers for People and the Planet. Um, and we have some really, really great speakers to start the day and get us kicked off. Um, the whole event today is hosted by Arise, a festival of Labour's left ideas, and hopefully many of you will have seen previous events that we've done. Um, but today brings together a range of left organisations, campaigns and publications. Um, and this is actually the first of five sessions across the day. Um, don't worry, we're going to be having breaks uh, between them all. Um, and so you can just like uh, bob in and out or have us on the background as you do other things in the sun. But we really hope you join us for the whole day. And five sessions because they're all great um we're really delighted to have such great speakers and campaigners join us for this first session and to really bring people together for this discussion on how the conservatives are carrying forward their decade of austerity and cuts um actions that were designed to benefit the richest then and of course we've also seen the restructuring of our economy even more towards the interests of the one percent during the covid pandemic um a pandemic which they've handled uh, incredibly badly and with such fatal and tragic results. Um, um, I think we can really see and feel this reality around us each day. We've seen the running down and privatisation of our public services, um, real pay cuts across the economy. So after a lost decade of wages for millions of people after the financial crash in 2008, last year half of all workers experienced a real wage cut and of course, for public sector workers, including the NHS, the government have been clear that real pay cuts will continue. Um, we've seen the increase in unemployment with many more job losses to come unless further action is taken. And also a further increase in insecure work um, by letting practices such as fire and rehire rip um, on top of the sharp rise in insecure employment that we had already seen over the past decade. Um, we also know that women, black and Asian ethnic minority and disabled people have been the hardest hit by both austerity and the pandemic and will face further attacks in the Tory assault on rights, jobs and living standards to come. Um, and it's been really clear, I think, if any clarity was needed, that the Tories don't have the ambitious policies needed to address the climate emergency. Any action they do take is insufficient and designed to look after the wealthiest first. Um, but there is an alternative, and that's really what we're going to be discussing today. Polling again and again shows the popularity of socialist policies to address the crisis, such as expanding public ownership, a massive programme of investment um, for decent public transport, public services and housing, to mention in just some aspects of a Green New Deal and substantial increases in public sector pay and the minimum wage. So now is the time for Labour to put forward a radical vision of the future, including the bold policies we've just developed for massive public investment for this transition and to decarbonise our economy. And that's some of the aspects we're going to touch on in this session in particular and also throughout the day. Um, as the session goes on, uh, please do post questions in the comments below the stream on YouTube and in the question and answer section on Zoom. And we're going to be putting some to our panel. And um, there's going to be short breaks between sessions, as I mentioned earlier, and a slightly longer lunch break um, after the second session. Um, as I mentioned earlier, if you're on Zoom or YouTube, you can stay on throughout the day, just on the same link. Uh, just leave it playing while you bob off and make a cup of tea and some lunch. Um, and please also uh, donate at the link provided so Arise can continue hosting these important events um, and support other campaigns and links that we're going to be putting in the chat throughout the event. So you can link up with the campaigners that we're featuring in today's event. Um, so I'm going to hand over to our speakers. Um, they're going to all introduce so they're going to have about uh, nine, ten minutes each, and then we're going to do rounds of questions um, that you've put to them. So first of all, I'm going to hand over to Ben Shacko, um, who's the editor of The Morning Star. Um, the Morning Star is one of Arise's media partners, and we're really delighted to work with them again today. And we're always pleased to have Ben on a panel. So, Ben. Thanks very much, Sean. Um, I'm just thinking it's... it's uh, um, Quite appropriate that we're we're holding this conference today as the the world's richest countries are meeting in, in Cornwall 
uh, supposedly putting the world to rights. The theme of this session is no to Tory class warfare for an economy that delivers for people and planet. Um, if we were to believe everything that we're hearing from Cornwall in the last few days, then we're, there's no point in this meeting at all because Boris Johnson has that under control. Uh, this morning he was talking about how important it was that we don't repeat the mistakes of the last crisis, the big economic recession of 2008, when the recovery was not uniform across all parts of society. Not mentioning why that might have been, the fact that it was his party that um, enacted the devastating austerity measures that made Britain so much more unequal and in fact undermined our ability to cope with the pandemic when it struck by um, part privatising public services and in various other ways which we can look at. But this hypocrisy from Boris Johnson is not um, unusual. In fact, he's been um, coming out with a lot of this sort of stuff this week. Um, yesterday, he was saying that he was um, behind a vision for a cleaner, greener world, a solution to the problems of climate change. He wanted to generate many, many millions of high-wage, high-skilled jobs. Um, possibly the most hypocritical thing he'd said for almost 24 hours, because on Thursday, he claimed that his government had led the way in efforts to protect humanity from coronavirus. That was just one day after Britain was one of only four voices at the World Trade Organization which shot down plans for a waiver on vaccine patents that would have allowed developing countries to produce them. Britain is actively preventing poorer countries in the world from producing vaccines. So that's how much commitment um, the Tories have to protecting humanity from coronavirus. We know in fact, of course, they haven't even led efforts to protect this country's people, let alone humanity. Um, that's why with 150,000 dead, Britain has one of the worst uh, experiences of coronavirus anywhere in the world. We know that the Tories are not investing in green technology. They're not levelling up, as Boris keeps uh, saying that they are. We're seeing a changing strategy from various uh, governments around the world. You know, the Biden government in the United States, I'm not a fan of it. I think it's pursuing a dangerous, aggressive foreign policy. But it is investing in science and research. It is upgrading infrastructure across the US. It is upgrading public services and trying to invest in better paid jobs. I think they're doing it because they want to compete with the Chinese rather than for any more sort of uh, altruistic motives. But they are doing it. None of that's true of the Conservatives over here. What commitments we do see to public services are basically fraudulent. So there was a lot of hot air about rail renationalisation, the abandonment of the franchise model and the introduction of Great British Railways. But Great British Railways is not a nationalised railway. It's just a framework to compensate for private sector incompetence while continuing to guarantee profits for private investors. And health privatisation is likewise masked by the umbrella of the NHS as a kind of publicly owned trusted brand, even while the NHS itself is infiltrated by and increasingly dependent on profiteering private contractors. And through the pandemic, we've seen an acceleration of health service privatisation, even though, of course, we've seen in the, the contrast between the absolute shambles of the privatised outsourced test and trace programme and the extremely effective, in fact, genuinely one of the most effective in the world vaccine rollout, which is led by the publicly owned NHS. We've seen how much better public services are throughout the pandemic, but that's not um, a lesson which the Conservatives look to be learning. We're also aware that despite all the idealism of the early part of the pandemic, all that clap for carers stuff, the feeling that lots of people were talking about this time last year, that we had learned who the real key workers were, we found that they were shockingly badly paid, struggling along an insecure work. Nothing has changed there either, except that the race to the bottom is picking up speed. Um, just as the evidence all around us that, you know, Prince Charles is hosting a soiree tonight, for G7 leaders and the heads of the world's largest companies, and they're going to talk about how to fix climate change. But we know that the solutions to the environmental crisis are not going to come from big business or politicians because the system, the profit driven system is driving us over a cliff. And we're seeing the same thing with this talk of leveling up. Um, we know that the many of the problems of the pandemic are caused by an insecure workforce. That was why people couldn't afford to isolate. That's why. Um, the virus was so able to spread so uncontrolled in uh, this, this country. But the fire and rehire drive across large sectors of the economy shows that everything is getting worse. Employers are downgrading workers' pay and conditions on pain of getting the sack. And labour market logic means that the mass unemployment created by the pandemic will drive down wages as well. So I think that as a movement, we need to keep up a relentless focus on these issues like pay. The majority of people in this country are not paid enough. 
and the lack of secure jobs has all kinds of ramifications as we've um, as we've seen throughout the the crisis. We need higher pay and better contracts. There's a brilliant bill going through the House of Lords from uh, John Henley QC, which would grant all workers equal rights on day one of the job. Um, it would do a lot to address these problems in the labour market that we see, but it won't pass. But we do need to have this kind of bill because the labour movement needs to be very clear about what our demands are. Um, I think there's a lot of confusion when it comes to the different trends that we're seeing in our economy um, in responses from the left. So to take a recent example, um, there's been uh, an amusing kind of sideline of uh, Tim Martin, the, the head of Weatherspoons, who was one of the biggest uh, advocates of Brexit and has now found that he's got a shortage of uh, foreign waitresses and, and barmaids who he can pay uh, poverty wages. So he's complaining about um, a lack of foreign staff. But most of the response to this has been to say, oh, well, you know, you created your Brexit mess and now you're, you're reaping the consequences. Whereas what we should be saying as a Labour movement is, why is your pay so low that people that you can't hire, you know, British staff? Why have you got an economy that is dependent on super exploited foreign workers coming in? Um, immigrants don't cause, uh, you know, immigrants don't drive down pay. That's always been the right wing's myth about it. It's weak labour laws and scrupulous employers, but an economy that's based on forced super exploitation of people coming in. So it is the case that we should be saying, well, if there are problems in a shortage of labour in certain industries, that is the case for unions to be pushing for higher pay. And that's how we can start to uh, build back um, the strength of the labour movement, as has already been happening over the pandemic. That's why the trade union movement is growing. As Unite points out in today's Morning Star, that's also the case in the agricultural sector where people are complaining that they can't get staff to pick fruit. It's because the paying conditions are too bad, it's because the, um, the infrastructure isn't there for people to be working in agriculture in this country. And those are the problems that we need to fix. Now, John, who I think is on this uh, panel as well, um, he says he's not depressed about the state of the left. I've heard him say that at a number of meetings, that we have the solutions to the problems that the uh, pandemic has exposed. I think that's absolutely right in that uh, many of the policies that the Corbyn movement put forward um, are directly relevant to these issues of massive job insecurity, massive poverty and, and uh, privatised public services that have been exposed in the pandemic. Peter Mandelson has said that this is a very arrogant attitude by the left. We, we're waiting for the public to catch up with us. But as Sean mentioned in the introduction, actually we know from repeated polls that the public are on our side on a lot of this stuff. The public do support public ownership. They do support higher pay. The CWU did polling in, ahead of the Hartlepool election, which was a disaster for the Labour Party. But we found that actually people in Hartlepool were in favour of renationalising Royal Mail. They were in favour of a, a higher pay rise for the NHS and all of these policies that we would associate with the left. So if Labour's not getting those votes, it's not because people aren't supportive of the policies, it's because people don't think that the Labour Party is going to deliver them. I do think that is a major problem for us as a left. The Conservatives are politically dominant in this country. We saw how dominant they were in England in the, for the, the elections last month. So. Um, we can point to reasons for that as being linked to a ridiculously biased media. This is my moment to give a shout out to the Morning Star. Um, we do need to support an independent anti-capitalist and socialist media because um, there is a, an institutional, huge institutional bias against socialist politics in the press. But we can't claim that nobody knows what's going on. We can't claim that nobody is exposed to the idea that the government has been reckless, incompetent, murderous over the course of the pandemic. The Dominic Cummings testimony was absolutely devastating in Parliament and it got wall-to-wall -wall coverage on the on the TV and, and in papers. He said, you know, tens of thousands of people died who didn't need to die and that was brandished all over the front pages of, of the mainstream press. So, but it didn't affect Tory polling at all. Um, I would argue the reason for that is that the disillusionment we're seeing, the anger we're seeing, isn't finding a political outlet at the moment because there isn't a political movement that's seen as challenging what's going wrong. Political lying has become so established since the Iraq war, a minister no longer even resign when they're caught lying to parliament, that further examples of lying from, from politicians doesn't really impress the public. It doesn't turn them against one party or another because they see it as associated with the whole of the Westminster system. The only way to surmount that is to address the lack of confidence with um, a real challenge to the political system itself. And I think that in the relatively recent past, we did do that fairly successfully. I think we can't stop talking about the 2017 
election. I know that we didn't win that election. I know that the, the Corbyn movement has sort of come to an end in that sense. But it was actually a really interesting election in all kinds of ways, both because it mobilised a huge number of people to have conversations with their friends and neighbours and workmates about what change could mean and that cut through the kind of massive institutional power of the, the capitalist press to a great extent but also if we look at where the Labour vote was rising in that election it was all over the country it was in Labour strongholds it was in Tory strongholds that's why you won places like Canterbury while also massively increasing Labour majorities in places like Hartlepool so we we have actually we can't try to throw away this model and say that Corbynism didn't work <coughs> sorry we need to actually build on that, look at how successful we almost were at that point, build on what did work, and obviously um, try to uh, learn the lessons to what doesn't work as well. The British government is not popular. The British government is just more popular than the opposition. And as we saw in Hartlepool, voting patterns don't reflect what people say they want economically. So I think that we need to actually start winning people over to the idea of real change. And that happens by building a movement from the bottom up. We set out from where we are. We acknowledge that we keep losing elections, but we have to try and engage and persuade people on a local level. That means building the trade union movement, building campaigns like the People's Assembly, fighting over local issues of jobs, public services, um, not guilt tripping or lecturing people or kind of mocking people for voting Tory as you see quite a lot on social media. That's not gonna persuade anyone, but engaging and persuading and um, doing it from the grassroots. I think that is the way to build a movement. I think we did it very recently. I think we can do it again. So um, that's how we take on Tory class warfare and start to build an economy for the people. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. That was a really, really good overview to kick us off. And I think the point as well about the 2017 coalition is really, really well made. Um, I'm just going to flag up that we've got uh, hundreds of people joining us this rather lovely sunny morning where I am uh, from all across the country um, and across all the different streams. So here in Zoom, um, but also on YouTube, on Facebook and other social media um, streams. And we've got people joining us from Hemsworth, Tottenham, uh, Hull, Broxbourne, Preston, Leicester, uh, Cumbran, Wiltshire, Streatham, uh, Camden, Chesterfield and Sheffield. So hello to all of you uh, all across the country. Um, I'm going to turn very quickly now to our second speaker, um, who is Holly Turner, an NHS worker and from NHS Workers Say No, who have done so much to organise hundreds of thousands of people to support a 15% pay rise for NHS staff that they definitely deserve. So Holly, take it away. Thank you, Sean. Um, yeah, and it's great to be here today at this really important event. And as Sean said, my name's Holly. And I guess firstly, I'm an NHS nurse and I work in child and adolescent mental health services and have done for quite a long time. And we are facing a very, very difficult very difficult period at the moment um, in terms of the referrals we're coming in. What we're facing, I'd like to say on the back of the pandemic, but I think actually we're still in the grips of the pandemic. So we're in a very difficult time at the moment. And last summer, I, um, with a couple of other female nurses, founded the grassroots NHS pay campaign, NHS Workers Say No, as Sean mentioned. And our campaign was born last summer, late July 2020, and it was born at a time when we were completely exhausted and morale was on the floor as it has been for us for a very long time. And we were amid, amidst the fight against the global pandemic, obviously. And in the midst of that, we were coping with ourselves and our colleagues becoming sick and our patients' dependence on us increasing all the time. And our campaign also came at a time when we were hitting the like frankly unbelievable and terrifying figure of 100,000 vacancies across the NHS and studies report that that figure is due to rise to 250,000 by 2030 which uh, that's just simply terrifying for all of us that that isn't just terrifying for the staff that that it needs to be a fear and a worry for all of us in our communities. So these figures, I don't think they come as any surprise, really, when under Tory austerity, the average NHS worker has had their pay cut by up to a fifth 
in real terms because our wages just haven't kept pace with the rate of inflation. And as a woman working in the public sector, I do want to make the point of highlighting that this government's policy on NHS pay does disproportionately affect women as we make up 80% of the workforce in the NHS. So here we've got yet another Tory policy which is hitting the standards of women workers hardest. And the exploitation of women is very clear within the NHS. We have been gender stereotyped within our jobs with the narrative that we're doing our jobs because we care. And in turn, I think that the narrative is fed that demanding a restorative pay increase after a decade of cuts to our page up cuts to our pay is in some way greedy and as a campaign we do not accept this and we are encouraging none of our colleagues to accept this we don't need to accept one percent any more than we don't need to accept our colleagues using food banks and buying ppe from screwfix and ebay so the facts within the nhs are very clear and i think a lot of us will be well aware of them but i'll highlight a few we have experienced a decade of underfunding actually more we know the nhs budget has not been protected so there have been repeated and brutal cuts to our services there is as i mentioned a crisis in recruitment and due to that half of all the staff within the nhs report that the current situation actually stops them doing their jobs properly so our patient care is compromised We've got less beds per capita than any comparable country and cuts to social care services have really added a huge pressure to our NHS because there's simply not enough services available to support vulnerable people in our communities. And also we know we've got the big private companies like Virgin Care continuing to win these big contracts to run struggling NHS services for profit. And you think of these big companies taking over our struggling services and I think that suits the government quite nicely doesn't it and they want us to fail they want to be able to sell off to the highest bidder and we can't let them get away with their creeping plan of privatisation and as Ben actually mentioned previously the vaccination programme is proof that when the NHS has the resources it needs it actually delivers incredible results. And now we really need to be forcing this government to invest in all services. And as I said, I'm an NHS nurse and I've worked in the NHS for about 15 years. Um, so I've witnessed firsthand the impact that year on year of underfunding has had. And now we've had an unprecedented pandemic, which has created more serious issues. And we're going to require a comprehensive plan for us to find our way out of that. There are over reports out this week highlighted there's over five, 5 million people sitting on waiting lists. And like, how can we even begin to tackle that? So we've got a situation where we have unimaginable waiting lists. We're also facing a time where demand for our NHS services continues to rise, and that's for various reasons, but due to, amongst other things, there's population changes and more patients living with chronic and multiple illnesses. And we add this to the knock-on impact of those deep cuts in social care budgets that I mentioned, and we're really faced with a crisis. And sadly, this is a crisis which has been predicted for many years and has just been completely ignored. So as workers, we've been the ones that have been left trying to plug this recruitment crisis whilst we're not being paid properly. And whilst we continue to be given our all and continue to do that, we were ignored yet again regarding our pay last year. And now this government has essentially added insult to already severe injury and delayed our pay anniversary, which was due to be in May. And why have they done this and we need to be asking that question and we need to be demanding answers because this isn't just about the NHS staff we all need to be taking this situation very very seriously because if we don't force change the NHS is going to become increasingly dangerous and this is about safety and this is about our standards and we will not allow this government to abuse the goodwill of staff to deal with this staffing deficit we're struggling with because the investment in staff is about it's about patient safety and it's also about the health of our workforce so this is why nhs workers say no with support of our trade unions are fighting as Shah mentioned for a 15 percent restorative pay increase for all nhs workers 
And that is so that we can try to begin to address this staff deficit and ensure that we can keep our, not just our patients, but each other safe. And it's not, I'm a nurse, but it's not just about our nurses. It's about everyone across the NHS. And that includes our porters, our domestics, our support workers, our catering staff. You know, I couldn't even list how many different and varied jobs there are in the NHS because ensuring that all of our colleagues on Agenda for Change are paid fairly is really critical to the running of the NHS because it, you know, it wouldn't function without every single one of them. Every single person in the service is extremely valuable. So basically, it's time that our government begins to respect our people and pay them fairly because there's no absolutely no justification for our skilled and experienced workforce to be frequently working 40 plus hours a week and taking on second jobs just to end, make ends meet. This is completely wrong. And we know that this isn't about resources. There have been many studies and they've proven that the government would actually recover at least 80% of the cost of a substantial pay increase because the Treasury would receive more in taxes, staff would spend more to actually boost the economy. So the figures we have actually speak for themselves and the real cost of paying us fairly would deliver huge benefits to the NHS also in terms of the need for recruitment and also savings on retention when we're at a point when one in three nurses want to quit. For me, we've seen that COVID has essentially been a real landmark moment within our NHS and we've seen what's happened when we don't invest in our frontline workers and when we don't organise to get the things that we need. This government has shown that they're profiteering from the pandemic, whilst our frontline workers have risked their lives daily to care for the public. And this is why we're, we're fighting for a pay increase. Um, we need to get us back to safety. And I do believe that we can win, but I believe that we all need to be united in fighting for that together. And I think that when we unite, we can achieve incredible things. We, you know, we created the NHS, the welfare state, and we, we need to fight for those things and we need to preserve them and save them so that we can build a society that people want to live in, that can give people hope um, for the future. And we can do that when we stick together across all groups. And that isn't just nurses. And I'm speaking from our NHS pay campaign, but that isn't just about us. It's about our teachers, firemen, our refuse collectors, the people who keep our schools functioning, the people who keep our children safe the people who stock our supermarkets and and that's when we can achieve the kind of society we want so I just want to say finally if you're a nurse or a healthcare worker or an ally of our profession then please please support us in our fight because now we are seeing workers all across the UK becoming organized they're building within their unions union membership is growing as we know and we're increasing the pressure in fighting for what we're owed and we're united in that and we're going to continue. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Holly. And um, I really would encourage everyone um, watching to follow uh, the campaign and to sign up to their petition. And those of you um, watching on Zoom and YouTube, the links to the campaign and the petition are in the chat. So you can just click on it while, you're, while you continue listening. Um, I'm going to turn now to our next speaker of today's session, um, who is John Trickett MP, who's a, a great friend of Arise and a really strong socialist voice in Parliament. Uh, so over to you, John. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry about that. Oh dear, you were unmuting me as I was muting myself. Oh dear, never mind. Technology. Okay, well, look, uh, I think that the last speaker really uh, set up the argument I want to make very helpfully. So thank you, Holly, um, from all of us. This is not just about uh, you as a carer. It's about you as a worker fighting for justice in a system which doesn't deliver justice to working class people anywhere, does it? So look, I want to speak about the NHS too. And I want to develop an arg the big argument. Here. So hopefully I've got time. You won't shut me off too quickly. And so, first of all, let's just remember that the NHS represents a completely different ethos to the one which the Tories are trying to create. 
the NHS puts people first and is not really, ought not to be anyway, ought not to be interested in profit. It's not the size of your wallet or your Amex card or your credit card or your insurance policy, which decides where you are in the queue for health treatment. It's the severity of your illness. That's the first point which the Tories hate because they want to, the wealthy to be able to buy <coughs> advancement. And secondly, the NHS <coughs> was never built to uh, be made uh, in such a way that you can make profit from it. And this idea of people making profit from other people's sickness is something which I think revolts the majority of people in our country. But the Tories hate it. But I think that it's very difficult for them to attack it full frontally because the NHS is something which is very precious to all, all of us. But we must remember, <coughs> excuse me, that the NHS was opposed from the beginning by the Tories. Don't forget, they voted against the establishment of the NHS 22 separate times. And there were Tory MPs in Parliament, and this is hard to believe, but it's true, who even compared the idea that the NHS should come into existence as a form of Nazism. They said that the Labour government at that time was introducing a Nazi policy when they introduced the NHS. <coughs> it's extraordinary, but it's true. Now, look, I want to tell a couple of stories because I think it's a good way to bring over the message to people who may not be interested in um, ideas. But I'm afraid I'm coughing, so I wonder if you can just pause it a minute <coughs> while I go get a glass of water. Not a problem. Um, <coughs> what? Uh, well, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to go over to Ben Hayes, who is from Arise um, and he's an Arise volunteer. Um, so we were going to take him for a quick plug at the end of um, John, but we'll take him now uh, while John gets a glass of water. Um, so if I can invite Ben Hayes to come in and say a little bit about Arise. Well, uh, I feel like Cliff Richard at Wimbledon. Eh? Uh, hopefully you'll be able to save him in. And in, in the meantime, I'll sort of speak as a, a disembodied voice. Uh, here we go. Here I am. Uh, thanks very much, John. Uh, yeah, so my name's Ben. I'm here from uh, sunny Islington, just to say uh, a little bit about Arise, uh, the introduction to anyone who's unfamiliar with us. Uh, so Arise was set up a few years ago as a festival of people-powered politics, discussion ideas on the Labour left to help bring about change for the better. We had uh, weekend-long festivals with all sorts of uh, different workshops on uh, building industrial solidarity, community campaigns, internationalism, liberation equalities issues, party democracy, labour movement history and uh, various other things. Uh, in the last couple of years, obviously adapting to the circumstances we found ourselves in, we've run sessions like this online, uh, which allows us to reach out to people across the country and indeed some other countries too. Um, if you want to keep up with future events and sessions from Arise, please do check us out on social media. You can find us on Arise underscore festival on Twitter. Uh, we're on Facebook as Arise, a festival of Labour's left ideas. And you can also follow us on YouTube you can obviously uh, also watch a load of the sessions we've been hosting over the last 15 months or so. Now, while we're obviously not uh, having to book physical venues lately, we do have to meet the cost of things like using Zoom webinar for these events. And uh, I suspect we may be waiting a long time for major donors. So there'll be links posted in the chat for people to donate to Arise. If you're able to contribute anything, all support is uh, greatly appreciated by us. Uh, just a couple more things. I'd recommend people check out another one of our media partners, which is in the esteemed company of the publication edited by my fellow Ben, and that's Labour Outlook, uh, which is our sister publication aimed at providing news, views, updates and ideas from across the Labour left. You can check out the website at labouroutlook.org, obviously on social media too. In the last few weeks alone, we've had pieces from John and the other campaign group MPs, articles on housing campaigns, various international issues. Um, so it's a great resource. Please do check that out. And in terms of little action points, there'll be links in the chat to petition we've got going opposing cuts to universal credit and also supporting the people's plan to deal with the, the issues highlighted by the pandemic and which picked up a lot of backing from across the movement. So please do sign those. Uh, that's it from me. Please do stay uh, tuned in for what I think will be a really great discussion and have a lovely weekend. 
Thank you, Ben, uh, for jumping in there. And what I'm actually going to do is uh, we've had some questions come in. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to read out. So we've had questions for each of our speakers. I'm going to read out the questions for Holly and for Ben, Shaco, uh, and not let you answer them yet. So you have some time to kind of collect your thoughts uh, while uh, John Trickett finishes his presentation and then we'll come back and do answers uh, after John Trickett's finished speaking. So uh, Holly, for you, the question from Veronica on Zoom is, when NHS service quality goes down, people blame the NHS. We need a campaign to educate the population. A link to this is a question on Zoom from Lisa saying, are the Tories underpaying the nurses because um, they want them to leave and they want the NHS to fail as a public institution. So they say the public institutions don't work and they have to privatise it. And I think you did touch on this in your presentation. So I don't know if you want to expand on that in any way. Um, ben Shako, the question for you from Paul on Zoom is um, a question for Ben, re wages decreasing. I've been hearing the country a lot recently, i.e. the average wages are increasing, um, which will gradually drive up inflation. Could Ben or others address what is going on with this argument? Does it apply to uh, apply more to certain or better paid sectors or is it like a short term thing? Um, and or is it just another distorting effect of the widening of wealth distribution between a tiny super wealthy minority versus a poverty stricken majority? So that's like a lesson in economics uh, <laughs> from you, Ben, but uh, if you could pick up a few points on that, that'd be great. Um, and I think we are ready to go back to John now. So John. Sorry about that, everybody. I think it's um, Haiti. There's a lot of pollen around, as we all know. Anyway, here we go. So, look, I was, first of all, setting up the, the argument about the NHS. The Tories hate it for reasons which I've given. Uh, they fought it every way they could, but it was being established, as I described. It's extraordinary to think that it could be described as a form of Nazism. Um, <clears throat> and I wanted just to tell you two quick stories, which I think illustrate a lot about what's happening in our country, but also um, about the NHS, the Tories' attitude to it and why we have to fight. So the first one is an old man I met in my constituency a couple of years ago. He told me an extraordinary story. He's in his 90s. His father was a miner, as many people were in my area. Back in the 30s, <clears throat> you were paid on the amount of coal you delivered to the pit head. Him and his mate were driving a truck full of coal down the rail underground up to the pit head and rushing because you were paid so much per you know ton of coal. The wagon turned on its side and the coal spilled everywhere. Now, normally they would have called for their mates to come and help, but in fact, what they tried to do is lift it themselves to uh, in, you know to get the thing to the pit head as quickly as possible in order to get back to the coalface. <clears throat> However, <clears throat> tragically, the wagon fell back on them, killed my constituent's dad's mate, and he broke his back, uh, my constituent's father, in the 30s. And he never worked again. They grew up in poverty. There was no NHS. It was a privatised form of medicine. You couldn't, uh, working class people couldn't afford the kind of operation which was needed. But later, though, in, after 48, his dad went to see the doctor and the doctor said, look, we could have saved you back. You could have got back to work. But he said they lived their whole lives in poverty. And I think that reminds us just uh, the situation that existed in our country and in, over the world where there isn't a socialised form of medicine. But that in itself is incredibly distressing but what's very interesting was so <clears throat> my constituents whole family were committed to both Labour Party to socialism and to the NHS but it was telling me though that across the garden was another family who were Conservative Party members on the day that the NHS was created which was the 5th of July so the anniversary isn't too far away now the neighbours, the Tory neighbours, leaned across the back fence and said, well, we're going to the doctor today. We're going to get free glasses, free teeth, free walking sticks and free anything else we can think of. 
So <clears throat> he said, well, you've got Bass's teeth and you, you know, you're quite wealthy. And what the, what the neighbour said was extraordinary. He said, well, the Tory agent has told us to go bankrupt the NHS. And all across my part of Yorkshire and possibly through the whole country, for I know, Tories were going in. It did deliberately trying to destroy the NHS. Now, that is an extraordinary thing. It hasn't been recorded, it seems to me, in any literature, but we ought to know more about it because the Tories to this day continue to destroy the NHS for the reasons that I've given. Now, the second story is 70 years later, <clears throat> in just in the recent past, a woman in my constituency rings me up, will you come and see me, John? I've got a problem. So we went round to the house and she was a nurse. And what she told me was she'd worked on the theatres, the operating theatres in one of the local hospitals. And what happened is they increased the number of theatres for, for operations, but they didn't increase the number of nurses and they cut the number of ward orderlies, which meant that the nurses were now required to do more work but also moving quite heavy people from the beds where the theatre had, had the operation onto the trolleys and, and so on, back to, the, back to the wards. One day she was doing this on quite a heavy uh, guy and she felt a tweak, tweak in her back and thought she'd pulled a muscle. Uh, when she went to bed that night, <clears throat> she could feel a pain in her back, but she thought it would be okay the following morning. The next morning she wakes up and her torso is in a different orientation to her hips and legs. And she realized she'd broken her back, caring for patients. And, you know, I find it shocking that that should be the case. But when I went to see her, she'd gone back to work, the managed to repair her back. <clears throat> and, um, but she was living in poverty because she couldn't do the same work. She was working less hours and, and a less skilled job. And when I looked around the house, I could see the mark of poverty in the house. And I thought it's tragic that that should be the case. But the worst thing of all was she had two young children and she said they came, used to come home, go to the fridge as kids do. There was nothing in it to feed them. No snacks, no sandwiches, no nothing. <clears throat> the two kids had left home and gone to live with the father from whom she was estranged. And it's heartbreaking to think that that should happen. But it's not just an, an incident which just happens to just it somehow happen spontaneously. It's deliberately organized by the Tory party who want to destroy the NHS. And those, two, those two stories together, linking the decades between the foundation of the NHS and the present day, linking you know, the Tories view of how patients should be treated and then how staff should be treated I think tells us all that we really do need to know. Now, look, they're trying to squeeze the health service, as we know. £1.7 billion was cut from the NHS even during the pandemic. As we've heard, low wages for the staff. I've signed an, I've launched an EDM in Parliament saying that the staff should all receive a 15% rise. Waiting lists are growing rapidly, and that is a key factor, which I want to come back to in a second. But they've also cut the number of the uh, number of A&Es and, as we know, various other aspects of the NHS have been cut. If you produce a situation, as they are doing, where waiting lists increase, where you might be in agony waiting for some operation, and you're now being told it's three or four years before the NHS can treat you, then if you can raise your money, this is the Tories calculation, if you can borrow money, speak to your relatives, or you've got a little bit of money put away in the bank, you may well be tempted to go into the private sector. And this di diabolical decision to allow the waiting list to increase isn't just an accident. It hasn't happened just because of COVID. Look, the number of people waiting for a bed is, would al almost doubled between the end of the Labour government and before the COVID started. Look at the figures for yourselves. This is not purely about COVID at all. This is a deliberate attempt to run down the NHS in an effort to drive people into the private sector. And of course, as we know, lucrative contracts worth billions of pounds are being handed over to the private uh, sector in one form or another. 
And I don't know whether this is a fact that everybody's aware of, but we need to get it out there. Every single major private sector health firm in our country has failed a CQC inspection on at least one of their sites. This is not as if the private sector was somehow a Rolls Royce opposed to something else in the NHS. They are fattening the private sector up. They're doing it by driving staff out. The staff vacancies are now enormous. By cutting the services, by increasing the waiting list, all of this is part of a kind of a class war uh, waged by the rich, in this case by private health service providers, many of whom donate money to the Tories or actually have got MPs or members of the House of Lords who would take the Tory whip working for the private sector. This is a war against the NHS. We have to fight it. And I, I pledge my support fully to the staff who want to fight this in whatever way they feel is necessary. And let's remind ourselves finally, finally what by Nye Evans famous quote, when he said, there will always be a national health service providing that there are people in our country prepared to fight for it. Well, now is the time, comrades. Let's make sure we get behind both the patients and the workforce in trying to develop a top class NHS still in place for generations to come. And, and apologies for my coughing at the beginning, by the way. No, thank you so much for, for battling on, uh, John. And I think actually that was a really like powerful ending um, that will like also link, I think, really well back into like Holly's um, comments when we come to her and sort of like her further comments to the question that I read out. Um, before I go to Holly and Ben uh, for sort of their comments after the questions I read out, I just want to read out a question for you, John, if that's all right, and I'll come back to you after Holly and Ben have spoken. Um, and I think actually this is like a really important one. Um, one slogan that uh, that we hear on the left a lot and that we raise a lot in society is that we need to see a fundamental shift of not only wealth in our economy but power too from the many to um from the we need to shift uh power from the few to the many yeah. what does <laughs> it's like written down but i think i know what they mean uh what does that actually look like? What does a redistribution of power in our economy and society look like? And what does it mean to argue for more power in our economy for um, working people? So I think that's actually quite, uh, you know, an important, a good one for you to, to come back on. Um, I'm just going to come back to Holly, first of all, though, uh, to answer the question I put to her earlier. Holly. Thanks, Sean. Um, well, the first question about are the Tories underpaying us because they want um, us to leave in the NHS to fail? I think John really answered that quite well in his speech. Um, and I think what he touched on about people, you know, raising money and using private services, they are doing that. I've got friends that have done that and I've got friends that have done that by accessing private health care by their partner or by their employer's insurance because they are sat on these astronomical waiting lists. I know in our mental health services, there's up to a 24 month wait for psychological therapies. If, if you're in crisis, you're not gonna be able to wait two years to speak to somebody about what you're struggling with. So yeah, people are accessing um, private healthcare. Um, and I think there's also that, that narrative that I spoke about, that the government repeatedly say that it's a vocation and it's because we care. And I think they try and rely on that a little bit, that we won't stand up, we won't be loud because we've got our nursing code of practice, and ultimately that we won't go on strike. But I think that we, we will strike. If that's what we need to do to achieve patient safety, we will, we will do that. And I think the government needs to stop, stop relying on that. Um, in regard to the campaign to educate the population, I would say that's why we made NHS workers say no, so that we could get out there and spread the message. We wanted more people to get active in their trade unions so that we could push them um, to supporting us in our pay asks and uh, ultimately perhaps balloting for strike or balloting on pay and getting those high turnouts. I've got colleagues today um, 
And along with another important bit for us in educating the population is forming allies. And we've been doing a lot of that as NHS workers say no. And there's a stall today right now on the high street where I live, which has got people across all different groups and NHS workers. And we're trying to hand out everything, you know, posters, badges, anything that we can spread our message and leaflets, especially around we're having nationwide protests on the 3rd of July to mark the NHS anniversary with with some allies and yeah that that's a very important part because I know that some of what I spoke about today a lot of people will know but a lot of people don't know that stuff and it is getting the message out there. Thank you so much Holly um, and Ben do you want to come in and back on the points that were put to you? Sure thanks Sean yeah no that's a really interesting point actually about what's happening um, in Britain in terms of wages at the moment. I think we're actually at quite an unusual point and we're gonna, um, there are two ways we could go on this and a lot depends on how the labor movement actually reacts. What we've got on the one hand is mass unemployment caused by COVID um, and the repeated lockdowns and so on. <coughs> in some, some ways it skewed the, the wages sector because shutdowns of, of sectors like hospitality where you've got very low paid workforces in general. Um, if those people are out of work, then it can look like the average pay is going up if lots of people who are on minimum wage are out of work. That's part of what's creating the, the picture that we have here. Um, but we've got the, the whole um, exploitation of this mass unemployment by companies with fire and rehire, which we saw with the British gas engineers and in, in many other com companies, where there are deliberate attempts to say, look, um, our company has suffered because of the pandemic. Therefore, we are going to renegotiate all of your contracts and you're going to be paid less. That's happening in lots and lots of sectors. So, so pay is being driven down. And of course, we've just been talking about NHS pay. The 1% award in the public sector, 1% um, award from the government is a real terms pay, um, pay cut for people following on from years of pay cuts for people. So very large sector of the economy we are seeing, the pressure is for downward wages for all the reasons that Holly and John have talked about and, and also possibly because of the privatisation agenda in, in the NHS means that you know it's, you're not going to attract contractors if people are on good wages uh, um, they want um, they want a low paid workforce for that reason as well but at the same time we're seeing that the shortages of labour in certain areas are leading to pressure for wages to rise and that's true to an extent in hospitality now it's beginning to open up again it's definitely true in the agricultural sector um, that is something which unions need to be fighting on the reason I think this is potentially a temporary situation is because of course the furlough schemes and so on haven't ended yet I've had conversations with sort of pub landlords and people who are saying oh well when people are on furlough we can't get them to apply for these kind of jobs um, the actual reason, of course, is because pay is so low across the entire sector. I'm not blaming individual pub landlords for that. Some of them will be again, up against it themselves. But the, um, the trade union movement needs to make sure that the answer to these areas where people are saying, well, um, we can't get the staff anymore, is to say, well, you're not paying enough money and we need to push for, for higher wages. So I think as we come out of the pandemic in the autumn, it's a real crunch point for trade unions. Are we going to be able to organise for higher pay in these sectors. And when it comes to the public sector, that's a massive political organization that needs to be behind it. I mean, <coughs> NHS is a brilliant um, example of this, but the NHS is one of those um, iconic sectors where we can get, as we saw um, in the Hartlepool polling by CWU, there is mass support for higher pay for nurses. We need to make it politically costly for the Tories not to give in on this. They've got all kinds of motives for keeping pay low but we need to make the cost of it too high for them and that I think means putting pressure on MPs and local governments in all kinds of ways so that there is a campaign for higher pay in all parts of the country. As I said in my original contribution I do think pay needs to be absolutely front and centre of what the, the labour movement is talking about because it's a huge and long-term problem that wages have been in decline in this country. We're seeing a very small rise in a very few sectors at the moment and that's creating panic in, in capitalist media and so on when they're talking about the dangers of inflation. They never talk about the dangers of inflation when house prices are going up or when profits are going up. It's only when wages are going up that they start to panic. So I think we need, it's a job for us to make sure that wages do start to go up. 
Thank you, Ben. Um, and uh, John, I'm going to come to you now. So am I going to ask the question, answer the question about power? That's, I think I should talk about that, if that's OK with you, Sharon. Yeah. So, look, I think let me just start with somewhere different slightly. The first thing is, um, and I've used these figures before uh, to rise um, meetings, but it's worth just reminding ourselves that since the banking crash, the um, income of if there are 33 million people roughly who work for a living in our country, they have lost round about, I think it's uh, over 400 billion pounds in incomes, wages and salaries. At the same time, uh, as we know, we follow the Sunday Times list carefully, not because we're jealous of billionaires, but because we're interested in what it tells us about the way our country runs. So 450 billion roughly lost by working people and over 500 billion pounds in increased wealth by the richest thousand people in our country, an almost direct transfer of, from incomes into the wealth of the richest thousand people. So it's 33 million on the one hand, a thousand on the other. That is a very striking direct transfer. But here's something interesting, which I've not spelled out before on on a, a rise, which is on the one hand, workers are losing income, but on the other hand, the richest people are gaining wealth. And we need to understand that. Now, it raises a second point. I'm going to come to the question of power in a minute, but I want there's an argument that we need to understand carefully, which has been lost by socialists in the last few decades. And it's this, that wealth is not taxed in our country, whereas income is. It's only taxed by capital gains if you sell the assets which you own. Now, that's an interesting fact. And why is it that wealth, increases in wealth are not taxed? And another thing is unearned income is not taxed at the same level as earned income. And here's the thing, if you earn uh, dividends from the, the shares which you own, you could have tens of millions of shares. You don't, uh, you don't pay the same level of tax as you do if you're earn, earning money. Now, why should unearned income be paid less tax than earned income? Why should wealth, which is now extraordinary in our country, the billionaires, not really be taxed uh, by the increases in wealth? Because where does power actually lie in the economic sphere of our country? It lies by the people who own capital, the people who own wealth. And it's the reason why incomes are falling is because the people who own capital are driving down wages. Why are they driving down wages? Because it means that they increase the value, the rate of profit, and therefore the value of the capital which they own. There ought to be an attack by taxation on the richest, on their wealth, not simply their income. An unearned income should be taxed at least at the same level as earned income, and it isn't. Now, it's a, it's a mystery to me why the left doesn't want to tackle capital by taxation and by other means too, because that is where power lies in our country. The ability to close a factory like that or to open up a nursing home to make profits or to transfer you know, work from one part of the world to another where labor's cheaper. This is real power, which these people, the, the capitalists, the ruling class have. And I think, so when, I, when people say to me, yeah, transfer, um, a transfer of power, wealth and power in our country, power is located first of all with the people who own wealth, but yeah, we haven't really made the argument, though I've begun, and I think others too, a little bit, to talk about a wealth tax. I'm not quite sure that is totally the answer, but I am going to spend a lot of time talking about wealth in the coming months. But then the second thing is political power. Political power, um, theoretically, in a democracy, rests in the Houses of Parliament. And I've been a member for nearly, MP for nearly 26 years, but... When you analyze carefully what is happening with our political structures, 
they're dominated by corporate interests. It's the lobbyists, it's the money men and women, you know, it's the people with um, vested interests who dominate so much of the decision making. And an example is private medicine, where private medicine rooted in America is increasingly moving into the political structures of our country because they sense a massive opportunity to uh, you know, make money from sick people in Great Britain. It's an untapped market from their point of view. Now, I think so when I want to see talk about transfer of power, I want to see power um, taken out of the hands of big money. And that means quite a radical political revolution if we're going to uh, make democracy and politics work for us. And it means taking money out of politics, including out of the labor movement, because money does get into the labor movement too, as well as into the, the Tories of the political wing of the ruling class. We know that. But still, that is what needs to be happened. Now, how we do that, that change in the political structure, the political revolution, the two labor manifestos, the parts of the two labor manifestos 2017, 2019, I wrote the bits on the political revolution. It's worth going back and having a quick look. But again, I don't think we've made enough of it because people don't trust politics in our country. And if you're going to reestablish the belief in hope that a world, a better world can be created, you need to uh, encourage people to believe in politics. But they don't believe in politics as it is now, and rightly so. So sorry to go on a bit, but this is a crucial question which the left needs to address if we're going to move forward and you know carry our revolution through to its logical end which is a country which works for the many and not simply for the few no i think that's a really really important point and i think it also like really links back to one of the points ben made earlier which is one of the real positive and amazing things in that 2017 general election was how if you walked into like a cafe or you were stood at like the bus stop, people were like talking about politics and were engaged with it in a really like positive, non-cynical way. They really felt that there was a potential for change and something positive could come from it. And I think really kind of like, um, and I think it's really important that that was, that was about not doing politics in the same way and not the status quo so i think that's a really important point to make um we've got um sort of 10 or 10 more minutes really of this session so what i'd like to do is one of the i think all of you sort of touched on this tangentially but i think it's worth spelling out explicitly because i think um it's like one of the questions that's coming so i'm just gonna pop this last question in your heads um and i'm also gonna ask you for any like final concluding remarks for this session and um, things you want to highlight or draw out and um, we'll come back on what uh, any of the other speakers have said um but the question is um some people point to the billions spent on furlough um, by this government and other measures during the COVID crisis and say the Tories have ended austerity. Um, how do we rebut that? I think that's a really important point because I think um, the government are successfully using the confusion around they've spent lots of money to say they've ended cuts and austerity. Um, so uh, any thoughts on that and any final concluding remarks each of you would like to make? I'm going to come to um, Ben first, if that's OK. Yeah, um, let's, <laughs> there's, there's um, quite a lot of uh, broad sort of topics that we've been um, covering and it's hard to, to, to sum it up. Um, I think that what we need to do is actually, as I kind of finished my, my talk on, is, the, is that focus on winning local level fights, um, actually building up a movement that has a local kind of presence. I think that we've been uh, beaten as a left on an institutional level. Um, we've been beaten at the general election, although not nearly as badly as the media would tend to present it. You know, there's all this kind of talk of like the worst election result in, um, you know, since the 1930s. And it's not, um, you know, it, it's, it's true if you look at the result in one particular way in terms of the, the number of seats and so on, but it's not true in terms of number of votes. It's not true in all kinds of other um, ways, in, ways in which you can measure the Labour result. 
So we've got this kind of contradiction where we built up a really large left, militant left in, in the kind of Labour Party. I think it got, um, it got various things wrong and got confused in various ways. But what is presented as a kind of irrevocable defeat for that left in the mainstream media and, and across uh, official Westminster politics is actually nothing like as um, conclusive as that. Um, that. There's actually still a huge left which um, at the moment isn't particularly hopeful because of all of the, the terrible things that are happening but there's a huge number of people who've woken up to the unsustainability of our system um, the g7 again as i started on the g7 it's happening in cornwall you listen to these people and they talk as if they have solutions to all of the massive problems that we're facing but um actually Sorry. But actually what we've seen, and more and more people understand this, is that the problems are rooted in the entire economic system, that we can't solve climate change unless we really um, address the underlying problems in the capitalist system, that we can't um, actually address power and wealth, um, address, you know, uh, questions like poverty and so on without addressing these crucial questions of power and wealth that John Trickett has been uh, talking about. So actually I think, one lesson that we need to come out come out of this uh, session is is that events like this are important because we need to regain that attitude that we had in that period of 2015 onwards that we can change things and that hope is as important as, as getting angry at the system and that um we rebuild that trust in politics that john mentioned by actually organizing and engaging with people locally i think there have been some really good examples of that over the last few months i think that the kill the bill demonstrations and, and the Palestine solidarity demonstrations as well. These were not set piece events in London. They were quite spontaneous. They took place everywhere. They took place in small towns as well as big cities. And actually you get people who have no particular political outlook. And in fact, you even get people who voted Tory and things coming along and saying, oh, well, what's this demonstration about? And talking to people at that local level. So I think that's how we rebuild um, the left as a kind of fighting, uh, fighting force. Thank you, Ben. Um, I'm going to come to Holly next, if there's any last thoughts or comments you would like to make. Yeah, thank you. I'll give a brief comment because I know we're nearly out of time. Um, but just in response to what you were saying, especially in regards to furlough, um, that I think the vulnerability of our workers, especially frontline workers, has been really, really clear throughout the pandemic. Um, so what a final message that I would give to people is join a trade union. And it was the trade unions that were instrumental in putting that pressure on the government to save jobs um, and trade union pressure is the only reason that we have furlough and it's obviously not a narrative that the government would promote because they don't want people to join unions do they so um so yeah that's the message that i would give across to people in regard to that thank you holly um and john final comment okay. thanks much well very briefly um look uh, i've lived <laughs> i've lived a long time in political activism I first, uh, I think I was first active in the Vietnam War, that's right, in the 1960s. But I've seen, therefore, times when we've felt as though we were defeated. And what happened is people didn't stop being active, but quite often they went into what we used to call single issue campaigns, you know, whether uh, one issue or another. All those single issue campaigns, you know, whether it's though it's not really a single issue if you think about it, the fight against nuclear weapons or whatever it might be, all were very important. And, you know, I wouldn't in any way say that that was a mistake. However, something binds all of those single issues together, and that is, uh, I suppose, an analysis of the way our society works, how power is located uh, with a ruling class which exercises economic power, as I've described earlier, and most of the different issues which face us, whether it's the environment or whatever it may be, are rooted back in the central uh, problem which we've described and which most socialists fully understand. So here's the thing. <clears throat> we've gone through what felt like a defeat, but we showed there were hundreds of thousands of people who had come to the conclusion that you cannot go on 
in the same old way anymore. Now, my fear is that people will either lapse into a kind of quietism, sort of apathy and so on, or else into single issues. And I don't want to discourage people doing single issues, as I've just said, they're really important. But the real thing is, is to retain the vision and to remember 2017. Because whatever you thought about the problems with the second referendum after 2017 and the 29 result, 2017, though we didn't win the election, lit a torch that sent a light across the whole planet. And I know that because people from all over the country have encountered, all over the world who have encountered in the last 40 or 50 years of activism were contacting me, you know, from France, Italy, Spain or wherever. It, this is amazing. This is absolutely amazing. We lit a torch. We lit a torch. We set a flame going, which illuminated parts of the way in which the planet works. And we must never forget that, you know, well over 10 million people voted for us on two separate occasions in 2017. OK, we didn't win. And OK, what then happened afterwards has been tough for all of us, the exclusion of Jeremy from the Labour Party, but not from the Labour movement, by the way, he's still there. And so those people are there. A significant part of the British population responded to our message. And that gives me hope. It gives me hope for the future that the defeat which we've suffered this time is not going to result in the impact which it had the last time we were defeated when Thatcher, when I was very active, when Thatcher was elected, people lapsed into all sorts of private activity. Do join a union, do get involved in various activities, but remember, we can change our society. And that is what's required if we're going to really save the future for our planet, our wonderful Mother Earth as well as humanity as well. And thanks again, as I always say, to Sean and everybody else behind the scenes for organizing today's event. Thank you so much, John. I think that was such a really, really great opening session with, I think, really like thoughtful comments and interesting points from all of our speakers and actually ended up co uh, covering like a huge amount of, of ground um, in a very short space of time. So I think that's been a really brilliant start to the day. Um, so thank you to all of our speakers for participating. Um, you know, I think it's really clear that on the left, uh, to win again as um, Labour really needs to be an anti-austerity party and not just be anti-austerity, but also really stand for a positive, bold economic agenda um, that can defend and create jobs, can improve lives and living standards. Um, based on investment not cuts and really kind of build on that coalition that we saw in 2017 and really i think that also means from my point of view i think it we need to hold the government to account and to oppose all aspects of its reactionary economic agenda and we know that dangers definitely lie ahead with this government um so as well as all of us having important battles ahead um we know just how important our campaigning is to keep putting forward these socialist policies um in labor and the labor movement and in our communities and to build that united resistance and um, throughout the country as all of our speakers have mentioned um to the so all I'm going to mention before I sort of finish this last session is that for the latest on these campaigns and from organisations and people who have spoken here today, uh, both in this session and later, uh, be sure to read and follow uh, Labour Outlook, uh, sign up to the different campaign links we've put in the chat. Um, I also want to flag up, given this first session's topic, um, there is obviously the People's Assembly Against Austerity demonstration on June the 26th against the government, um, and these types of protests um, in a socially distanced, responsible way are definitely important in terms of showing the strength of opposition to this government. Um, so I want to highlight all of those things uh, to you before uh, you go and take a break. Um, our next session starts at 12.30, so just uh, 15 minutes time um, and it's going to feature speakers from across uh, the left of Labour and they're going to be speaking about fight the Tories not the left defending Labour Party democracy and our socialist policies and um, remember if you're on Zoom YouTube and apparently there's hundreds of you on Twitter so 
mentioning you as well. You can stay on throughout the day. Just keep the link live in your device. Um, and we will just uh, go silent for 15 minutes while you all go off and make a cup of tea and a sandwich. And then we'll see you back here at half past 12. Thank you.
Hello. Hello, just to let people know, obviously our speakers for the next session are coming on, um, but uh, we're not starting until 12.30, but also just to let everyone know, uh, we are live throughout the day. So uh, I'm just reminding, this is a friendly reminder to the audience, not to worry, you've got plenty of time to make a cup of tea still, you've got 10 more minutes, um, and a friendly reminder to the speakers, um, at the upcoming sessions to keep yourself muted because we are live and we're not starting the event until 12.30.
Hello everyone, uh, thank you so much for our great first session. Hopefully you're all on your way back uh, from pottering around or whatever you were doing for 15 minutes during the little break. Um, we're now about to start our second session in today's um, event by Arise, a festival of Labour's Left Ideas. Um, for this session, uh, I'm gonna hand the chair over to Patrick Polly. So Patrick, take it away. Hi, Sean. Thanks for that. Uh, hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. We're going to be starting in two minutes, so I'll give it till 12.30 just so we can give everyone a chance to come back from making their cup of tea. Right, okay, that's 12.30 on the dot, so let's let's start and let's get into it. We've got a lot to cover today. Um, let me just introduce myself. I'm Patrick Foley. I'm from Arise Festival and from the Labour Assembly Against Austerity, and I'm pleased to welcome you to today's session, this afternoon's session, which is entitled Fight the Tories, Not the Left, Defending Labour Party Democracy and Our Socialist Principles. Today's event is hosted by Arise Festival, uh, along with a, a, a number of other left organisations, campaigns and publications. We're delighted to have so many different speakers and organisations join us today for this second session and to bring people together from across Labour's left to such an important discussion. As you all know, we do believe in discussion on the left, but we also believe in unity in action. And as speakers from five different organisations and publications will no doubt show us, it's vital that socialists in the Labour Party are unified in the struggle to defend both party democracy and the left policies built over the last years. We have seen a failure to publish the Ford report months after it was due. Attacks on members' democratic rights, including in Liverpool and Scotland, for candidate selections. And most recently, in the London region this month, with the imposition of a summer conference against the wishes of our elected party board in the region. Of course, there was also the, su the suspension of Jeremy Corbyn and the subsequent refusal to restore the whip to him. Alongside this, we've seen a worrying drift to the right on policy in a number of key areas, combined with a failure to really take the fight to the Tories at such a critical time. It's very clear that our work is cut out for us. The political corruption and cronyism surrounding public sector contracts in the pandemic, exemplified by the complete failure of Sarko's track and trace programme. We've had David Cameron's lobbying scandal, just the tip of the iceberg of a much more systemic problem. And of course, the increasingly authoritarian legislation from Boris Johnson, of which we'll cover more about the resistance later in the day at another session this afternoon. We, we need a unified movement to tackle all of this. We need a unified movement to fight for transformative change and much, much more. As this session goes on, please post your questions in the Q&A on Zoom. And if you're watching us uh, on YouTube, just post your question as a comment and we have a few volunteers there who'll pick through them and pass them on to us. Um, we'll, we'll be putting them to our panel later in the session. I'd also like to just take a moment just to say, if you are able to, please donate £10 or whatever you can afford through the link provided so that Arise Festival can continue to host these important events. Please keep, also keep an eye out for campaigns to, to support and other links put in the chat throughout the session. Uh, there'll be some key actions, some more about our speakers and so on. Our speakers for this discussion on the crisis and the alternatives we need will all speak for eight minutes and then we'll move on to questions. So uh, I think we'll begin now and I'd like to introduce Rachel Garnham who's speaking on behalf of the Campaign for Labour Party Democracy. So Rachel, if you're with us, over to you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Patrick. Um, I wasn't expecting to go first. Um, thanks for um, inviting me to speak on such a brilliant panel of activists. And 
I think it is so helpful for Arise to have brought us all together from our different organisations, as, as you were saying, Patrick, um, because only through working together, focusing on what we have in common and not what divides us, um, can we hope to defend and advance Labour Party democracy. I just really wish we were all together in person and could continue these conversations in the pub afterwards. Um, uh, I wanted to talk first about um, the elections we had in May and how the outcomes demonstrate how crucial party democracy is and secondly some concrete actions over the next few months that we can take to defend and advance party democracy. So I think the elections that took place in May could not have been clearer in demonstrating the type of coalition that Labour needs to build to win. Rather than chasing the, the older, more con socially conservative Brexit supporters, which seems to be the Union Jack strategy proposed by the current leadership, where Labour did well, it was predominantly in areas where it offered a genuine alternative to the Tories and was seen to challenge the government, not ride along on its coattails. Um, I think for young people in particular, as we know, this, the status quo is not a good option um, on housing, on jobs, on funding for higher education. Labour has to not only offer a genuine alternative to the neoliberal consensus that has dominated government since the 1970s. It also has to be seen to be standing up for something different and standing up for younger people. It is scary how much Labour's polling has reduced amongst young people, where over the past five years that has been a real strength not only support for Labour but young people actually getting out and voting Labour and the impact of offering clear red water um, was demonstrated most clearly in Wales where the expression was first coined I think by Rodri Morgan but where Mark Drakeford as leader and now governing on a programme of people first investment not cut supporting public services has been able to regain majorities in seats lost in 2019, whereas we can see where the alternative strategy leads us in in Hartlepool and you know it was a really significant victory for, for Welsh Labour in the in the Senate elections and that is a direct outcome of party democracy. Mark was elected on a left platform because of the campaign by grassroots members and trade unionists and I believe he would have found himself happily ousted by Keir given half a chance in the same way Keir backed the coup against Richard Leonard in Scotland. So a direct result of Labour Party democracy is has meant a huge benefit to people in Wales and not just to people who are lucky enough to live under a Labour government in Wales but actually to all of us in demonstrating that a centre-left Labour government is not only possible but successful. Um, so it's quite clear that a, a democratic party is the way of ensuring our leaderships at every level are in touch with grassroots members and trade unionists and therefore in touch with the communities we need to win support to win elections. And one of the most frustrating mantras of the current leadership is that we need to speak to voters, not members, like members are some class apart. Ignoring that for a start, members are voters embedded in, in touch with communities and a great conduit to other voters. And secondly, that you how unless you have energized and inspired activists, who is going to do all this talking to voters? You know, and, and genuine two-way communication, not just sort of from the pages of the Daily Mail. So I think we saw in May how uninspired members were relative to the past few years to knock on doors and have those important conversations. Members are more than knocker fodder. There has to be genuine engagement too. People have to feel they're part of a movement. So what do we need to do? Um, our current democratic structures include members' rights to select candidates, to agree policies, to organise at a local level, to promote labour values. But we know that party democracy is under attack, and I'm sure other people will talk about this more, but the, the imposition of candidates, the abuse of disciplinary processes, um, and Starmer's, you know, really crucially, actually, Starmer's disregard of the pledges on which he was elected. Um, we, at, as grassroots members, need to continue to not only defend what we have, but and and draw attention to what is actually in the rule book, but make the most of the available processes. And I wanted to give three quick examples. Firstly, Labour Party Women's Conference takes place two weeks today. The left, through coming together as part of grassroots Labour Women, which I'm sure Pamela will talk more about, has ensured that we have the most nominations for the Women's Committee. We have seen plenty of um, our mo model motions submitted 
um, from CLPD and we're really optimistic about the debates that we can have at the conference on Palestine, on climate crisis, on issues impacting women not only in Britain but across the world. Uh, uh, but there's plenty of work to do to win at the conference and to build the new women's organisation that we need and to replicate what we have been trying to achieve in the women's uh, structures across the other equality strands. So um, I will give a quick plug, so do visit CLPD's website and sign up if you're a delegate to Women's Conference so that we can be in touch, we can organise around the compositing, etc. Um, secondly, we have very important elections to the Conference Arrangements Committee taking place through one member, one vote over the summer. We've got two excellent candidates in Billy Hayes and Seema Chandwani who have a track record of fighting for a democratic conference and we absolutely need their commitment and their experience to try and keep fighting for a democratic conference um, and these OMOV um, elections were a, a CLPD rule change that predates Jeremy's leadership and it will but it will be just to show that even without the leader, you know, you can make democratic change. Um, but it will be hard this time around as it's got a low profile, we're, we're losing members, we need to work together, all the organisations on this call and many more to, to get out the vote in those elections. And finally, we expect to have an annual conference where we can hope to elect our very excellent candidates for the National Constitutional Committee, who will stand up for natural justice and members' rights. Uh, we can promote motions to maintain a left popular platform as we are trying to do at Women's Conference to build the coalition I was referring to earlier and um, people might have heard CLPD is promoting a rule change to make the PLP accountable to annual conference which would not be before time um, and according to media reports could restore the wit to Jeremy Corbyn um, and I strongly believe Jeremy should not be forgotten he's a Labour Party member cleared by our disciplinary processes he's an MP he has to be restored to the PLP to start to rebuild the coalition we need and it isn't easy and there are many hurdles and <laughs> But, and this is a very long fight, but as we heard in the earlier session, in 2017, we showed against all the odds that a left Labour government could be possible, and only through defending and making the most of party democracy can we hope to win that transformational Labour government in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. That, yeah, that was, that was brilliant. I think uh, just, just a few of the key actions you mentioned there are really important. I, I think our volunteers actually will be putting... Uh, a link to to call for the whip to be restored back to Jeremy Corbyn in the chat. I think it's up to forty six thousand supporters so far. So far, so do really um, do add your name to that. Uh, I'm glad you mentioned the the women's committee elections because our, our next speaker uh, is a candidate in the women's committee elections. She's also the vice chair of the Labour Representation Committee, the or the LRC, um, and that is Pamela Fitzpatrick. So Pamela, if you're with us, over to you, please. Thank you, Patrick, and thank you, Rachel, for starting us off, and thank you for inviting me. Um, I want to start off with a quote, which some of you will probably recognise, quite a famous one, and it's quite appropriate. It's from 1935, I think. So it goes, life is not an easy matter. You cannot live through it without falling into frustration and cynicism, unless you have before you a great idea which raises you above personal misery, above weakness, above all kinds of perfidy and baseness. And um, for many of us, life in 2021 is not an easy matter, is it? At a time when we desperately need big political ideas, the Labour leadership is busy attacking its own members. Frustration and cynicism are now widespread and we're witnessing an exodus of members from the Labour Party. Many are in despair at the apparent demise of the left, the lack of any great ideas or leadership, and indeed the perfidy, great word, and baseness of some in our own party, let alone the Tories. So where are we in 2021? We have obscene levels of poverty in the UK, not by accident, but by design. They're unnecessary. We're one of the wealthiest economy in the world. And we're also, I think, fifth for hosting the most millionaires. But those in work increasingly can expect to work on zero hours contracts for very low pay. Welfare benefits have been decimated, reduced to such a level that those who cannot work due to ill health, disability, or for example, caring responsibilities, have insufficient income to meet the very basic needs of keeping a roof over their head and food on the table. And with the decimation of council housing and the myth of affordable housing, we've 
turned for many to slum housing. Few people can ever hope to own a home. That's a dream, a pipe dream. Instead, we've got an ever-increasing number of people who will forever pay extortionate rents to landlords for poor quality overcrowded accommodation. And the short-term nature of tenancies means that families can't put down roots in a community because they've got to move from one year to another. Young people who aspire to study are left with debts of 50 to 100,000 pounds and are coming out of university and can only find jobs in pubs and bars on zero hours contracts. Domestic abuse has soared and the trafficking of women forced into prostitution has been found to be on an industrial scale. Yet the support services so needed have suffered massive cuts in funding. Savage cuts to legal aid often mean that women are forced to remain with their abusers. But the scant regard for the very lives of working class people is the thing that stands out over recent years. It's vividly illustrated by the government response to the COVID-19 pandemic. A government content to see the bodies piled high, so long as its donors and mates could make a fast buck. Greed and incompetence of those in power have allowed 152,289 people to die in 15 months unnecessarily. But it's not just COVID that has led to deaths of ordinary working class people. A new study accuses the Tory government of economic murder and estimates that the austerity policies of cuts to benefits and public services just over a four year period have led to 120,000 deaths. Now the government dispute that, they say only 81,140 people died in four years. So that's okay, I guess. So we're suffering a housing crisis, a health crisis, a poverty crisis, and our services are collapsing around us. It should be obvious to anybody that what is desperately needed at this time is a socialist government. Yet we have a leadership unable to even utter the word socialist, unable to commit to socialist policies, and unable to offer an alternative to the abject poverty and injustice in the UK today. Instead of attacking the Tories, I mean, it's a gift to them at the moment, but instead of doing that, what are they doing? They're embarking on a relentless campaign against its own members. So everybody in the UK should have a roof over their head with rents that are genuinely affordable. Everybody's entitled to food on the table of their choice, not to be given a food parcel by a food bank. Everybody's entitled to work for a living wage and to expect that there is a comprehensive social security system that will be there for the times when they cannot work. These are the very, very basic necessities of life, not luxuries. And if Labour politicians can't see this, if they cannot fight for this, they are in the wrong party. It's as simple as that. All the successes, all the gains made for a better life have come from the struggles of working class people, not from politicians certainly not those who've run government departments. And without those revolutionary struggles, we would not have achieved shorter working hours, social security benefits, free education, pensions, healthcare, et cetera. But many of those gains have been wiped away and our rights to protest are in danger of being severely curtailed. Yet the very people supposed to represent the interests of working class people in parliament stand silently by or even support the government. Um, we have at the moment, I've had messages today, two types of messages. First from young people telling me that the Labour Party have embarked again on expelling Marxists from the Labour Party. Not because you've broken any rule, but simply it's a kind of ideological thing now within the Labour Party. So if you're a student, you join the Marxist Federation or something, you can find yourself expelled. It's kind of forgetting the history of our party and who is entitled to be in it. The other thing I've heard is that in Harrow, in my own area where I live, there's a demonstration, a huge demonstration, anti-abortion. I've not seen an anti-abortion demonstration for decades, yet this is the climate that we're living in. So what do we do? It can be quite depressing. As um, Rachel has said, I'm standing for the Labour the National Women's Committee. And that's what we have to do. We have to organise and fill every part of the Labour Party and every part outside of the Labour Party to organise and mobilise people. And again, I've got a, a quote from somebody else over a century again, which some of you may be familiar with, which it is, um, all our strength, all our hope lies in organisation. 
Now our slogan must be, comrade, women workers, do not stand in isolation. Isolated we are but straws that any boss can bend to his will, but organised we are a mighty force that no one can break. And I don't think that we on the left understand our strength. There are 500,000, maybe slightly less now, but roughly half a million people in the Labour Party, more of which share our views than they share the views of the leadership or the parliamentary Labour Party. We just don't understand that strength. Many people are in despair at the moment, but I'm optimistic because I can't remember a time when we've had so many strikes in the workplace, demonstrations on the streets against all of this. And we need to mobilize and spend less time arguing amongst left organizations and more time coming together in left unity and organizing against the true forces that are undermining our rights. If we have a situation such as Victor Orban mentioned this week that women's only purpose is to have children, many of you will have heard that have sent a shiver through me combined with the anti-abortion marches, the attacks on our democratic rights to protest, we have to mobilize, we have to organize at every level. So on a very small scale, I'm standing for the Women's Committee, please ensure that your delegates vote for all six left candidates. Um, go to CLPD to see who we all are, but we absolutely have to stand solidly together and fight. That's the only thing we can do. Thank you for that, Pamela. Thank you. Um, you know, it's, it's clear how many fronts we actually are fighting on as, as a movement. And uh, I'd like to echo your optimism as well and talk about how we can draw strength from those on the front line resistance to the Tories who have been, you know, guiding the way when at a time we've been lacking vision and, and ideas from the leadership. So there is there is hope to be drawn from that. We are a big movement and we can be a unified movement for change. Um, I'd like to introduce now Mish Rahman, and Mish is uh, a member's representative on the Labour NAC, and he's also on the Momentum National Coordinating Group. So thanks for joining us, Mish, and over to you. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, thank you for inviting me to my first Arise Festival and on a panel with such great inspirational comrades. Uh, comrades, for working people, the road to recovery is going to be a long one because uh, from unemployment to rent arrears, there are huge challenges ahead. And as you know, a decade of austerity has left our British society completely unprepared for this pandemic. The scale of national suffering has been immense and we've endured one of the highest per capita death tolls in the world. But the elite, they've continued to profit from their crony deals with their Tory mates and the rest of us have paid the cost. Billionaires increasing their wealth by over 25 billion pounds during the pandemic, while a third of adults are still living in hardship. Instead of new ideas, the Tories are stealing as from a national infrastructure bank to raising corporation tax, but they're downsizing them and they're severing the com connection between these policies and our fundamental project, which is shifting the balance of power in society away from the elite and towards ordinary working people. A socialist Labour Party wouldn't just spend money on trying to reduce the impact of inequality, will just totally take apart the power imbalances that create that inequality in the first place. And our Labour Party needs to take on a government that's willing to invest in order to save the rigged system. And that means it needs bigger and bolder ideas. So we need to demand investment in public services and a wealth tax and to step up and demand that workers will not pay for this crisis. The 1946 budget, that famous Clement Attlee budget, laid out a vision for a social state, an NHS, uh, education for workers' children. Nothing like that has appeared following the pandemic. And we have a Labour Party leadership who doesn't have any ideas, any vision or an identity. As it is right now, it's left to the trade unions, our left organisations, Momentum and all the other organisations on the left to defeat, fire and rehire to protect jobs, to get a 15% pay rise for the NHS, to get a minimum wage that reaches £15 an hour. And it's going to be the trade unions and the left organisations who are speaking up for the wealth tax, to see rights extended to the gig economy, and to speak up for saving the planet by creating green jobs that build clean engines for cars and planes, that manufacture wind farms, and see the investment needed for hydrogen to be the new clean energy. Now, that's all good, but what is the Labour Party doing? The Labour Party should be championing this vision, 
working with the left and the trade unions for the betterment of ordinary working people. As Rachel just said, the party speaks about being public facing, but their version of public facing is different to what we perceive. Speaking to the public is one way, but the main way to reconnect with the public is to embed your activism in your communities. So we've got to de defeat division with solidarity and we've got to build the wealth in our communities through goodwill, mutual aid and all of the campaigns that we do. Only turning up during the election cycle is recognised as disingenuous by the public and the Labour Party has got to be recognised in the community for its actions. So community organising is vital for socialists to embed themselves with all the actions within the community they do, from the local book club, to the food bank, to the mutual aid group, to the party street store, to creating a community hub. It's no accident that places that have a socialist vision do well in elections and their reputations are built through years and years of community cohesion. We can't end this subject without talking about the Labour Party and the neoliberal right wing's fascination with kicking the left and not the Tories. They wax lyrical about how the Labour Party grew and the public embraced new Labour. Yet, as always, they never apply any context or analysis of the time. While we agree every so often, the general non-Labour voting public, despite backing the Conservatives, do desire for change because we have seen our governments after long periods in office inevitably collapse, such as Howard, Harold Wilson in 1964, Margaret Thatcher, in 1979 and Tony Blair in 1997 all swept to power on the back of their opponents collapse. The context is important. Labour are not going to win back power by attacking the left and not having anything to beat the Tories with except for just hoping for a collapse. They reminisce about the 90s but other than positives such as Shaw Start, the introduction of the minimum wage, due to their Tory-like neoliberal Blairite politics they refuse to reverse Tory trade union legislation. They refuse to regulate the buy to let landlord boom. They refuse to regulate banks. They refuse to regulate utilities. They refuse to look at Hillsborough because of their association with Rupert Murdoch. They eroded legal aid. They privatized prisons. They gave us PFI and the start of the NHS privatization. They gave us tuition freeze. They created a hostile environment, created detention centers such as Yarswood, they invaded Iraq with lies, spins and distortions, and they gave us prevent spying on Muslims, and they gave us those champions of morality and honesty and decency, such as Phil Woolers and Alistair Campbell, Peter Mandelson, and oh, the expenses scandal. They removed close four, they lost four million voters between 1997 and 2010, as well as half of the membership. So don't you dare centrist, moderate, neoliberal Labour guy, come and tell the left to do one. Don't tell communities they have nowhere else to vote because your out Tory and Tory days are over. The Tories are starting to economically out Labour Labour, but with a sadistic, extreme, sneaky version, which is fooling the public. So focus your attention solely on the Tories, build bridges with members, build bridges with the left. It's up to the leadership to build empathy with members and activists. And it's not the other way around. To defeat the Tories, we ne you need the left. You need our politics, you need our activism, because without us, you're just a Blairite tribute band, and that's just history. Thank you, comrades. Thanks for that, Mish. Uh, I, I want to pick up on, you know, something that you've, you've said quite strongly there, and, and it's been echoed with by our other speakers today as well, and it's that members are an asset to this party. They're not a hindrance. And I think a lot of us have felt over the last year, you know, we felt sidelined, we felt you put away we don't they, don't they don't really want to engage with with members it's almost like there's a drive to bring down the membership where actually members are a huge asset embedded in communities like you said they can make a huge impact uh, and members are best engaged when they are united around a vision for transformative change for to actually make the world a better place rather than sort of some trumped up pl campaign that might have a few british flags waving in the background um i'd like to now introduce our next speaker who's maya kirby um, from who's speaking on behalf of Save Our Socialists. So I'd be really interested to hear what Maya has to say. Over to you, Maya. Thank you very much, Patrick. And thanks for inviting uh, me and Save Our Socialists to speak today. So suspension, which is really what I'm going to talk about. Um, it's the favourite weapon of the Labour right. Uh, 2016, uh, in a vain attempt to influence the leadership election, uh, they suspended thousands of activists. 
since then, they've used it to influence internal elections, affiliate elections, to discredit uh, people, uh, to uh, in, invite in hostile media attention, um, to prevent uh, CLPs from meeting. Um, I mean, it's it's awful. In November 2020, uh, December 2020, they suspended around 70 CLP officers um, for allowing their members to express solidarity with Corbyn. It's uh, absurd. Uh, and it wasn't all CLPs who expressed solidarity with Corbyn. Uh, it really depended on what region you're in, uh, which shows that despite the fact regions are not supposed to have any um, power to uh, in disciplinary matters, uh, in the north they had no appetite for suspending socialists. In the southwest they went to town and look what happened. They uh, lost Bristol Council to the Greens. Um, and suspension in the Labour Party is not like suspension in a workplace. There's no investigation beforehand. There's no time scale. Uh, you can be suspended for years and you don't know what you're suspended for. So there are a lot of examples of this. People have been suspended for years. Uh, they're still paying their membership fees, um, but there's been no effort at all to resolve their case. Other people suspended for no reason, don't know why they're suspended, can't stand in their AGMs. Uh, and so, you know, increasing the chances of the right taking hold of those um, CLP. So, anyway, I don't want to talk the whole time about how nasty uh, this, this is. It, it is really takes a huge toll on uh, members because it's isolating. You know, although it's an attack against the left um, communities, it's really individualised. So it leaves people very isolated and unable to go to their meetings and talk to their comrades. Uh, but I don't want to talk about that um, completely because this is a festival of ideas. Uh, so I want to talk about um, amongst the very many bad consequences of the recent attacks on the left, uh, one good consequence that came out of it, and, and that is that we started organising in new ways. We started organising nationally in a way that we hadn't done before. Um, so prior to Jeremy's suspension, we had uh, a group of CLP secretaries um, that were, were on Facebook. Um, uh, but uh, it wasn't until David Evans issued guidance around not expressing solidarity with Corbyn uh, in your meetings that CLP secretaries started to come together uh, and we uh, put together a letter uh, which was in the end signed by 284 uh, CLP secretaries and chairs across 194 constituencies. So think about how many constituencies we hold. I mean, that's it's really impressive. Um, and when we started to hear about our comrades being suspended uh, in November, December, um, we just couldn't allow David Evans to control the narrative on this. You know, these are CLP secretaries uh, and chairs and vice chairs, officers who had poured so much energy in the to the 2019 general election campaign uh, and to keeping their CLPs like healthy and thriving uh, communities. Um, and attempting to demonise them was just so outrageous. So... One of the things about Labour Party suspensions is you're not allowed to talk about them. So what we decided to do instead was to publish biographies um, of uh, the officers who'd been suspended. So in 24 hours, we set up a Facebook, a Twitter and a, and a website and we started publishing um, these uh, biographies. So pictures of the officers, a uh, little bit about them, uh, you know, their story. Uh, we also set up meetings with um, MPs and other left organisations and asked for endorsements. And those endorsements really helped to kind of grow our audience for the campaign. Um, so that was really great. And, and the support was brilliant. Um, we had a lot of fun with it. So we did um, singing, <laughs> we did our own lyrics to songs, New Year's Eve, uh, Christmas. Uh, we uh, did comedic Twitter storms, Ask Dave, hashtag. Um, we uh, also did a show on Social Think Tank, uh, so we had a lot of fun. Uh, we realised as well that our community, there were a lot of talented people, um, so we could put on legal advice Zooms for people who'd been suspended and, and create a community of suspended officers because it was a collective attack on the left, but as I say, very individualised. And uh, it was really good for people to feel that we they could share how they were going to answer their disciplinary questions, um, 
how to get information from legally through uh, legal channels, how to get information out of the party as to why they'd been suspended and how. Um, so that was brilliant. Um, so really, um, we created a community and I suppose that it has is what's been really great thing to come out of that and we've got a community of uh, left secretaries and we also although this whole suspension of officers has had you know a big demoralizing effect uh, upon people we actually as as Pam said earlier we hold a lot of ground still in the Labour Party uh, and as uh, Rachel said uh, and as Mish said we've got the ideas you know, they have nothing but despair. They've got the politics of despair. Uh, they're the ones gleefully creating the environment that make us make, makes us feel as if we can't uh, have space for those ideas. But we have the ideas, we have the people, and we have those communities. But there is a lot of space for us to still build. Um, so we've spent the last five years building a wonderful community of activists in uh, Hackney North. Um, really fantastic, lovely people, and I, and I hope our community will go on for years and years and years. And all over the country, those little communities have been formed. There's so much more we can do now uh, with Zoom culture um, in connecting around roles that we hold in the party, around campaigns. Um, you know, there there is a lot of ground that still need, can be filled and explored um, by uh socialists in the Labour Party and as Mish said it needs to be around community organizing around union uh, fight fire and rehire um all of those things and and we can do that we can build those networks uh so yeah on on that note uh, I want to say thank you to all the inspirational CLP secretaries that I've had the pleasure of working with um this last uh, few you know several months um they, they've been absolutely fantastic and yeah just to reiterate uh what Pam said organize 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 um we've got a world to win thanks very much <laughs> thank you for that Maya uh very very interesting to hear about organizing across the country um and on on that subject you know for, for support of Jeremy and 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 the ideas that he stood for um just to say it one more time we, we do have a petition going around uh, restore the whip to Jeremy Corbyn. There's over 46,000 people have signed so far. Uh, so please help us get it up to 50,000 if you can. Um, share it, sign it, everything else. Uh, again, I'd, you know, the, the themes of community organising and actually solidarity between activists is, is quite is very strong and quite uplifting today, um, particularly hearing that from, from Maya. We often forget that actually we meet a lot of like-minded people when we're out on the road we meet a lot of people who are comrades who are friends and and uh, it's, it's a very positive positive experience when, when we do come together um i'd now like to introduce uh, the editor of uh, tribune magazine the fantastic Tri tribune magazine which is ronan burtonshaw i had the pleasure of interviewing ronan for labor outlet back in march on an actual on a, on a fairly similar topic so i'd be delighted to hear um his thoughts and also what what's changed since then so thanks so much Ronan uh, over to you thanks Patrick um, and thanks to all the the previous speakers uh, Rachel Pamela Mish Maya uh, and to all the organizers in Arise um, this this work is really really important to, to try to build a community around socialist ideas um, and to, to keep people uh, in contact and to give them a, a space to do some organizing while they're under attack inside the party and in wider society as we are at the moment. Um, so the previous speakers, you know, they've, they've dealt very well with the question of party democracy and what's happening um, in practical terms where with the right attacking the left, trying to suspend people, trying to marginalize uh, the left uh, in every part of the, the Labour Party and the broader Labour movement increasingly as well. Um, I'm going to speak a little bit about what I think is the reason behind them doing it. Um, because the, sometimes people look at this and the title of this event is, you know, fight the Tories, not the left. 
Uh, and I think a lot of Labour members look at what's going on in the party and find it completely um, bemusing why a centre left party in full of social democratic people would be so committed um, uh, in its leadership, at least, um, to trying to purge left wingers and socialists and to try to marginalise us and attack our ideas and whatever else. Um, and I think it's very important that we understand that how they see us. They see the left as some kind of an anomaly, as an oddity, as something that costs the Labour Party votes in elections because our politics are on the fringe. They see us as something which uh, basically doesn't belong in mainstream politics. They really don't believe we are a legitimate political force and they don't think that we deserve uh, the space to, to, to have our ideas heard. Uh, what they don't understand um, and you know, people around Keir Starmer particularly don't understand, but the entire right wing of the party is that that is not what the left is. The left represents a social constituency, particularly in the period after the 2008 crash, where there was this great disillusionment built up with millions of people for whom the economy was no longer working. They went and they sought out alternatives to the political system, and they found them through the ideas articulated by Jeremy Corbyn, and through socialist policies, through the kind of policies that we fight for and argue for. And these are the people who actually we represent. These are young people who are screwed by low wages and high rents and student debt. They're people in zero hour jobs and uh, low pay and insecurity in, in work. They're people in communities who've had years and decades of their services being cut uh, and jobs leaving and deindustrialization. There are millions of people across the country who respond not to us as people so much as to what we argue for which is a fundamental shift in the political and economic system away from the organized power of the rich and towards a more democratic economy and power in the hands of working people. That's what the left is. And their inability to see that, their you know, stubbornness and their ignorance and refusal to see that leads them into a destructive campaign for this entire party. Because when they attack the left in the party, when they attack Jeremy Corbyn, when they attack Becky Long Bailey, when they attack uh, left wing representatives in local community parties, uh, uh, in local constituency parties and local communities around the country, what they do is send a message to all of those people who look to our ideas and our kind of uh, efforts to change society and say, we don't represent you. People see in those attacks on the left, attacks on their aspirations for a better society, and they go elsewhere. And we saw this in Bristol and we saw this in Sheffield, obviously, with people departing to the Green Party. There was a poll out yesterday, or at least a subset of a poll, showing huge swing of young voters away from the Labour Party and towards the Green Party. But it's not just there. People are going towards uh, independence parties. People are going, in some cases, very, very regrettably towards the Liberal Democrats. People are going towards a whole series of different uh, uh, forces uh, and actually more than even any category in terms of uh, party that they're going to. They're going to disillusionment and they're going to non-voting and non-participation and retreating out of the political sphere. And this is catastrophic for Labour because you've got a, this, this country has an extremely strong right wing super majority now that is backed up by a right wing media right-wing business interests, uh, a state apparatus that fights at every turn to try and deny working people the dignity that they deserve in their lives. And the Labour Party needs the broadest possible coalition of opposition to that. Instead of building that coalition, what Keir Starmer and his team are doing is breaking that coalition, in some cases, almost irredeemably because they are uh, purging people and mounting a campaign of persecution against the left which is going to alienate people not for a year or two years but for large parts of their political life if they continue to do it and this is the case that we need to to be making and we need to be making very very strongly to a lot of like activists rank and file ordinary activists in the labor party who may not be totally committed to uh, you know being on the left or see themselves as say corbynites or even socialists but they want the better society and they look at these poll numbers and they see that this isn't working and they're asking what is going on and why is this going so badly wrong and this is what we need to be saying to them that in this era the center left is going to be defined more than anything else by 
people who either get the post-crash era of politics or people who don't. And you look at, I have a lot of criticisms, many criticisms of Joe Biden in the United States, way, way further to the right than anything I would like. But he and his team obviously have made an effort to try and build a coalition that will bring in parts of the, uh, the American left. It has been deliberate from the beginning. Now, my view is a lot of his tokenism, but they haven't gone out on a kind of wild purge of the left from the start. And what has it resulted in? It resulted in a very big electoral result for Joe Biden defeating Donald Trump. And it also resulted in uh, some of the strongest poll numbers for a sitting president in, in you know, living memory. And when you look at who's behind that, an awful lot of people who aspire towards change in the economy are backing Joe Biden. Now, whether they stick to that or not over the years, we shall see. But there is a center left figure who's trying to understand at least He's not one of us. He's not a socialist, but he's trying to understand this new context. We were told for years by the Blairites in this party that we need to be more like the Democrats. We need to be more like the Americans. Now that the Democrats are actually doing a couple of half useful things. They're running away from them at a rate of knots. They, they now, now the story is we can't be like Joe Biden. We can't, you know, be making deals with the left. We can't be, you know, trying to fight for any, any uh, left-wing policies. Now they want us to go somewhere to the right of where the Democrats in the United States are, which is an absurd situation. And, you know, you see this summed up with things like the Labour Party a few months ago coming out against corporate tax increases. Well, the whole rest of the like, establishment in the world and the developed capitalist world is moving towards higher rates of corporation tax and trying to consolidate more of basically, you know, uh, taxation of, of mega corporations. This, this is kind of wildly out of step with where the world is going. And it's because these people don't get it. So just to conclude, um, you know, what do I think then we need to do as, as, as a left from, from this point? Uh, you know, we saw very, very clearly in the May elections what the consequence of this strategy played out over another few months and years is going to be. But we also saw places where our ideas were being put in place and we saw what the result was, where there was broad coalitions being built on the basis of changing society and changing communities in places like in Preston and places like Salford, the result, you know, of, of a uh, left of centre, left uh, of the Labour Party leadership in Wales, we saw there the beginnings, the bones, not perfect scenarios, but examples of how uh, fighting for politics can win, even in this uh, atmosphere, even against an incredibly strong, uh, you know, right wing establishment in this country. And we saw that our uh, alternatives that kind of community politics is actually the best weapon against the Tory culture war. Their reactionary, nationalist, populist program that they're trying to introduce at the moment. The Starmer types have no answer to it other than let's stand in front of more flags. Let's try and throw out another few sound bites from the Sun newspaper. That ain't going to work. What will work is giving people a politics that's rooted in the communities they're from. Like in Preston and in Salford, what they did is they built a sense of connection with where people were. They, you know, they, they talked again to people who felt like the, the world was moving, the power in the world was moving far away from them. And they gave them a politics with a sense of place and a sense of community. And they tried you know, to build engagement in politics, active grassroots engagement in their political projects. And they were rewarded with good uh, electoral results. And they were able, by talking about you know, the, the history of Preston and the Salford, but also how that history of these places as bastions of the workers' movement could be the future as well. Could be the future in terms of in Salford building social housing for the first time in decades. Could be the future in Preston in terms of trying to find a worker co-op uh, to, to make sure Uber doesn't take over the, the taxi industry and um, supporting a, a council run uh, cinema, supporting, uh, you know, a local investment bank, supporting cooperative cultural spaces so that the main streets aren't just empty. They talked about what that future would look like. And they showed that actually that kind of engaged community based politics can defeat the Tory culture war. And you don't have to go into nonsense, reactionary nationalist bile to do so. 
Uh, and I think, you know, that is a message we have to take forward here. We have models on the left of the party. And as they fail in this leadership with this destructive strategy of attacking us, we need to go out there. We need to represent the people I've spoken about, those people disillusioned with this economy and political system. We need to be out in our communities, representing them, building connections with them. And when this stammer project of, you know, trying to get to power by marginalizing, attacking, persecuting the left doesn't work, we need to be there with our alternatives actual on the ground alternatives that we can show work and that we can help people to build across the country. Thanks. Thank you, Ronan. I mean, there's so many points you've touched on there um, and such, such great insight. And I, I think I'll mention the disillusionment and, you know, as a, as a, as a young person in Britain, it was so prevalent. Um, and actually Jeremy's rise to the, to the leader of leadership, the leader of the Labour Party really um, got people engaged. And it's something that, if we lose now, we'll, we'll be fighting back for, for a long, long time. Um, and great to see those those highlighted examples of, of where uh, local governments pushing for actual tra transformative change and actually representing their communities has, has had a huge impact. Um, I've got a few comments to make just before we go on to some questions. Uh, firstly, I'd just like to tell you that we've had uh, over a thousand people join today's meeting already. Um, and we have pe more joining all the time across Facebook, Twitter, Zoom and YouTube. So thank you for taking a part, taking part today. Thanks for everyone who helped build build the event. And um, we've we've got a lot more to come, so don't go away. Uh, I've also got a comment I'd like to read out from Anna. Just uh, if you bear with me one second, um, can we ask for a panel member to raise the, the crucially important National Constitutional Committee election? It is a delegate vote at conference. Sir Keir Starmer wishes to replace the NCC with a so-called independent non-party unelected body. The grassroots slate has three members standing for another term, committed to the battle to maintain an elected body. There have been attempts to divert cases to the NEC and elsewhere. The, N the NCC is the only hope to protect members and is crucial to party democracy. Um, so if, if some of our speakers are, are interested in, in that, uh, if they could come back on that question, as one of them, uh, I'll just summarise that. Can we can we ask for a panel member to raise the crucially important national constitutional committee election? Um, I've also got an, uh, another few questions here. I'm going to ask uh, one more, and then if we have, uh, maybe just try and answer one each as the speakers. Um, so, over the years, much of the left has backed self-organised structures for Black women and disabled members in Labour, but the right wing have often reacted against doing this. What what are the key latest developments? With regards to these structures and what should we be doing to advance them um and do we should we go speaker order so pamela are you to, okay to go first um goodness in terms of kind of developing them this if you go back several decades ago when we had black sections and women's sections and they were attacked in the same way that the left are under attack now. Um, I have mixed views about them because yes, absolutely, there should be self-organization, but in some ways we need to all be coming together to fight on the common cause around socialism and socialist policies. So, I mean, people will have different views on this, because there's marginalization of certain groups. Absolutely, we know that, don't we? So how do we get a voice? How do we get kind of uh, self-organization of disabled people, of black sections, et cetera? Um, at the moment, it seems to be a bit of a losing battle, but we've just got to keep giving that message, don't we? This is what we want. This is what we're demanding. And to just keep at it, really. It feels, though, that the kind of fundamental thing is around socialism and that that is the key thing at this stage. So I don't know, I haven't got a simple answer for that. I don't know if anybody else has, but. Um... OK, thanks. Thanks for that, um, Pamela. Um, sorry, it was actually Rachel who spoke first, so we're going to have yeah. Rachel. On. <laughs> you put me on the spot there. I was sorry, expecting sorry. Rachel to come and say. <laughs> She may have a better answer than me. Um, two of my specialist subjects as well. I did mention the National Constitutional Committee in my introduction because it is a really crucial election and um, I'm glad that it's been been raised and it is so important that we, our four left candidates, um, are, are elected at conference, that we get the good delegates to conference by the extended deadline of 9th of July, that people go, they know they have to vote, they get hold of the ballot papers, 
at the right, you know, ahead of other members of their delegation if necessary. And um, the chair of that committee has done a tireless work, um, Anna Dyer, who is up for re-election, in, in really standing up for members and trying to um, bring their cases through and, and not get stuck um, in the sort of the mire that is the um, the Labour's disciplinary processes. And those, those four people will keep championing members' rights and natural justice. And it, it's absolutely crucial. On the self-organised structures, this, I do believe this is one of the big successes, actually, of Jeremy's leadership and the democracy review. One of the few that we, we did get, we reformed annual conference. We got rid of contemporary criteria. We, we allowed rule changes to come every year. You know, small things, the things that we've been fighting for for years to make the party more democratic. Part of the democracy review. One of the big things is the equality structures, the women's structures. We have been le leading the way. We have got a democratic policy making structure. We can send motions to conference. We have got now got a national women's committee. When I was on the national executive committee, we were fighting for the disability structures and the black, Asian, and minority ethnic structures to go the same way. As quick, it was a a a, a difficult fight, but it, I know that Mish and, and comrades on the NEC now will be continuing that fight and trying to bring those things forward because I think self-organization is the only way that we can make sure the issues uh, in those you know that are important to women or to black people or to disabled people are, are front and center and that we have the right policies people are organized that we have candidates from those um, those groups and that the representation is not forgotten so um, yeah I'll, I'll probably hand over to Mish because I know that he'll have a more up-to-date view of where things are at with those yeah, Mishy, do you want to take over from that? Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, I think Rachel's uh, just touched on the point of the democracy review. Uh, one of the great outcomes of the democracy review was for BAME self-organisation uh, and for BAME members to have their own uh, uh, self-organising structures within the party. As we all know, and Pamela touched, the black sections were very successful in the 80s. However, uh, the great concern was that BAME Labour, which became a completely separate organisation, uh, became a moribund defunct organisation that became a pocket organisation, which was for the benefit of one or two individuals, and that really let BAME members down. Uh, there are new BAME structures within the Labour Party, which we had to fight about, and unfortunately uh, for us and uh, the left in on the NEC, we voted against BAME Labour, who, like I said, uh, Moribund, unaccountable body, I mean, just an opaque organisation who don't represent Black, Asian, minority ethnic members, have been given voting rights on it. So these structures will come into place after conference. Uh, obviously, they're going to come into the rule book, but it's up to now uh, for Black, Asian, minority ethnic members uh, in the party and the trade unions to actually organise and make sure that these organisation actually represents their interests rather than uh, the uh, establishment itself because uh, we really, really had to fight to get democracy into the new structures and even then we failed on votes as well. Thanks for that, Mish. Yeah, very um, informative um, look back and, and look forward, I'd say. Um, rather than hammer on those two questions, I'd like to ask two separate questions for our last two speakers. Um, so just to pick pick either or, either or please, uh, Maya and Ronan, but um, what can we do to support the whip being restored to Jeremy Corbyn and to see an end to other unjust suspensions? And then finally, why should socialists stick with the Labour Party? I'd just like to say thanks to everyone who's um, sent us these questions as well. Really great to have people engaged. Um, over to you, Maya. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, great um, questions. Uh, I think in terms of getting the whip restored, uh, the CLP motion, CLPD motion that is uh, hopefully going to come to conference uh, on making the um, PLP accountable to conference uh, and therefore uh, issues relating to the whip. I think that's really important. Unfortunately, the deadline's passed, but I'm pretty sure it's gone through several CLP. So fingers crossed it's uh, that's going to come and that's really important. Important. Um, and yeah, and to continue, because we, um, Jeremy, you know, he was our leader, he's a fantastic leader. He brought so many people into the party. He brought many people who weren't uh, previously involved in politics into the party. And many of those people are the ones that have left in despair. And so fighting for Jeremy to be uh, reinstated to the Parliamentary Labour Party is really important. And we should continue uh, to rally around that. Um, 
I mean, quickly, just in terms of an end to suspensions, uh, it's really tough. It's really, really tough because of the way that because the the way the Labour Party organisation is set up, it's really hard to pursue uh, legal action against them for unjust suspensions. Um, and I'm sure, as we've seen, and, and um, Pamela mentioned, uh, the uh, jo socialist journalists who've been expelled from the party, Marxists, um, just yesterday, uh, they're going to carry on. They, they're carrying on, uh, you know, people being suspended 30 minutes before a selections meeting. You know, this is this is their tactic. How we can fight it, you know, keeping a hold of um, those members, making sure they're part of communities of support, making sure they don't internalise uh, the, the, the feeling of being subject to disciplinary action. Um, we need to have resources available for people um, to help them answering their disciplinary questions, um, to give them legal advice. Uh, that's what I have at the moment, but anyone with more ideas on how we can fight it, such a nasty practice, um, please, you know, share them. Thank you. Thank you, Maya. Thanks for that. Um, Ronan, do you want to uh, pick up on those two questions as well? Yeah, just a nice, easy one. Why should socialists stay in the Labour Party? Um, look, I, look, on the first instance, I'm going to be real. I'm not going to browbeat people if they choose to leave because the, the, the nature of things in the party right now is um, you've got a lot of people who feel that they're a member of an organisation and paying subs to an organisation and working for an organisation that does everything every day of the week to attack them that despises them, that has no respect for their views. And, you know, you can't be too critical of people who say they're not prepared to put up with that. But I'm still a member and I'll make a case over why I think people should be. You know, there are a few different reasons. The first is that the Labour Party, for all of its flaws, stands out by contrast to other political forces in this country because of its connection to the Labour movement because it is the political expression of the organized working class movement of our trade unions and that makes it a very different uh, entity as a political force one that is connected to workplaces and communities across the country one that is you know has an, a, a path at least to building a message for socialism that other parties simply don't have it is the only force that has any chance of bringing together this coalition of disillusioned people that i talked about which stretches from you know post-industrial working class communities and the north of the country and and kind of you know maybe younger urban um uh, people who are struggling with job and rents and so on um, in, in the bigger cities. You know, this this uh, party is the only hope we have of building the, the kind of broad coalition that you would need um, to, to achieve uh, the change we want to see in society. Yes, the electoral system is what it is. There's no point in us pretending otherwise that Britain has uh, effectively a two-party uh, system. And the Tories, certainly, there's all sorts of debates going on right now about PR. I'm not going to wade into them. What I would say is... There is no path to changing it as of now. The Tories have no interest, absolutely none, in introducing a referendum to change that. And so we have these two parties to give up the arena of struggle, which is the Labour Party, which is the representation of our unions, and which is the final and key point for me, which is the largest concentration of socialists in any organisation in this country. The largest number of people we would consider comrades of any organization are in the Labour Party. They might be disparate, they might be disillusioned, they might find things difficult at the moment, but they're there. Um, and to abandon that terrain of struggle, which is a tough one and a pain in the ass a lot of the time, I'm not like naive about any of that, but to abandon all of that to, you know, the right wing interests within, within our party uh, would be a huge tactical strategic mistake we need to go now and do long hard yards of work to rebuild the left and we need to get ourselves like i said into a position where we've got strength in the community we're in touch with working class people we know what their their interests and aspirations are uh, we have models we can show and that when the next opportunity comes the left needs to be better organized and it needs to be united and it needs to be ready to take it because these economic crises that we're seeing at the moment are not going anywhere Thank you, Ronan. Yeah, I mean, the, the Labour Party is just the single biggest vehicle for change in this country, isn't it? And uh, having so many socialists still involved it is, like we found out today, a, a huge asset and, and something that we can all uh, work towards and work together for uh, more transformative change in the future. 
Um, we're, we're running out of time now, so I'd just like to thank everyone for speaking and also just everyone for taking part, all of you joining from, from home or from your garden in the sun, wherever you might be. Um, we have hugely important battles ahead and we know just how important our campaigning is to defend Labour Party democracy, our socialist principles uh, and, our, and our vision for a better world. Um, whether that's through organising for party conference, campaigning for fully self-organised, properly supported, democratic, women's disabled youth and BAME structures, or by fighting to restore the whip to Jeremy Corbyn. Um, just want to say for all the latest on these campaigns and, and, and from uh, a few of our speakers that we've had today, um, please check out Arise's sister, a media partner, which is Labour Outlook. Uh, there should be a few links in the chat on it, and it would have been going throughout. Um, additionally, and as this discussion and others today have shown, there is uh, much more work to be done beyond the party, the party itself, you know, as well as drawing inspiration from that wider movement, we can be a part of that wider movement too. Um, and we'll be discussing this and more in our next session. I'd also like to specifically mention the People's Assembly protest on June 26th where uh, Arise and, and Labour Assembly Against Austerity will be holding a Labour block. Uh, you can find out more about that in the chat, so please do come and join us there. We're going to be obviously socially distanced and, res and, and respecting the, um, uh, the practices to keep us all safe, but we will be protesting on June 26th. Um, and please also take on board all the other actions that have been posted in the chat, including donating, as I mentioned earlier, which is just so important for us to keep being able to organize events like these and, and just continue our campaigns um we are coming to a close now but please don't go anywhere i'll be moving from the chair seat to an attendee like yourselves uh, our next session starts at 2 p.m uh, after a short lunch break and features shami sakrabati and diane abbott from black lives matter to kill the bill defend our right to resist build build a movement rooted in solidarity and struggle remember if you're joining on zoom or youtube you can stay throughout the day if you're uh with us on Facebook, we'll be starting a new live after the lunch break. So thank you very much and thanks everyone for taking part.
Hi everyone, if you're just joining us, we're just taking a short lunch break between sessions. Our next session is From Black Lives Matter to Kill the Bill, Defend Our Right to Resist build and Build a Movement Rooted in Solidarity and Struggle. Uh, we'll be starting at 2 p.m. So see you all then.
Hi everyone, just a reminder that we're waiting in between um, sessions. We're going to be starting our next session at 2 p.m. So please do stay with us. Uh, that session is from Black Lives Matter to Kill the Bill, Defend Our Right to Resist, Build a Movement Rooted in so Struggle and Solidarity. Um, and our speakers will be Diane Abbott, Shami Chakrabarti, Helen O'Connor from the People's Assembly Against Austerity, and the meeting will be chaired by Gemma Bolton, who's a member's representative on the Labour NEC. Um, so stay tuned and we'll be back at 2 p.m. Hi everyone, um, thanks to our speakers who've joined so far. We're just gonna be taking a quick break till 2 p.m. Um, when the session starts, we're just in between sessions, but thank you for joining us so far. Um, and yeah, everyone else, if you could grab a cup of tea, we'll be back in 10 minutes. Thank you.
Uh, thanks again to those who've just joined us. Um, if you are just joining us, you're one of over a thousand people who've taken part so far today. Uh, we've had two sessions this morning and we're just waiting until 2 p.m. to start our third session, which is from Black Lives Matter to Kill the Bill, defend our right to resist, build a movement rooted in struggle and solidarity. Um, so we are looking forward to seeing you then. We'll be starting in the next eight minutes. Hi everyone, we'll just be five more minutes. Um, thank you to all the speakers who've arrived so far. We're just waiting to start at 2 p.m. Uh, if you're if you're watching from, from home, um, time to get that tea to the table.
Okay, everyone, I can see that our, our chair, Gemma Bolton's just joined us. Um, we, we're not going to be starting till 2 p.m., but I'm going to hand over to her. So the next person you'll be hearing from is Gemma as we kick off at 2 p.m. So thanks for waiting and see you soon. Hello everyone, so shall we kick off? I'm Gemma Bolton, I'm on Labour's NEC and also co-chair of the Campaign for Labour Party Democracy and I'm pleased to welcome you to this third session of today's event titled From Black Lives Matter to Kill the Bill, Defend Our Right to Resist, Build a Movement Rooted in Struggle and Solidarity. Today's event is hosted by Arise, a festival of Labour's left ideas along with a range of left organisations, campaigns and publications and we're delighted to have so many different speakers and organisations join us for this session today and bringing people together for such an important discussion. The disastrous Tory government is still failing to protect health and people. It's restored to racist scapegoating to distract from their disastrous handling of the pandemic. And it's planning further cuts and assaults in the months ahead, as we've heard in previous sessions. In particular, the Tories have resorted to attack after attack on our rights, from the Overseas Operation Bill to the Spy Corps Bill to the proposed Policing Bill. They've also again and again attacked the inspiring global Black Lives Matter movement. Now, more than ever, we must both oppose those who seek to use racism to divide us and defend all our rights together, building a movement across our communities to stand up to the Tories. And at the same time, we've seen Labour's leadership not provide the opposition we need on key issues. The question now is what do we do about these Tory attacks? Last year, despite the problems of organising posed by the pandemic, we saw many communities, trade unions and campaigners on all popular different causes take a stand against the Tories' reactionary agenda. Our speaker from the People's Assembly, Helen O'Connor, alongside Diane Abbott MP and Baroness Shami Chakrabarti, will be looking at how we must stand with all those resisting this agenda, develop uh, further the social movements and campaigns that can build, link up and coordinate resistance and also how this relates to our vital ongoing campaigning in the Labour Party itself, for democracy, the socialist policies and vitally taking the fight to the Tories. As the session goes on, please post 
questions in the comments below the stream on YouTube or in the Q&A section on Zoom, and we'll put some of those to our panel. You can also please donate at the link provided so RISE can continue hosting these important events and support other campaigns and links that are put in the chat throughout the event. Uh, our speakers for this vital discussion on the crisis and the alternative will all introduce themselves and talk for about eight minutes each, and then we'll move on to your questions. Uh, our first speaker yesterday celebrated uh, joining Parliament 34 years ago as the first Black woman member of parliament, what a historic, inspiring achievement. So please welcome Diane Abbott, MP. You're on mute, Dan. Thank you very much, Gemma. Um, and thank Arise for inviting me to this meeting here today. The theme of the meeting is socialist solutions to the crisis. And let me begin by saying that one solution to the crisis that will not work is giving, giving in to a reactionary narrative about society on the basis that, say, polling tells you it's popular with some people some of the time. We will all have listened to and picked up on the debate around footballers taking the knee at the EU championships. We will all have heard about and seen so-called football fans booing their team because some of them took the knee in recognition of the importance of the fight for anti-racism. Why you can call yourself the fan of a team and boo them, I would not understand. And why you would object to people recognizing the importance of fighting racism, I would not understand either. One of the very heartening things about the England team is how you've seen white players and black players united in trying to set out their clear opposition to racism. And yet, although the issues seem to me reasonably clear, and at least some of those football fans booing, certainly they were all, none of them genuine fans, otherwise they couldn't possibly boo their team, but also at least some of them were racist, um, despite the fact that the Tories sought to use this issue to play into their toxic so-called cultural narratives, we heard nothing about it from the leader of the Labour Party, Keir Starmer. It took Gordon Brown, actually, a day or so ago, to speak out and criticise Boris. And then, when Boris had actually done a U-turn on his original position, which sought to somehow defend or explain away the booing English fans, it's literally seven hours after Boris did his U-turn that Keir Starmer said anything critical about the booing and what it stood for. That is not the type of leadership that will get us out of the crisis. And that is not what you call socialist leadership in a crisis. But I wanted to focus on a part of the struggle for socialism, which is the struggle for an integrated socialist approach to domestic policy and international policy. When Jeremy Corbyn was leader of the Labour Party, you found people allegedly on the left who would say, you know, they supported him on domestic policy, they supported him on trade union rights, they supported him on housing, but they weren't so keen on when Jeremy wanted to talk and campaign on international policy, be it Israel-Palestine, be it what was happening in Africa, be it what was happening in relation to the US and China. And my argument today is you cannot call yourself a socialist if you seek to de-link domestic policy and international policy. There is an essential link in the relationship between domestic and international politics. And we as socialists need to understand that link 
and we need to reaffirm it. Let's take the negative case, the role of our Prime Minister Boris Johnson at the G7. He is clearly revealing the reactionary, the authoritarian and the English nationalist connection between domestic and international politics. Let's look at the recent record of the Tories. On the one hand, we should welcome the global tax deal, which Rishi Sunak has been crowing about. Um, if it's properly Im implemented, it means just a little more of the burden of the crisis is borne by big business rather than by ordinary people. But we now know that despite Rishi Sunak's gloating and claiming ownership, at every stage of those negotiations, the British government played a reactionary role. The original proposal was for a 21% tax rate, which the British government watered down to 15%. Now the British government is trying to get big banks exempted entirely from the new global tax deal to protect their friends and donors in the city of London. Or well, let's look at what the World Health Organization is calling the moral catastrophe of rich Western countries failing to provide vaccine to the rest of the world. Joe Biden says he'll provide 500 million vaccine doses. Boris Johnson says he'll provide 100 million doses. We will see. Boris is also saying that he will lead on vaccinating the world. But the world population is considerably bigger than all the G7 is likely to pledge. How many they actually provide? How many vaccines they actually provide? Whilst people are dying in huge numbers, will probably be a smaller figure. But we cannot forget, despite these promises of vaccine doses, who has been blocking the waiver of vaccine patents at the World Trade Organization? A waiver of patents is vital in allowing global large-scale production of generic vaccines. Biden initially vetoed the, the patent waiver, but he's now come around. But it's the government in this country and other G7 countries who are hoarding vaccines and blocking the patent waiver. Clearly, for Britain and most of the G7 countries, the profit of Big Pharma are more important than people's lives. We also need to look at the pernicious role that Britain is playing on climate change. Yes. We have reduced emissions, but that's not necessarily to do with conscious Tory government policy. North Sea oil is running down. We have continued long-term deindustrialization de in these countries. But now is the time for decisive action. And what we have learned recently is actually Britain has no plan to deliver our targets to reduce emissions. Finally, I want to talk to an international issue close to home, that's the Northern Ireland Protocol. The Northern Ireland Protocol, which you'll have heard a lot about in the media, it is part of the Brexit Treaty. And despite what Boris and his ministers are saying, it has the force of international law. But because the English nationalists in the Tory government don't like the treaty they actually signed, they are inciting loyalists in Northern Ireland against it. And who says that? No less a person than the US President Joe Biden. The American ambassador has formally rebuked the British government for inflaming tensions in Ireland and having no regard for the effect inflaming tensions about the protocol will have on peace or the Good Friday Agreement. When Lord Frost, Boris's representative, went to Belfast recently, the only political forces he met with were the Loyalist Communities Council. That shows you how committed Boris is, Boris is to an even-handed approach to the Northern Ireland Protocol. The Tory efforts to rip up the Northern Ireland Protocol trample over the will of the people of Ireland, who oppose Brexit and who support the protocol, Johnson is allying with the most reactionary groupings in Northern Ireland. So we see in Boris Johnson a government that's to the right of Biden on public spending. Biden has given an enormous boost to household incomes. Whilst Johnson is freezing pay in the, pu in the pu public sector, encouraging fire and rehire, and has raised income tax 
on ordinary people. Of course, the Labour Party leadership should be calling them out on all this, but I'm not holding my breath. These all show that international politics are completely bound up with national politics. There are some on the left, and I referenced that speaking about what some people said when Jeremy was leader, who think that the left should stick to so-called bread and butter issues. But we, if we only, as a movement, stuck to bread and butter issues, there would be no Good Friday Agreement, there'd be no Climate Change Act, there'd be no campaign around Windrush, and there'd be no commitment from socialist anti-racism. So our socialist project, project cannot just be about bread and butter issues, but those alone do not win hearts, minds, or elections. Instead, we should offer something else as well. Many people are disappointed by how poorly we are doing in the polls and how poorly the leadership is doing. I believe that as well as the short-term bread and butter issues, we have to offer the British people a vision and that vision has domestic and foreign policy in, in absolutely intertwined. And at home and abroad, we need to offer people socialist values, socialist thinking, and socialist outcomes. Thank you very much for inviting me to speak today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Diane. That was brilliant. Uh, our next speaker is human rights campaigner and Labour member of the House of Lords who held the Tories to account on the spy cops bill when, to be honest, the Labour front bench were nowhere to be seen. So please welcome Shami Chakrabarti. Thank you, Gemma. Thank you, Arise, for inviting me. Um, and thanks to everyone for giving up this time uh, on a Saturday afternoon. It is always uh, a pleasure and a privilege to uh, follow my dear friend and comrade sister, the great Diane Abbott. And happy anniversary, Diane, yet again. I, I think it must be our age, but these anniversaries seem to come around <laughs> a bit quicker these days. And it feels like I eat breakfast every 15 minutes, <laughs> but, but, but never, never mind, we're still here, we're surviving. And I think what you've all heard from Diane just now was a, was a wisdom born of experience and built on values. And that ultimately is what our politics and our campaigning has to, has to be about. I'm going to address the, uh, the bit of the, uh, the agenda, which is about the, the right to resist, um, because the organizers very, uh, very cleverly identified a, a trajectory from Black Lives Matter to kill the bill. In, in other words, they are they are pointing us towards a very very worrying authoritarian and actual actually far right trend in British politics under the Johnson government. And I think it's um, I think amongst friends we can we, we can call it out. It might not seem. Um, uh, an elegant thing to say in polite company, but we are now seeing something that isn't even uh, a traditional conservative government with all the problems that come with that. We are, we are seeing Boris Johnson playing from the Steve Bannon playbook at a time when the hard men of the world have been doing so much damage to their domestic populations, have been making the worst fist of the pandemic but are in real have been in real danger, to say the least, of damaging what's left of the post World War II international rules based infrastructure and the and the institutions born out of that period. So the challenges are are really quite significant, and I want to talk about the threats, but then but then move on to to how we combat them and how we ultimately, uh, crucially how we defend this right to resist, because there would be no progressive politics, uh, there would be no fundamental rights and freedoms uh, at all w without ultimately the right to resist identified by the, by the organisers today. So the threats, I think, you, I think you know them well. I don't think I need to, to speak in too much detail about the trajectory that, um, that Boris jo Johnson has chosen. Now, we know that he is a shapeshifter. We know that you know, Boris Johnson, who was running for Labour mayor, 
would talk about immigration amnesties, even even occasionally speak in favour of the Human Rights Act when New Labour was trying its own version of authoritarianism uh, 20 years ago when Diane and I became became um, comrades in arms and friends over over issues like 90 days and 42 days. Um, and I urge people who haven't read it to look up Diane's um, uh, legendary House of Commons speech against 42 days. When, when that was all happening, Boris Johnson was presenting himself as, as quite a liberal stroke libertarian conservative who cared about fundamental rights and freedoms, who cared about civil liberties. He, as editor of The Spectator, wrote pamphlets against compulsory ID cards and so on. But he has been on a very, very different trajectory in, in recent years. Um, now, of course, he, he famously uh, wrote two articles and then picked a side in Brexit. And I don't want to open up rows about Brexit. I have no doubt that people disagreed on that issue, um, in, 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 in many of them in very good faith, including in the Labour movement, including on the left. But there's a particular, a particular strain of the Brexit argument that Johnson chose to side with that is undoubtedly about populist nationalism. That's not historically true of everyone who, um, who is a critic of the European Union. It's not true of everyone who campaigned for or even voted for Brexit, but it was true of the can of worms that um, Nigel Farage and yes, Boris Johnson opened up and it was never going to be satisfied. The xenophobic appetite was never gonna be satisfied by Brexit alone particularly when um, in the same period as that campaign, uh, Johnson and co and Cummings, the new, the, the new great, so the new great whistleblower, Dominic Cummings, you, you may remember that he wasn't always so conscience ridden. Uh, when he was guiding Johnson uh, and others, they were very much, very much playing to the Steve Bannon playbook. And there's a very, very startling film that is worth watching. I, th I think you can find it online called The Brink from a few years ago, where you see Steve Bannon talking to Nigel Farage about his plan to, to unite populist nationalists around the world and to educate them in his, in his awful techniques of, of divide and rule. So we're still on that trajectory. There's also something very thin skinned and retributive about, about the Johnson administration. So you remember the, um, the porrogation case of 2019, Johnson co had literally illegally shut down parliament. An extraordinary thing to happen in a democracy done by executive fiat. This is the sort of thing that you can imagine the kind of column that Johnson would have written a few years ago if that had happened elsewhere in the world, particularly in the global south or indeed elsewhere in Europe. But Johnson uh, illegally shut down Parliament. The, um, the Supreme Court found that an abuse of power by 11 to nil. And, and, and what, what's come as a result of that is that Boris Johnson and co now want to clip the wings of the judiciary and dilute judicial review of administrative action, which is in short, the means by which we can ultimately hold government to the law in the court. So that's an incredibly, incredibly dangerous move worthy of a tin pot dictatorship. And it's something that we will have to fight. Um, the, the charge will as always be led from this, this place in politics, but we will have to make coalitions um, or in civil society to, to, to defeat attempts to clip the wings of the of the independent judiciary. So you see that you, you see that revenge against the judges, like losing 11 nil in the FA Cup final and coming for the referee with a baseball bat. But you also see this police bill, um, which which follows, as, as Gemma indicated, the odious spy cops legislation and overseas operations bill. But this police bill is about shutting down peaceful dissent on the streets, not not violent dissent, but noisy, inconvenient dissent. And it is an astonishing piece of legislation that led even Theresa May the former Conservative Prime Minister, to warn Johnson about what she called a fine line between being popular and populist. 
well, I'm afraid it's not such a fine line. And I think it was crossed some some time ago. And make no mistake, this is a direct response from this government to Black Lives Matter and Extinction Rebellion in particular. Which leads me to the generational issues here because it is an attack on the younger generation in politics in particular, who are radicalized by the events of recent years going back to the Iraq war, but also to years of austerity following, following the crash. No wonder shape-shifting Johnson said yesterday that we need to be careful not to repeat the mistakes of 2008. I mean, he's saying that in a way to mollify President Biden, his new want to be best friend but the but, but but up to now he has been waging war on youthful idealism um, and uh, and the politics of wanting to tackle uh, structural racial injustice in particular and extinction rebellion and the wider environmental movement green being the new red um, it, 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 is, it is, seems to me obvious to, to everyone because the, um, the right in the United Kingdom have a particular problem with Black Lives Matter and Extinction Rebellion and indeed dealing with structural inequality and with climate catastrophe because they don't want to change the economic status quo. And you cannot tackle these problems. I'm afraid I cannot see how you can logically, rationally address these major problems facing the planet without an economic adjustment and that is Johnson's problem with younger voters in particular and if we're not careful Labour will lose those voters to the Greens it seems to be happening already and that is uh, that is very concerning indeed and this is where the so-called war on woke comes from this is why, why the attack is on universities this is why you know in the middle of a pandemic we have conservative ministers obsessed with the minutiae of what's happening in student unions. It's an, it, it, it's an attack on the enlightenment values that are bred by higher education. It is an attack on the idealism and the radicalism of the young, make no mistake. We have in Priti Patel, one of the most frightening home secretaries that I can remember, and I, you know, I can remember quite a few, as can, as can Diane. I think we, we first met in a TV studio the day that um, my noble friend David Blunkett resigned as Home Secretary and she gave me a look and um, I think we knew we were going to be on the same side of a few battles um, in the years ahead. So we've seen some pretty scary um, Home Secretaries of, of, of different persuasions, but Pretty Patel is pretty scary. Let's remember that this woman spoke in favour of the death penalty on national television just 10 years ago. So that is, that is who we're dealing with. And she is the person who would presumably willingly send the gunboats out for asylum seekers in the English Channel and so on. This is, this is how she's, um, she, she's identified herself and painted herself as a politician. And we've now got voter suppression. Again, going to the American Bannon far right playbook uh, we want to, we, we want, it's, it's not enough that we have this thumping majority at the moment. We want to keep things that way by discouraging and suppressing the electorate, particularly young and working class and poorer and minority voters. And that's why you see um, this promise in the, um, in the Queen's speech. It's all about divide and rule and it's all about authoritarianism. How do we respond to it? Well, we unite the very, the very groups and social movements that are under attack. We draw our strength from that, from that collectivism. Um, young people, minorities, so often relied upon by the Labour movement and, 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 Labour, uh, and the Labour Party at election time, but, but not often properly included um, and, and given a proper voice in, in the movement. And, it, now more than ever, it's time to get back to connecting with wider social movements like the movements for racial justice and the movements against climate catastrophe. We also, of course, though, need to, to, to make common cause with some unusual suspects and against the police bill in particular, which is a crackdown on peaceful dissent. 
noisy protest. What's the point of a protest that isn't noisy? In that struggle, there will be some unusual suspects. There will be people who who were noisy campaigners for and against Brexit. There were people who campaigned in favour of fox hunting, but the, but the principle that's at stake is peaceful dissent in a democracy that isn't just about voting every year and then being like international solidarity from, um, from the progressives and radicals in the United States who have done so well in recent times, not just at getting um, Trump out of office, but of, of actually pulling President Trump a little further to um, progress than some of us had, had expected um, on issues like climate catastrophe, but also the TRIPS waiver that Diane mentioned. It is absolutely obscene. And I say this as someone um, whose parents came from India. It is absolutely obscene uh, that those who will not support the TRIPS waiver say that countries like India and South Africa aren't capable of producing vaccines when in recent months India was experiencing devastation because the poor in some respects has been producing vaccines to export and the West while there are bodies floating along the Ganges. We will need to work, yes, sometimes with the old media that's not always been very supportive of us, but goodness me, the BBC is under threat now from the Tories, no question. We have a vibrant new media that is increasingly led by young people. We have community groups and organisations and we need to be working in those communities. And yes, I would say this, we, we need to strategic litigation as well as street protest. We can do all of this. We have done it before. We are, we are, not, um, we are not devoid of ideas and of values and of solidarity. We must rise to the current challenge because nobody else will. Because when the far right is on the streets, who is it that always responds through, throughout British history and throughout world history? It is the young, it is minorities, it is the left. And it's to that challenge that I, that I know we can come together and rise. Listening. Thank you, Shami, I couldn't agree more. Um, our next speaker is from the People's Assembly Against Austerity. Uh, the People's Assembly was set up 13 years ago to fight against uh, the austerity agenda and since then hundreds of thousands of people have marched at their rallies and protests. Uh, so please welcome Helen O'Connor. Thank Thanks. you so much, Gemma, for inviting me to speak and congratulations, Diane, for your long tenure as an MP, a true trailblazer, in my opinion. So um, I'd like to start by talking about the scale of the attacks that are taking place in our class, the working class. The bulk of the wealth, which is generated by our class in the first place, and that should be invested into wages and into social wages like education and the NHS, is being diverted away into the transnational companies. The government has used this public health health crisis to enrich their friends and their class. And the price of that was the PPE scandal, which costs lives, the test track and trace scandal, which costs lives, the herd immunity ideology, which costs lives. The attacks I've mentioned are tearing apart the very fabric of society, and this will create problems for all of us. Inequality and uneven wealth distribution will lead to a rise in every single social ill, things like mental illness, addiction, increased crime rates, sexual exploitation and violence. This has been borne out in research and in the experience of other countries. Poverty is now becoming even more widespread and entrenched. Already more than half a million people who have no formal residential status in this country are being denied access to free healthcare in the NHS. Homelessness is on the rise and millions of children are growing up in abject poverty. And how can we possibly expect any of these children to grow up and live healthy and productive lives? We all know that the gap between the very richest and the poorest has been widening over the past 30 years and the pandemic has accelerated this direction of travel. 
No one, including all of us on this call, our families, our children, grandchildren, will escape the impact of an unequal society where there's rising poverty, rising insecurity, and where our public services like the NHS are being dismantled by a deliberate program of cuts and privatization. The NHS, the welfare state, social housing, free education and all of the social wages that working people are entitled to and which previous generations of working class people fought hard to secure are now all being slowly removed. Over the past decade, we've seen the rise of the so-called gig economy. Uh, these companies, these employers cheat workers out of wages and the workers who work for these companies are treated like they're less than human beings. And it is the black and the Asian and the Latino workers who are bearing the brunt of these attacks from brutal employers in the gig economy and from the private companies operating in our NHS and in the other areas. And these workers can't even get facilities to have hot food, they can't get toilet breaks, and many now cannot even rely on being paid in full for for hours worked. And everybody says Black Lives Matter, but on a daily basis, the vast majority of Black workers can clearly see that their lives don't matter. And this is reflected in their pay, their terms and their conditions. And the latent racism that runs through the way these workers are treated by employers is destroying opportunities and life chances for their children too. When the delivery of services becomes about generating profit, those services deteriorate. Privatization is making our hospitals less safe. Even before the pandemic, we saw a clear correlation between the outsourcing of cleaning services and the rise of infection in hospitals. And reducing quality and the pay, terms and conditions of workers across the board is targeted and it's deliberate to protect profit. Lack of access to public services, including the NHS, is growing. The mainstream press and the media are not mounting any serious challenge to any of this. The idea that we have a genuinely free press in this country simply isn't true. During this pandemic, we've seen scandal after scandal reported, but no genuine and proper accountability. Laws can be broken by government and their rich backers without them suffering any criminal consequences. How differently the, the laws work for the rest of us. How differently the police and the courts react to ordinary people who want to take up our legitimate right to protest. The fact is that the real truth that's going on, on with the NHS and public services is only being put out there by the trade unions and campaigns groups like the People's Assembly. What we have seen is isolated struggles against assaults on workers' rights and human rights. The Black Lives Matter protests were a stunning example of the potential power when we have when Black, white people, youth, older people all stand together as one. And when trade union solidarity and strength is applied, workers can also win, win struggles against employers. Across the country, outsourced workers have held trade union protests, they've taken strike action, and they've faced up to and won victories of, of, against big transnational companies like ISS and others. But it is clear that their right to engage in struggle is now under threat. And the, and the bitter and the brutal reality is that so many struggles have been lost as well. Our movement must examine ourselves and how we have responded to the scale of attacks and standards of living and public services. For years, too many in our movement accepted the lie that there was no money as the richest in society were all busy increasing their wealth. And others accepted the lie that private companies could improve public services when all they've done is fragment services, drive workers into poverty, reduce trade union strength and reduce standards to the point that services are now becoming unsafe. Unions have to face up to the fact that too often we've bent over backwards to avoid conflict with employers and we've swapped serious shop floor organising of workers and members for servicing work and partnership working with employers. We must learn from these mistakes and we must move away and do things differently. And in the unions, there is a real and pressing need for us to come together and to organise our members properly to robustly oppose public service restructuring, redundancies, service and job losses. And we must form deep links with trades councils, community campaigns and the public to assist us in the important work we're doing to defend our services and the workers within them. So let us set out our demands in the NHS and on the wider defence of the public sector, our demands on pay for proper funding for, for the front line and for the workers doing the necessary work that actually keeps the country running, for workplace safety, for housing, for free healthcare, 
free education and for all human beings to be treated with dignity and respect. And let's demand all of the things necessary to renew and rebuild the foundations for a healthy society for every last person in this country. Our rights and freedoms are being restricted like never before, as has already been said, and this has been further ramped up by the Tories. Various governments over the years have attacked our right to withdraw our labour. We already have the most repressive anti-trade union legislation in the Western world. And isn't it funny that the ruling class, the Tories, who are always going on about bureaucracy and wanting less regulation, want to legislate and regulate to death the mass democratic organisations of the working class, the trade unions. And this is about stopping campaigning and stopping strike action. And now they want to go a stage further. They want to restrict our right to protest and to take to the streets, as, as, as has already been said, and the police bill making its way through Parliament will make it unlawful to protest if you annoy people. The entire point of protest is to leverage our collective power. And yes, this is annoying for the ruling class and those who own and control everything it's meant to be. What the police bill shows, however, is there's a deep rooted fear of the power of the working class when we all come together. The only way to defend and workers and our communities is to engage in the type of organizing in our unions, in our social movements, and in our communities that leads to the type of collective activity that seriously challenges the status quo. An important event to kick off the spike back is the National People's Assembly demonstration on Saturday, the 26th of June. This demonstration has been backed by the TUC and many of the trade unions, and we're calling on absolutely everybody to take to the streets with us and to demand a new normal. The full repressive instruments of the state are being sharpened against us, that's really clear, because those who own and control everything are well aware that increasing numbers of working class people will come into trade union and political activity to find ways to protect themselves. So we must build a strong, united movement where we all stand in solidarity with each other and put our demands for a better world, where people come before profit, where we and future generations have a reasonable chance to be healthy, to be educated educated, to thrive, to have public services that are a genuine safety net and to go into decent jobs, decent wages, terms and conditions. I believe we're in the fight of our lives, but we can win, but only if we're united and determined as those who are trying to destroy our pay, terms, conditions and our rights. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Helen. Um, I'm going to go to some questions now. Um, the first question that I've got from the chat uh, asks how can labour and trade union activists show black lives really matter by true anti-racism not tokenism so that's quite an interesting question um diane did you have anything to contribute to that can you hear me yes well, first of all it's important to be allies there's nothing that can be a little bit more frustrating if you're a person of colour who's trying to organise and trying to raise issues, where it's almost as if other people are speaking for you. So one of the most important things that um, white activists and white trade unions can do is be good allies to those people of colour in their union, in the local party who are trying to raise the issues. Um, I also think that it is, as the question implies, um, important to beware of token issues, although sometimes symbolism is important, but it's also good to think about real issues, what's really happening in the workplace around you or in your local community. I mean, I've known workplaces where the people in charge fancied themselves as very liberal and anti-racist. When you looked at who was in senior positions, who was getting to the glass mm -hmm. ceiling, it was never people of colour. So we have to look at real outturns for people of colour um, and we have to try and be good allies. Those are the two things I would mention. Thanks very much, Diane. Does anyone else have anything they'd like to come in with? Helen. I'll go Helen. Yeah. 
I think um, particularly within the trade union movement, it's extremely important to mainstream our, our, our equality agenda into organizing because um, what we're seeing is um, the most exploitative employers are actually employing, the, the, first of all, in the NHS, it's always the migrant workers who end up being outsourced to the private companies in the first place and the pay terms and conditions are just driven down and people are treated extremely badly. So I think it's really important to um, pick those workplace leaders amongst those groups of people and start and support them to fight back properly and drive up wages, terms and conditions, because I think that naturally will then create more opportunities for them. We also see situations in hospitals where um, the private companies, there's no opportunities whatsoever for the black and the Asian workers to progress, even within the companies themselves. The jobs are put out, they're not advertised, white managers are sort of parachuted in, there's no proper processes, etc. So I think it's really, really important that we, um, we mainstream basically our quality around organizing thanks and shami well yes i believe in affirmative action um obviously we're slightly limited by the law but whether formally or informally the trade union movement in particular needs to we, we, we need more black and brown faces in senior in senior and public roles um just like we need more women and i've said this before i've even said this in a speech to the tuc some years ago and I, let's be honest sometimes you get you hear some mutterings in the audience but you know the, the trade union movement has to look and feel and sound and be like the people it represents and we have to we have to put our own house in order before we can tell anybody else about the uh, about their house and about the street and about the neighborhood and about the country and we have to do that on the left um first i you know in my report in 2016 um i wrote not just about anti-semitism but about all forms of racism and i found a lot of all forms of racism in the labor movement but those parts of the report were largely ignored so i just say you know we we have to work on ourselves before we can before we can work on the on, on the world absolutely thanks very much i have another question now that i think builds quite well on that um and it says in glasgow recently we saw some fantastic direct action from a whole community to stop a racist deportation and um, what tactics should we use as a movement to resist the tories and how should labor relate to these more sort of radical forms of protest um does anybody want to come in on, on how Labour relates to, to radical um, blockading in terms of deportations? Well, can I say there is a Labour movement tradition which goes back to um, hundreds of years of taking direct action because sometimes only direct action will do. And what was really great about the people in Glasgow that came out on the street to stop their neighbour being um, snatched and deported was they didn't confine themselves, they didn't confine themselves to sort of otherizing those people. Sometimes it's easy to look at immigrants, people of colour as other people and people you're going to be kind to and be nice about, they identified with them wholly and prepared to take direct action and we need to see more of that. Thank you. Anybody else? Well absolutely, I mean look the point about, so here's the potential contradiction, so here's Shami the lawyer sitting here and I should be sitting here squirming and feeling nervous about talk about direct action but not at all. I mean, the, the whole point about human rights and the rule of law is that they exist and should be and should be um, respected and enforced so that people don't have to take direct action, right? But 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 if people have no choice, they have no choice. And, and if you look at the Universal Declaration on Human Rights, if you look at the European Convention on Human Rights, you have in the preambles, it's so people don't have to take up arm so people don't have to go to war so people don't have to um i would never say to somebody who is being disempowered to the point of being you know we've seen illegal deportations of people who who were who are british nationals or certainly entitled to be in britain that diane exposed during the windrush scandal and now we're seeing laws being passed that are an abomination to human rights the spy cops legislation which i'm afraid i failed to significantly amend or 
defeat. That legislation is an abomination to human rights. That legislation allows not just undercover cops, but undercover agents of the state. These can be turned criminals and informants in the community, including paid for by the state, allows them total advanced immunity from crime. Right? That is the opposite of law. And when laws like that are, this is a sort of a far right government, when laws like that hit statute book, you sometimes have, you have no choice sometimes but to, but to resist by direct action. Now, that doesn't mean you throw your own scruples out of the window. That doesn't mean that you're seeking to, to be violent and harm people, but it does, it does mean you have to resist. And I think in Helen's earlier uh, wonderful speech and presentation, she touched on something very important, which is that it's one law for them. You know, that the rule of law is about the same standards for everybody. And we've seen from the current government, whether in their legislative agenda or, frankly, in their conduct due to the pandemic, Barnard Castle, contracts for mates, all the rest of it, it's one law for them and something quite different for everybody else. And, and as Diane says, that's why we're all in this together and we have to come together, not, to, not as an act of kindness or charity to this group or that group, but because... It, because they are the 1% and we are the 99% and our, our strength comes in numbers. And that those numbers are our strength, whether they're on the street or whether they're on social media or whether they're in people's petitions or at the People's Assembly and so on. Thank you, Shami. And although uh, you weren't successful in any change on that bill, I think we, we can all thank you for all the work and all the fight you brought to, to try to amend it. Uh, Helen. Yeah, um, so I spend a lot of my life sort of organising um, outsourced migrant workers. And I think um, one of the things my members really like to see when they're in a battle or a struggle um, in the workplace to improve their conditions, they really value, um, you know, the MPs sort of being right alongside them in the Labour Party on the picket lines, on protests, etc. So we've done some really good work. And I think people like Diane and, and Jeremy have always kind of like been their right standing with the workers you know when they're on strikes and whatever which has been amazing so that's what we want to see and we want to see obviously um the pressure just being really put on people who exploit people these big powerful entities that exploit people um so there's lots of ways really lots of ways that um um, the Labour Party can be linked up with the with the real kind of struggles that go on day to day on the ground I think Absolutely. Thanks, Helen. Uh, so the next question that's come in is often quite a difficult one for the Labour Party, I think, but I think it's still worth asking and considering. But it says um, both uh, the BLM demonstrations and the demonstration against the policing bill raised people demanding to defund the police. And so asked, what does it mean to, to say you're going to defund the police and how, should Labour be supporting that demand? And how does it differ from the cuts to policing that the, the Tory government has enacted? Um, and Shami, you're probably very well placed to respond. Um, I think it's a great question, and I don't, I don't shrink from it at all. And I think it's really important as our spokespeople, and and let's face it, every Labour member is a is a Labour spokesperson in their community. So I think it's really important that we that we grasp this nettle and we get it right, because sometimes people have fluffed it, frankly, in quite senior roles in our movement have fluffed their have fluffed their lines on Black Lives Matter. So let's be absolutely clear. You know, not every slogan crosses the Atlantic that well but I completely share the sentiment behind behind that slogan and it wasn't about saying there'll never there should be no policing it was what you've got to understand is that the United States is not a welfare state it's not even a welfare state under austerity it's a security state you've got to look at they have no NHS um, women don't even get maternity leave for a few months. You know, this is this is um, a country, the United States, that since Nixon's war on drugs and possibly even before has been in investing so much of its wealth in mass incarceration. You need to watch that wonderful movie, The 13th. 
to understand um, not just the similarities in our trajectory as nations, but our differences. And we do not want to go down that American path. And so what defund the police means in the context of the United States is redirect wealth and precious resources into things like health care for people, into things like social care, into things like education and jobs for the young people and black people in particular that's what it means now i know that if you don't understand that context it can look like you're anti-law and order and and and, and, qu and quite the opposite i mean diane and you know I, I i worked very much with diane when she was our shadow home secretary and in the last couple of elections you know diane was very much campaigning on investment in proper policing because because police budgets had been cut so badly that rape has been virtually decriminalized in the united kingdom so defund the police doesn't mean um what some people think it means and the way it's been spun what it's about is redirecting wealth away from mass incarceration in particular towards the the causes of crime if you like like um like terrible insecurity and um and substance abuse and mental health problems and all the things that you're better off dealing with rather than building more and more private supermax prisons helen yeah, so I can understand where the demand for defund the police come from, because we see all the horrors, don't we, in the press, the deaths and custodies, the Sarah Everard vigil, the way women were treated, you know, when we were at a peaceful vigil, the police actions escalated tensions. And I think one of the problems with the police, I mean, and I have to say that when I was a nurse in the NHS, I did work closely with the police actually to keep people safe. So you'd, sometimes people don't see that side of things and the importance of effective policing. But I think one of the issues is um, that the police are regulating themselves and I think there's much more need for um, external scrutiny actually and for a review of the police the attitudes and behaviors of the police towards my min not minority groups and towards women I think that's that's essential um, right now the, the police exonerated themselves um, from any wrongdoing at the Sarah Everard vigil and we were there we saw what they did we saw the way they handled that was wrong you know so um so I think there's a need like I said for external scrutiny. Thanks. Thanks. Um, Diane, was there anything you'd like to add to those very full responses to the question? Well, um, just quickly, I, I couldn't have explained what defunding the police means better than Shami. And I do think, as you said, you need to put it in an American context. Um, and in, in an American context, what they're talking about is redirecting some of the money that spent on policing into things like social work and education and so on. And we need to remember as well that what you're seeing in America is a highly militarized police force. And some of the funding it gets is not on, you know, police officers to keep people safe, which I think we would all support, but on, on semi militarized vehicles and equipment, stuff our police, um, don't have and wouldn't have. So when people are talking about defunding the US police, they're actually talking about spending less, less money on, on uh, military vehicles and firearms and directing some of that money to the, the underlying causes of crime. So I think if you explain it, I think people do understand. But it's easy to, to talk about defunding the police and turning it into an attack on the left rather than trying to understand what it really means. Absolutely. Thanks uh, very much all. I have one more question that's been sent in, um, which the, fir the first question sort of spoke about how we can be the best allies within our constituencies. And this one says, what kind of things can we do in our CLPs to support mobilisations such as those around the Black Lives Matter movement or Kill the Bill? And what's the very uh, best way to bring those issues into the party and into the party sort of structures? So it's a slightly different angle. Does anybody else want to, um, to come in on that? Well, just quickly. I mean, I've been in the Labour Party um, for, for, I've been an MP for 34 years and probably in the party for 40 years and more. And the Labour Party, I love the Labour Party. I wouldn't have been in it so long if I didn't love it. But there's sometimes a slight danger in Labour Party meeting to spend an awful lot of time on process and procedure and who gets to be the delegate on this committee and the other committee and less time talking about actual political issues. So the very simplest thing you can do is 
try to talk about the political issues in your community rather than who's going to get to be the delegate or, you know, talk about the, the actual political issues. And the point about talking about the actual political issues in, in your party and acting on them, that is how you will build the party in the wider community. I mean, this morning, I was at a demonstration outside what always used to be called the Jeffrey Museum. They now call it the Museum of the Mahoma. It was a Jeffrey Museum. And it was it was funded and set up by a slave trader. And a number of us as Labour Party people, but also ordinary activists, went and had a demonstration outside there. And, you know, it got a lot of attention from people going past. It was a practical way of the local party showing its position on anti-racism and that we don't think that we should be glorifying slave traders. So uh, what I'm saying is a little less about procedure and a little more about the actual things that are affecting people in your constituency. Thank you, Gemma. Thank you, Diane. Does anybody else have anything more to come in on or any final comments that they'd like to make before we start bringing the session to a close? Wonderful. Well, Thank you so much to our speakers for all your contributions and to everyone for participating in uh, sending in questions. Uh, over a thousand of you have joined uh, over the course of today, which is incredible. Um, and we know that there are really important battles ahead and also just how important that campaigning against the Tories divisive agenda is, including uh, from turning you know, Black Lives Matter into, from a rallying cry into reality um, and killing the policing bill for good. Um, Additionally, uh, as this discussion of the stone today, there is so much important work to be done in Labour, in our trade unions, in our communities and through movements such as the People Assembly and make sure to come along if you can to the rally on June 26th um, and more to build resistance against the Tories. Um, please also take on board the action links that have been posted in the chat, uh, including by donating by the link provided so that Arise can continue hosting these really important events. So please stay online, the, don't go anywhere. The next session starts at 3.30 promptly and it's our international session on a world to win from global crisis to international justice. So I'll see you all there. Thank you very much.
Hi everyone, if you're just joining us, we are just taking a short break between our sessions. Um, we'll be starting back up at 3.30 with a world to win from global crisis to international justice. And that's an international session with Bel Rabira Adi MP, Mark Weisbrot, who's the co-director for the Center for Economic and Policy Research, a, a US-based economic uh, institute, Nimala Ranjasim, uh, who's from the South Asia Solidarity Group, Murad Qureshi, who's from the Stop the War Coalition, and Mark Watts, who's a uh, cities climate, who's from C40, the Cities Climate Leadership Group, uh, who's speaking in a personal capacity. Um, we'll see you all back here at 3.30 p.m.
Hi everyone, if you're just joining us now, you're joining one of over a, a thousand people who've taken part today. Um, we're just actually in between sessions, we're just having a quick break. Our next session starts at 3.30 and you'll be joining a world to win from global crisis to international justice. That's being held with Bel Ribeiro at EMP, Mark Weisbrot, who's the co-director of the Centre for Economic and Policy Research, Nimala Rajasijam, South Asia Solidarity Group, Murad Qureshi, Stop the War, and Mark Watts, who's uh, from the C40 Cities Climate Leadership Group, who's speaking in a personal capacity. Uh, thank you very much, and we'll see you in 15 minutes.
Hi everyone, thanks thanks again for joining us. Um, again, if, you, if you've just joined us now, we're, we're just in a break between sessions. Uh, we're just going to be starting at 3.30 and our next session will be a world to win from global from global crisis to international justice. So uh, you've got just about got enough time to make a cup of tea. See you in five minutes. Hi, Mark. Hello. Mr. Weisbrot, you're muted. There we go. I'm unmuted now. Hi, hi guys. Just um, we, We're not going to be starting the meeting until 3 p.m., so if we could just keep our, our mics muted till then. Um, okay. You've heard the voice of Lee Brown, everyone who's watching. Um, so when it, when it starts free, I'm going to hand over to Lee, uh, who's going to be chairing, chairing this afternoon's meeting. So see you all at free.
Hello. Welcome everybody to this session. My name is Lee Brown from Arise and I'm pleased to welcome you all to this session, which is titled A World to Win from Global Crisis to International Justice. Today's event is organized by Arise, the festival of left, Labour's left ideas, along with a range of other left organizations, campaigns and publications. This is the final session ahead of our closing rally that will start straight after this panel and that will be there will be joined by John McDonnell, Richard Berger, Laura Pidcock and many others. We're delighted to have such a great list of speakers and campaigners for this session, which will look at how we advance a progressive internationalist agenda. We have speakers looking at the global climate crisis and the need for climate justice, economic justice and the, anti, the importance of the anti-war movements. Um, and we have a special update on what's going on in India from their Farmers for Justice and again their movement against the reactionary Modi government there. Unfortunately, our speaker that was going to talk about the global Black Lives Matter movement has just had to pull out, but we send our solidarity to that movement that has done so much to raise the issue across the world of state racism. And we can recommit here today as arrived to fully supporting that movement. Um, as we say, this movement, this session is about making sure our movement isn't just a movement against inequality and austerity at home, but for peace and for justice globally. The COVID crisis has not just shown a spotlight on the huge inequalities within nations, but between them too. Countries in the developing world have been hit hardest when they should have been supported in investing in their health systems. They've had to keep paying back huge global debts to global creditors. And now we have the appalling situation of global vaccine apartheid. Millions of lives are at threat from a lack of vaccines, which is caused primarily just by patents being inhaled in the hands of a few private pharmaceutical giants. Now, there are important global calls to waive the vaccine patents, and yet our government is one of the key governments in the world blocking that from happening. And while our government is cutting back on its aid budget, it is preparing to spend tens of billions more on military spending and on a new generation of nuclear weapons. That's investment that should be going into the real security challenge we, challenges we face, not least the climate crisis, where wealthier nations have a huge responsibility to not only lead the fight on this, but to provide the funds to other countries to make a just transition. So these are some of the issues that we'll be addressing in this session today. As the session is on, you can post questions and comments below the stream on YouTube and in the Q&A section on Zoom, and we'll put some of those to our panel after they've all spoken. And just to remind you, please donate at the link provided so that our eyes, we can continue to host these important events and support many other campaigns. Um, and we'll be putting links on the chat and uh, throughout this session. So now I'm going to go on to our very first speaker, who is um, an excellent campaigner for peace and for justice, Murad Qureshi from the Stop the War Code. Hi, um, thank you um, for inviting me along, Arise, uh, for this event. Um, it's, uh, it's a very important time, actually, because there are a, a number of things happening uh, globally, which I think we shouldn't lose sight of. Um, the first of those is the, the pivot to Asia, which, um, in effect, is uh, illustrated well by, uh, the, um, by the British government sending a naval force to uh, very, very uh, contentious waters uh, in the Indo-Pacific, um, Indo-Pacific. Actually, we've sent HMS uh, Queen Elizabeth with a whole artillery of other naval vessels out that way. Now, if you want to take a particular Chinese perspective on that, uh, it's no doubt a reminder for them of gunboat diplomacy during the Opium Wars. Um, I don't think it takes much reading of, of history to, to see how they may see it uh, that way, uh, certainly. Um, but I think it's also a reflection of increasing anti-Chinese sentiments in the geopolitics 
uh, which I think is most health unhealthy. We're seeing it domestically in the UK and uh, the US, the increase in East Asian hate crime. Um, and quite honestly, I'd rather be spending our time and efforts on the war uh, with, uh, with coronavirus, because I do think the Chinese have got a big part to play uh, in it, given that the uh, major production of uh, a, a lot of the, uh, the, uh, the uh, vaccines uh, will uh, undoubtedly come from China. And if you know anything about what's happening from other, in other parts of the world, uh, like the, the part of South Asia my family originates from, uh, they, they're clearly getting uh, Chinese, uh, Chinese vaccines much more quickly than I think is acknowledged here uh, in, in the UK media. So as a result, Stop the War has joined uh, the, the No to Cold War campaign, which will be launched this coming Wednesday. Um, and, um, and, uh, and we certainly need a better appreciation of, of the Chinese perspective on, on these uh, geopolitical matters, as uh, unfortunately, uh, things become increasingly antagonistic, not only in that part of the world, but everywhere, uh, certainly. The, the other thing we shouldn't lose sight of, which... Um, uh, which has just been briefly mentioned by our chair, is the, um, the increase in military expenditure by the, uh, the British government, almost by £16 billion, which came in the middle of the, um, the pandemic, would you believe it? Um, and it's um, an increase over the next four years, over and above the manifesto commitment, which was already half percent annually on the defence budget for every year of Parliament, which actually makes it about 24 0.1 billion compared to the previous budget for the parliamentary term. Now, this uh, clearly cements um, the UK's position as the largest uh, defence spender in Europe and also the second largest in NATO. Um, and I think one of the misnomers we've got to realise this isn't actually so much defence, it's more offensive than I think defensive insofar as it's talking about cyber and cyber, uh, space wars. Um, and these uh, myth myths of weaknesses in the defence that we've always had. Um, and in some ways, the justification, if you hear the words of the, the Prime Minister at the time when he announced this, was that uh, it's to address uh, the systematic decline that we've had over the last 30 years. The other basis of which it was argued for was it was going to create about 10,000 new jobs in the UK annually. Now, my own personal perspective is that you know, you'd get a lot of better bangs for the, your bucks if you had invested that money in the Green New Deal and uh, revamping the infrastructure, uh, the, the, the UK's uh, energy infrastructure. I'm sure it won't be 10,000, it will be hundreds of thousands of jobs. If you just dealt with things like uh, home insulation um, in, 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 uh, in the homes up and down the country, that will certainly create a lot more jobs. And it's not, something that's never really taken off at all in this country, although it's been announced by several governments of different persuasions. That's the kind of thing which I think we should see uh, increased investment as we're coming out of uh, the coronavirus um, pandemic. Um, and I think that's the kind of thing us as socialists uh, need to be arguing for uh, within the party and beyond. The, the, the final area, which we, we can't ignore as well, which again came out of the blue, quite honestly, was the increase in our in the UK's nuclear, nuclear capabilities by about 40%, from 180 warheads to about 260 warheads. Now, we've only been given figures of the number of warheads. We really don't know what the, the financial implications are, but I'm sure that, 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 they, that they exist. But it does show clearly that um, we've, we're, we're breaking our commitments to the Non-Proliferation Treaty, Article 6, um, um, in, in a year when there will be a global non-proliferation treaty conference in August, which was actually meant to have happened last year. So I will be intrigued to hear what the government explanations are for this, um, because I think we should remember politically the last general election, what happened. There was one uh, political leader of a party who uh, declared on, on, on TV that she would press the button if she was asked to. And um, Joe Swinton's political life since then has completely disappeared. Uh, I, I remember actually on the night of the election, uh, her, her loss was the biggest cheer in Kensington Town Hall that we got. And that was from both sides of the political divide. I can tell you this in Kensington. So I think that does t say something about um, how, how, well, how, how unpopular this, this is potentially, but it hasn't been told enough. And I think 
um, it will explain our involvement now increasingly with uh, CND's campaign, certainly around August, and it's something which we shouldn't lose sight of, and we should ask fundamental questions about the um, basis of it, because this is only the first outcomes of the um, integrated review of the UK's foreign defence and development uh, and security policies. There's been a lot of focus on international aid, but we shouldn't lose sight of these two other th these two other areas: the increase in military expenditure and the increase in nuclear warheads in the UK. It's all about the branding. Uh, it's all about global Britain, and it's about us also uh, suggesting that there are different ways of um, going around selling ourselves. Uh, as Global Britain, and I think that's got to be made clear in this arena. Um, can I finally also make sure that uh, this is, and whilst these are huge issues in themselves, Stop the War isn't going to lose sight of the uh, issues that very often have brought um, members to us. I mean, for example, if I wasn't here today, I'd be at uh, outside 10 Down Street uh, protesting about the situation in Palestine, certainly, and we've kept up our, our campaigning activities uh, earlier in the year in, on the war in Yemen that I think to some extent has been forgotten since uh, January, February and, and, the, and, and how critically the British government were involved in supplying arms to it. And finally, um, in some ways, um, coming up to our 20th, um, um, 20th birthday later on in the year, uh, we'll be looking back again at Afghanistan um, so th there is a, a much more complicated global context, but I think there are ways of dealing with it, and we've got to deal with it domestically by being uh, certainly a lot less anti-Chinese, um, dealing with um, alternative proposals for the increased military expenditure, um, and finally um, challenging the increase in warheads. It really is out of kilter with where global policy has been going on this front, for many, many years. I mean, even the Ukrainians got rid of their nuclear warheads, for God's sake, and we seem to be increasing it um, And as, as a similar story in other parts of the world. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much there, Morad. Um, I'll just introduce our next three speakers that we have in this session. We're gonna hear next from Mark Weisbrot, who's the co-director of the Center for Economic and Policy Research in the United States a very excellent organization that everybody should follow on Twitter. They do fantastic reports on the economy in the US, the global economy, but also on the politics of Latin America. Then we have Mark Watts from the C40 Cities Climate Leadership Group. He'll be speaking in a personal capacity about the centrality of climate justice to building a world of peace and justice. And then finally, a very important speaker we hear from Namala Rajasingam, who's going to be speaking about the situation in India, and she's from the South Asia Solidarity. Um, so thank you for that, Murad. I think it's very important we address this issue of a Cold War, um, not merely because these Cold Wars can become hot wars, but because it puts a real barrier um, in front of all the global cooperation that we need um, on health, on climate, on tackling poverty. And this is really a US-led war on China, a Cold War on China, and we should be playing no part in it. Um, our next speaker then, as I said, is from the US. It's Mark Weisbrot, the co-director of the Centre for Economic and Policy Research. Over to you, Mark. Mark, you're on, you need to unmute. Okay, there. Uh, thanks, Lee, and, and thanks, Murad, for that uh, summary of what the UK is doing. And I think uh, I'm gonna start out with just um, uh, what I see as one of the biggest problems that doesn't get enough attention. And that's just you know how the high income countries uh, the, led by the United States uh, are able to maintain control over most of the, of the world. And a lot of that takes place through these uh, so-called multilateral institutions, the IMF, the World Bank, the World Trade Organization. And you can see the world trade, the impact of the World Trade Organization in this uh, struggle against vaccine apartheid, of course, which I think other people are gonna talk about. And, uh, but yeah, you have this terrible distribution of vaccines and you have, you know, 62 countries now in the WTO uh, trying to, uh, fighting to uh, waive the intellectual property, so-called intellectual property restrictions on production of vaccines just so the rest of the world can produce more. And this is an example of uh, how the US and uh, Europe, and they, they really do act together in, 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 in these organizations or in the case of the IMF, you know, the U.S. just has control. 
and I'll, I'll get to that in a minute, uh, because you know this was established back in 1946, and there's no reason that this late in the 21st century, the United States can just veto uh, whatever the IMF wants to do. And then there's also direct intervention, and here you know we work a lot on, on Latin America, and here you can see the direct intervention uh, in in terms of actual coups, the Bolivia, the coup in Bolivia in 2019 which was uh, finally uh, partially reversed. Uh, and then you have uh, sanctions. And I won't talk about that because it's, uh, it takes too long to, exp you know, to just describe the damage, but these, these huge sanctions, you know, given, for example, against Venezuela, they destroyed uh, three quarters of the Venezuelan economy, something you've not even seen in wartime uh, in, in, in the world uh, pretty much. And uh, this is a really powerful, this has become more powerful than military intervention. And, and of course it's completely illegal and, and uh, violates international law and the OAS charter, the UN charter and so on. But uh, this is uh, something, so this is, these are the things that I think uh, will have to uh, change. Uh, they're being used all the time. You know, in the 21st century, as you all know, you had a you reached a point where uh, progressive governments, left of center governments, were in power in uh, were elected in in uh, the for the majority of, of of Latin America, and the U.S. intervened in Brazil and Argentina and Venezuela and Bolivia and Honduras and Paraguay. Some of these countries were coups in Nicaragua in El Salvador, and they they changed it. But now. It's, uh, it is coming back and I'll, I'll get to the positive side in just a little bit. Well, here's one, Peru just had an election and a leftist who had never run for office before uh, defeated the right wing candidate. She's still fighting, she's claiming uh, fraud, but she's not getting uh, much support. And uh, this is a big change. I mean, this is a country with a very rich and powerful elite that has been allied with the United States very strongly. And uh, that's uh, going to change. He's going to have trouble, of course, uh, because he doesn't have the parliament, and they can, you know, use that to try and impeach him and so on. But uh, it's it's still a big a big change, and it shows that there is uh, it's one of the places where there is resistance, and that's why the Bolivian, uh, the MAS, the movement was able to come back, um, you know, uh, after the coup. Uh, one second. I have to uh, plug in my computer because it's about to die. I didn't have this in. Okay, there we go. Uh, so, um, and you know, on the positive side, that's one example. I mean, the positive side, and I think a lot. Some of that is a result of the left. You know, here's another multilateral institution. The Organization of American States is controlled by the United States, and it has a, a Secretary General who's, a, you know, who does whatever they want. Uh, Luis Almagro, and he was the one who was responsible more than anyone for the coup in Bolivia. And I wanna say just one thing, if I have a, a minute on this, because I think a, a good part of the left got uh, that wrong. They didn't, you know, that was a coup that was more of a US coup than anything since 1973 in Chile. And there was a part of the left that didn't uh, see that, either didn't do anything or even some su supported it. And uh, you have this problem uh, where some of the left no longer uh, sees that it's it's really wrong for the United States to choose the leaders of uh, of Latin American uh, countries. So, uh, which is of course the default view in the foreign policy establishment here. Um, so, in terms of uh, progress on the positive side, you did have, and this is something that we fought for with uh, you know over two hundred organizations in the U.S. Uh, the IMF did something positive for once. You know, we've been fighting against them for over 20 years. And they uh, agreed to create $650 billion worth of special drawing rights, which is a reserve asset at the IMF and distributed to all countries, about 40% going to the low and middle income countries, but still it's a lot. And, uh, you know, and this was after the US House passed uh, legislation that we fought for, which called for two trillion, but there's still, and that's still going on. That fight is still going on. This is a fight that's been going on at the, at the IMF, uh, you know, since it was created. Can it play a positive role at all as a, 
you know, like a central bank would pay. There's no conditions on this money. There's no, they're not loans. They don't have to be paid back. And this is, uh, you know, this is a first. Uh, well, it's not that they did, they did something like it's smaller in, in 2009, but the point is uh, that that is uh, an example. And, you know, at the WTO, there's been enormous fights now for 20 years that have made a big difference. They've stopped uh, most of what they, the entire agenda of the, of the World Trade Organization. And, and now they're fighting, you know, for the vaccines. This is organizations from all over the world and some governments too. And that could happen at the IMF too. I mean, the problem is that the IMF, the people representing countries of the IMF are quite different and the rules are different, of course, as well. But there's nothing, you know, that, that, that says that the United States has to control uh, the IMF. So we need much more. And that's another place where there could be a big fight. And finally, uh, I will say something about the, the high income countries. Do I have time or no? Yep. Okay. So the rich countries are a different story. And, I'm, and, and by the way, for the developing world, you do have some uh, one positive thing going forward, and that's uh, China's uh, growth. China is already bigger than the United States as an economy by the measure that economists use for international comparison, which is purchasing uh, power parity. And within nine years, they're going to be twice the size of the United States. And so sometime in that period, we're going to have a different financial system and one which the United States won't be able to use to destroy entire economies and force countries, governments to bend to their will. And so that's going to happen. I can't tell you exactly when, but it will happen. Now, uh, the um, uh, for the rich countries, I think the main thing is macroeconomic policy. And you can see that here in the United States. You have fiscal policy like we've never had before. I mean, deficits of 14.9% of GDP uh, last year, 10.3% uh, of GDP this year. And you have monetary policy, which you've also never had, had before. Uh, and if we can keep this, uh, I think, so, so there's a crucial fight going on in the US because there's, there's gonna be more resistance to those policies. And we have a special thing this is a really historic moment in the United States. And I say this not because just the United States, but it will make a difference in the world because uh, we have what you know is really minority rule in the United States. We have the system uh, where you, know, you, you have voter suppression and gerrymandering and the electoral college and uh, the Supreme Court and, uh, and more that really prevents us from having a democratic country. And all this is up for grabs. Uh, in the next few years. And it, so I would say it's really crucial here that it, if, if the, uh, the majority party here gets its macro policy uh, and is able to maintain these uh, gains that we've made in macroeconomic policy, this country will change. And as a result, the world will change as well because this is the center of the empire. And, uh, you know, uh, it, it, there is a relationship. It's not like the 1960s where you could have, you know, LBJ was a, a great president here in terms of civil rights and Medicare and Medicaid, and then uh, waged a genocidal war in Vietnam. There's more of a connection now between foreign policy and domestic policy than we've had uh, for a long time. It's still not, I mean, it's not that great. I mean, Biden hasn't changed Latin American policy one bit, uh, but you will see uh, changes and, or, or maybe I should say it in the negative, you can't really have change here without changing the structure of this country. And just, I'll give one example of a, one more positive one where we did win, uh, not completely yet, but we got both houses of Congress for the first time ever to vote to order the president uh, to get out of Yemen, uh, the war, the genocidal war in Yemen in, in terms of the, you know, the uh, aerial uh, refueling, the logistical support, and the other uh, help that the U.S. Uh, intervention I mean, is more than help, you know, the participation in that war. And it hasn't happened yet, but it is going to happen. I think the first thing that's going to happen is the uh, is the U.S. is going to stop participating in the Saudi blockade. So these things are happening here. I just want to say that because there is change and you, we're going to see more of it. That's about the best I can do for right now. Thank you. Thank you very much there, Mark. Uh, I think the points you raise on vaccine uh, inequality are absolutely central and have to be a priority for all progressives. 
I mean, the G7 is taking place in Britain at the moment. The area that it's taking place in, in Cornwall, in Britain, has had more vaccines than 22 African nations combined. And this is a very, very sparsely populated area of Britain. Um, there's absolutely no need for this. As we know, this is people being put second to profit. We could easily end the vaccine patents overnight. There's enough support in the WTO. And I don't think people in Britain are clear enough that one of the key nations preventing this is Britain. Even Biden now supported the patent waiver. Um, but Boris Johnson, along with Angela Merkel in Germany, because of their close links to their pharmaceutical industries, are just not prepared as it stands to allow the waiver of their patents, despite the pressure from over 100 countries. So I think we in Arise need to keep supporting the People's Vaccine Alliance in their campaign for our own government to support this international call for a waiver. Um, going on now to our next speaker is Mark Watts, who's going to be looking at the ongoing need. While obviously much of the world has been focused on the uh, health crisis, we need to continue to take the climate crisis as an absolute priority in the international struggle. So we'll move on now to Mark Watts. Thanks, Lee, and, and thanks to Matt and all the uh, organisers that arrived for the chance to participate today. Um, I am indeed going to focus on, on climate breakdown, but I think, as, as we've heard, the, we've currently got to deal with multiple global crises, from, certainly from a pandemic, which remains an existential risk for hundreds of millions of, of people, and the climate emergency, which is an existential risk for everybody alive today and born tomorrow. And I, you know, I think we shouldn't. We should always go back to the fact that both of these crises share root causes. First, in humanity's thoughtless destruction of our natural environment, which is tipping our climate into a state where human civilization can't be sustained, and which has made it far easier for diseases of wild animals to transfer to humans, as we've seen with COVID. But secondly, in the rampant inequality that we all now, all countries suffer as a result of decades of a global economy dominated by neoliberal capitalism, which makes hundreds of millions more vulnerable to the consequences of both COVID and climate breakdown. So, you know, I very much think the, the focus on international justice in the context of global crisis in the title of this session is a very helpful way to frame uh, the discussion. First, because so solving an existential crisis like climate breakdown or the COVID pandemic requires a degree of global collaboration that has never been achieved before by humanity. Obviously, the last thing we need is a new Cold War, as, as Murad uh, and Lee have referred to. And, and in fact, collaboration between the US and China in particular, particular is absolutely critical uh, on climate breakdown. But moreover, it, it means this need for global collaboration means that everyone has to see that they've got a stake in their society because the scale, the speed of change that's required particularly to decarbonise our economy, is going to be absolutely tumultuous. But secondly, stopping both COVID and climate breakdown requires paying serious attention to science and data. And if we do that, we get a pretty clear idea of the balance of responsibility for change. But as we've seen really clearly in the last year in particular, neither a collaborative approach to crisis solving at a global level or science-based government can be achieved with it within a neoliberal capitalist framework because the greed of the one percent so frequently triumphs over what should be rational decision making that would benefit everybody so there needs to be major political change for a science-based approach to these crises to be um, achieved that said though i mean looking looking at from the climate crisis at the moment there's been more progress in the last few months than in the previous five years since the Paris Agreement and for much of the 20 years that I've been involved in the struggle around to prevent climate breakdown. We're not winning, we're not on track, but we're much less off track than we were. Most importantly, China now we see is transitioning from having domestic policies that have dramatically shifted global markets, particularly for renewable energy and electric vehicles, to now showing the first signs of some genuine international leadership. And then I think secondly, a, a really notable shift now in the balance of forces within the global capitalist class. For the first time, those who see climate breakdown amongst the, the, the global capitalist leadership see that climate breakdown is ultimately bad for everybody and now in the ascendancy, only just, but in the ascendancy over those who think that their wealth and privilege can protect them from climate breakdown. And so have resisted a shift from the 
fossil fuel economy from which they profited so greatly. And the signs of that are everywhere, from the successful shareholder revolts against Chevron and Exxon in the last few weeks, to the Dutch courts requiring Shell to halve its emissions by 2030, but of course, most importantly, in some major, if incremental, policy shifts from capitalist governments. So I want to spend just a, a minute or so on, on numbers, because numbers are essential in, in thinking about the climate challenge, um, both to understand the scale and the immediacy, and because the numbers that are used, particularly the percentage reductions that countries bend, bend around, can be very confusing. The first and most important number for me is that we've got six years left of budget. It's 230 to 40, 440 billion tonnes of carbon. Um, that's to keep our global temperature rise below 1.5 degrees, but it's really the time that's important here. If we carried on burning carbon at the rate of the last few years, that budget would be gone in six years. So it's an emergency because we've got almost no time left. And the General Secretary of the United Nations puts this very, very well. He says repeatedly, we're on the verge of an abyss. And so we better make sure our next step is in the right direction. The big progress here, though, in the, in the last few months is that the major polluting governments have now accepted that basic premise of the size of that carbon budget. Uh, and most importantly, the, the really dramatic shift in policy in the US since Biden became president. Second number um, is halving within a decade, which the generally agreed short term for staying within that carbon budget is that global emissions have to halve every decade from now on. But the most crucial halving is the first one between now and 2030. And again, there's been some real progress here, not in the reality of that of reducing that budget, but in the commitment to do so. A year ago, halving by 2030 wasn't on the agenda for the forthcoming climate talks in Glasgow. The best that most people thought would be possible was agreement on reaching zero carbon by mid-century. So agreeing there's an emergency, but only committing to action uh, 30 years in the future. And that changed dramatically last September when China committed to a peak emissions date of 2030 alongside carbon neutrality by 2060. And that commitment alone shaved half a degree of global overheating off the trajectories uh, for where we were going. And then that's followed a slew of, of, of targets from major polluting countries, Japan, EU, South Korea, the UK, all pushing upwards and then topped off uh, in March by the US through Biden committing to halve its emission by 2030. So that is real and genuine progress of the light we haven't seen for many years. To put it in context, however, Climate Action Tracker assesses that that's reduced the gap between where we are and where we need to be by 2030 by about 10 to 14 percent. So there's a long, long way to go. And if you look at where the money's flowing, uh, an analysis last week showing that in the G7 governments alone invested $189 billion in the fossil fuel sector just during the pandemic, just government funding, more than they put into clean energy. So the money is still flowing in the wrong direction. And in fact, the single biggest test, if you want to apply one of any government's commitment to climate action at the moment, is where they're putting their, their stimulus because it's so big, it has such an extraordinary opportunity to shift the global economy. And we need to have a really significant green and a just uh, recovery. Final number uh, that I want to come to is, is 100 billion, or maybe it needs to be a trillion, which is the, the money that needs to transfer from the West to the global South on an annual basis to tackle the climate crisis. Because going back to my first point here, the, the, this challenge, this global crisis around climate as with COVID requires global collaboration. That means every country's got to act, every country's got to be bought in. And yet there are vast differences in responsibility and immediate impacts of, of climate uh, conditions. And whilst the focus absolutely needs to be on the richest nations who've done the most to cause the climate crisis, We've left it so late now, only six years with it of that climate carbon budget left, that the big countries in the global south, what they do now does really matter. What Brazil, Indonesia, India, and of course China, which is still a global south country. And whilst cutting pollution is good for everybody in the long term, so it's in those countries' interest to rapidly decarbonize, the cost of transitioning really, really quickly from fossil fuel economy to a green one is very high. And so 
We need to see now the promised $100 billion a year that the rich countries committed to as part of that Paris Agreement, which has never materialised, about $20 billion, uh, the best that's been put in any one year so far. Uh, and that number needs to rise because the real cost for the global south, not only to decarbonise, but also to adapt, is probably more like a trillion dollars a year. So just to close, um, I think you know what, what needs to happen to go from a global crisis to international justice in the case of the climate emergency is first a big test in the capitalist countries is a, is a fast green recovery, stop investing in the bad stuff, all stimulus needs to be green. And then secondly, we need, we need global justice. Vaccine equity, so my organization C40 calls for both uh, the uh, patent waiver alongside an end for public subsidy for fossil fuels uh, and all stimulus to be green, and we need climate finance justice. And of course, the last thing we need is a new Cold War. Thanks for listening. Uh, back to you, Lee. Thank you very much there, Mark, for showing why this needs to be a central part of our campaigning for international justice. Um, I'm going to move on to our final speaker. We will have all have seen some of the terrifying and distressing scenes coming from India in recent months around um, the public health crisis, and that's continuing to, to spiral out of control. But also we will have seen those hugely inspiring scenes of the farmers' protest and the farmers' struggle, one of the biggest mass movements in all of human history. So we're delighted now to move on to our final speaker in this session, and then we'll take questions that people have been putting on the chat, and should continue to put on the chat. Our final speaker in this session is Namala Rajasingham from South Asia Solidarity. Thank you very much for inviting me. Um, you can see me and hear me, right? We can hear you, I can't see you. Oh. I could. There you go, we can see you now. Oh, I see, I see. Oh God, I see. I... That's okay. No, 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 that means I was trying to do something on this device, but anyway, that means, can you just give me a second? Of course. Um, so just why Namala's um, sorting out her technical difficulties. If people want to put questions to any of the speakers. Oh, no, that's okay. That's, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm ready, yes. Right. Okay. Uh, um, a few weeks ago, a few weeks ago, the whole world was subjected to the harrowing scenes of a pandemic gone out of control in India and a government that had completely abandoned its people as it was more interested in building its popularity through mass religious festivals and election rallies and ensuring profits for the big Indian pharma, like Serum Institute, the largest vaccine producer in the world, by not carrying out a timely and free vaccine rollout in India itself. But this disregard for the welfare of its people by the Hindu supremacist BJP is built into the very fabric of its thinking, its vision for India as a shining new corporate India, not a people's democracy, and also pandering to the idea of India becoming a global economic power. And this is to be achieved by a Hindu supremacist political strongman at the helm, driving this change. This means minorities, especially Muslims, sorry, minorities, especially Muslims, Christians, and Dalits are systematically marginalized. And those women activists, hold on, I'm just having some. So I thought I could read it straight from my iPad, but I can't. Somehow I don't know how to do that. <sighs> right, okay. Farmers, students, human rights defenders, journalists who dare to dissent are hounded, intimidated, and locked up in prison. Since 2014, when Modi came to power, we have seen state-sponsored mob violence against minorities on an unprecedented scale. Public and governance institutions, especially the judiciary, have been radically politicized to both embrace Hindutva and act with a bias in favor of the ruling party. The Modi regime has enacted a series of laws aimed at consolidating Hindutva rule. The citizenship laws that exclude Muslims and pro-corporate farm laws that will completely trash the rural agricultural economy of millions of farmers, and the abrogation of Article 370 of the Constitution, reneging on India's obligation of recognizing Kashmiri autonomy. The Hindu fascist regime wedded to the Indian corporate 
corporates has championed the rise of corporate figures like Ambani of Reliance and Adani, who have not only bought up India wholesale, but under Modi, but also are in search of opportunities abroad. The international dimension of this can be clearly illustrated by one specific example. The Modi regime is a staunch ally of Netanyahu and now of Israel today, completely reversing India's proud record of decades long solidarity with the Palestinian people, both successive governments and the Indian people. Today, India is the largest procurer of Israeli arms. India is also in receipt of Israel's important export, counterinsurgency methods of training. And of course, this will be deployed in places like uh, Kashmir. This is a bleak picture of Indian democracy, but there are many reasons for us to be optimistic that despite the scale of the repression and the terrifying rise of Hindu fascist forces, there is much resistance on all sides. When the citizenship laws were passed, thousands of Indian citizens marched right across the country, prominent amongst them Muslims, supported by large swathes of people from all ethnic groups and Hindu, Hindus as well, and obviously backed by the broad left movement in India. The Muslim community is said to be a frontline force today for Indian democracy to protect the secular constitution of India, which Modi wants to tear up and make a new Hindutva constitution to build an exclusivist Hindu state. The women of Shahin Bagh of Delhi carried out a sit-in lasting several months and only the pandemic ended it. As dissenters, as dissenting activists from Hindutva ideology are being picked up daily and thrown in prison as anti-nationals under colonial laws of sedition, more are joining the ranks of resistance every day. The historic farm and farmers movement is the greatest inspiration, is in its seventh historic month and has stopped the Modi government's plans to implement the farm laws on its tracks for the moment and it has inspired many globally. The farmers are still camped out there, living their lives of protest despite the pandemic. In May, they declared a black day of protest to mark the sixth month into the protest. On June 26th this month, a big move to protest in front of governor's houses is being planned under the slogan, save farming, save democracy. Uh, they see all of this as part of India's, uh, you know, democratic campaign for democracy. Separate women's committees are being formed on the campsites of protest. The newsletter Trolley Times is continuing to be published. While the farmers are camped in Singhu, Tikri and Ghazibad, parallel actions are taking place in the farmers' villages. What does this all mean to us on the left in Britain and especially the South Asian left? How do we organize our solidarity in support of struggles in India? A section of the Indian diaspora community in the UK and in the US and elsewhere are ardent supporters of the BJP government and Hindutva ideology. They are politically active through organizations like the HSS, the Hindu Swayam Servat Sun, the British branch of the fascist RSS, which is also the parent organization of the BJP and was set up inspired by European fascism, uh, fascist movements in the 1920s, but in fact has outlived these European fascist movements. The RSS has several admirers amongst British politicians. The HSS, Hindu, the Swayam Servat Sangh in Britain, and the Hindu Society have successfully lobbied the Tories to muzzle the implementation of caste discrimination legislation in Britain. Now they see themselves as targets and victims of what they call Hindu phobia. They have close political affinity to pro-Israel lobbies in the UK and are fashioning a campaign against what they call Hindu phobia. If we criticize the Modi regime or Hindu fascism or call out casteism, we will be called a Hindu foe. Similar to how anti-Semitism is invoked against critics of Israel. But unlike anti-Semitism in Europe, which evolved over a millennia ago historically, there is no materiality to this notion of Hindu phobia in Europe. Now, if you call out caste discrimination, you could be accused of racism against, within inverted commas, Hindus now. The last point I just want to make is that Modi and Johnson have become begun trade talks virtually. 
as both of them are keen to secure a deal to boost their respective political careers. Uh, Boris Johnson needs a, a trade deal very quickly uh, post-Brexit and uh, Modi does as well. Along with the trade deal, Modi is keen to secure opportunities for Indian multinationals in the UK. What is also really concerning is that he has also agreed to take back Indians who are here illegally, which will trigger mass deportations and removals. And this I believe is already underway uh, ever since the new immigration rules and guidance that was introduced in January 21, soon post Brexit. Um, and it has already, it's already underway. And I feel that maybe the Glasgow incident was, was one of those uh, because there were two Indian nationals who they were trying to deport at the time. So these are some of the issues that the British left and, 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 and of course, solidarity with the farmers protest and, and the South Asian left in this country have to take into account when organizing solidarity with struggles for social justice, equality and democracy in India. And I, I also will put on the chat one little thing is that South Asia Solidarity Group has uh, recently done a very um, uh, short spoofy video uh, satirizing this relationship um, and uh, so uh, I, I think I sent it to the organizers and I don't know whether one of you can put it on the chat so people can view it afterwards. I will try to do it if I can. Thank you. I'm really sorry I was juggling around my iPad. Sorry about that. Well, that was a brilliant presentation. So thank you for that, despite whatever technical difficulties you have. And we have just put your video in the chat so everybody can watch that. It's on YouTube. Um, so now we've got a little bit of time to go to questions. We've had a number in, we'll keep on dropping them in the chat and we'll, if we've got time, we can put them to the speakers. I'll try to tailor them, I'll merge them with them because we've had quite a few and um, direct them at the most relevant person to respond. So the first one is for you, uh, Mark Weisbrot, and it's on Joe Biden, really. We've heard a lot of positive things here um, about his domestic agenda in terms of his big um, boost to social security and health care and social care, um, the big stimulus package. I think we haven't really heard so much about his foreign policy. So could you just give us a little bit of a backdrop to what you think um, around Biden's foreign policies and the changes that are being made and the continuation that there is with um, what went before it? Well, there hasn't been a lot of change. I mean, Latin America is a special case in US foreign policy. I mean, that is the hardest to change because you know, you have a big complex uh, so-called national security state here. You got the Pentagon, the State Department, the National Security Council, the foreign policy committees of Congress. And, uh, you know, they don't always agree. And so they'll have differences. They have differences on, you know, uh, on, on the Middle East, on uh, Iran, uh, on a good part of the world. and and. But in Latin America, they just have this, you know, idea that this is ours and we want it back. You know, that's been the last 20 years. And uh, and there's no real dissent. And as a result, the media doesn't have much, uh, uh, you know, objectivity. Uh, I mean, even less than they have in the rest of foreign policy. I think, well, you know, on Afghanistan, he's been, you know, he has been different in the sense. Well, I mean... Trump actually wanted to get out <laughs> as well. But I mean, for, you know, as compared to the usual uh, kind of uh, liberal interventionist foreign policy, he is getting out and he's um, mostly, uh, I think he was more determined that than you would have a typical uh, democratic president maybe. And that was partly because of his experience uh, in the Obama administration where he did fight uh, to get out uh, in there and uh, they got rolled by the generals and, and so on. Uh, but I think uh, mostly uh, he hasn't really, he hasn't changed. He's changed the things that, you know, the uh, interventionists want. I mean, in terms of relations with Europe, the China stuff, as you can see, is, is, is pretty bad uh, in terms of a new cold war. Uh, so um, I think in Israel, Palestine, he did give in to some uh, pressure, but not very much. Uh, I, I think he will see some change. You know, Israel, Palestine was a good example of you. Again, you want to look on the positive side. 
you, you had the movement for Black Lives had 15 million people in the streets and it was the largest demonstrations in US history. And that, uh, you know, it changed a lot of consciousness here, the, you know, around race, racism. And, uh, and that extent, and you could see that in the Israel-Palestine, the latest uh, conflict and the US uh, having, you know, uh, I mean, the discussion here in the US, I should say, was different than previously. I mean, you have public opinion changing, and I think you will see more a recognition of the violent racism of U.S. foreign policy and more connection uh, between that and the racist violence here in within the U.S. And so that is that is one place where I think he felt pressure from the U.S. Congress, which was feeling uh, the pressure from the base of the Democratic Party because of this uh, this really significant uh, change in, in consciousness recently. I think that will extend uh, to other countries as well, but it's a very hard struggle. Uh, you know, the only positive side you can say is that in the US Congress, there is pushback, uh, even in Latin America, you have the chair of the House Foreign Relations Committee, for example, uh, said that the US is missing an opportunity to negotiate uh, with Venezuela. They actually opposed what Biden is doing there. And, uh, and there, the Europeans can play a role too. You know, the Europeans did move. Uh, they, they did uh, re stop recognizing uh, Guaido as the interim, so-called interim president, which is a sanction itself because it cuts off all these assets all over the world to Venezuela and uh, causes a lot of suffering there. And, but, but Europe is still uh, much too aligned uh, with the US on Latin America. And so Biden, uh, you know, doesn't feel that much pressure from there. Thank you for that, Mark. Morad, the next question is really aimed, well, it's aimed at Britain's foreign policy, so I think you're the best person to respond on that. It's quite a general question, really, so uh, you've got just a few minutes to answer this sweeping question, but what would you, how would you describe a progressive British foreign policy? Um, what are the key demands that we should have on the Labour Party and on the government? Um, if we were if we're to fight for progressive foreign policy, so that's quite broad. Yeah, you need to unmute. Uh, you're, you're quite right, Lee. That is quite broad. So <laughs> I'll reiterate the points I've been making. I think it's very important that we don't take this uh, anti-Chinese bias in geopolitics at face value. I think it's. It's got to be looked at fundamentally. Um, I think Mark from America mentioned that they are the biggest economy now in the world. It's, it's very rarely acknowledged. Uh, I think they are a power of influence and good in, 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 in climate uh, agenda. I think if you're going to get through to the Asian middle classes, which I do think you've got to sell uh, climate change to, uh, the Chinese uh, authorities are your best way uh, through. Um, the second thing is don't lose sight of, um, of, of what the, uh, the British government's doing uh, in the middle of a, um, a, a response to the pan pandemic. Increased military spending, um, uh, levels of which we've never heard of before. Um, and this is all part of the, the first uh, part of the, uh, the, the review of UK's foreign defence and development security policy. Now, the focus so far... Uh, for, for very understandable reason, has been on foreign aid and, and, and it going from 0.7 to 0.5. But I think we're losing sight in terms of amount, certainly, what's happening on increased military expenditure, the 16 billion I mentioned, and what, uh, what, what better you could do with that money. Certainly, if you want to try to get an economy out of uh, a pandemic uh, and into uh, a, a, a green, environmentally based ones, I think those kind of monies should seriously be going into a Green New Deal in the UK economy, which will create more jobs than I think the defence industries annually. I'm pretty certain about that. The experts can confirm that. And the final thing, we don't lose sight. We have increased our warheads. No one else in the world has done that. Um, and that's out of keeping with our, uh, not only our international obligations, but the general tone of where we were going. The Non-Proliferation Treaty has you know, been around for 50 years and it's 
got had consensus in continents like Latin America, as well as uh, in, in Europe. And suddenly, out of the blue, we have um, the British Prime Minister declaring we'll increase the warheads. I do think we've got to not lose sight of uh, these issues in the the geopolitics and. Britain's future role uh, as global Britain, because I think that's what we're seeing and that's what we've got to have to respond to. Um, uh, for example, uh, as I said right at the outset, we, we, we've already sent an armada to, to, uh, to, to, to the Indo-Pacific, um, um, ten, ten, tense waters in the Indo-Pacific. Now, I'm not sure that's been given, the, 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 it's, it's, it's been done in our, sh should be done in our name, given how it can create huge amounts of tensions and turn a cold war into a hot war very, very quickly from just a few incidences out in sea. Thank you, Morad. Um, well, I've got two more questions, which I'll direct one at each uh, of the two speakers, and then we'll come back for final remarks. Um, Mark, again, it's quite a broad question, but I think it's a very interesting one, that Boris Johnson's made a lot about the green rhetoric, um, but the question was that so sure what it will actually uh, look like in reality. Um, what for you should a real green transition look like in the UK? Well, yeah, I think, you know, it's, it's a slightly contradictory position on the UK's climate policy because certainly the, the targets are genuinely world leading and are you know, more or less in line with what the science says they, they should be, particularly the nearer term uh, targets where, where Britain has, has gone a bit ahead of, of others, you know, 65, 70% reductions within the next 10, 10 or 15 years. And, you know, there's a, Britain also stands on a, on a record if you just look at the conventional analysis of uh, a country's emissions, Britain's emissions have been going down relatively uh, steadily for the, for the last few years. I think the, the problem arises in, is when you really dig into it, Partly Britain's apparent success is based on the fact that so much of our pollution causing industry uh, has, has been offshored and we rely on the manufacturing of our products in, in China and Asia in, in particular. And the emissions then count on their balance, not ours, although we consume them. And that's true for, for many of the, the big Western capitalist economies. Uh, and indeed, the, you know, the international, to go back to some of the uh, Marks points uh, earlier, the, the international methodology for account carbon accounting was designed so that it favours the Western capitalist economies and focuses on what's produced within your geographical boundary rather than that which you consume, uh, which would show a very different picture. But, the, you know, I think the, the big well, the big thing that you really need to see is, it, is, in, is in the policies that have been put in place absolutely right now in response to the COVID pandemic, because there will never be such a large injection of public in investment in a short space of time, as is now happening to try and restart the economy in Britain uh, and elsewhere. And it will have a decisive influence on whether or not we genuinely are gonna halve global emissions in the next decade or carry on on the previous trajectory. And at the moment, the balance sheet isn't good. Uh, generally, still far too much money is flowing into, into sectors of the economy which either directly fossil fuel producing or which uh, need to, to change dramatically and conditions are not being applied to the money that supports those industries. Obviously, we should be supporting workers. We should be uh, protecting people's income, but we need to be asking industries to change very dramatically with that, with that public funding. Lee, if I could, I'd, I'd, I would, I'd like to come back on that, that first question as well, because just to add to, to Mark's answer on, on Biden's foreign policy, I do think you know, there's one very significant seismic change between Trump and Biden, which is on climate policy. Trump, Trump's policy was to actively try and destroy the international agreement, the Paris Agreement, uh, which at least was, was making some dent in what's needed to tackle climate breakdown. And he did a pretty good job of it, effectively stalling international collaboration for four years. Biden has very quickly and very decisively um, re-entered the US into the Paris Agreement, set a much, much, much better target for US emissions and, and put significant uh, federal dollars in trying to achieve that target. None of it big enough, but it's a really big and significant change in the, and US leadership on climate internationally is something you can talk about with loads of conditions around it, but it's a, a seismic change from where Trump was at. Yeah, sorry, I didn't think of that when uh, said uh, when Lee said foreign policy. I wasn't thinking of that as the traditional foreign policy, but that's absolutely right. 
Well, thank you both. Um, Namala, this question is really specifically aimed at you. Um, so yeah. really what the questioner was basically saying, could you say a little bit more about the, um, the climate justice movements in India and the strength of them and what their main demands are? I think, you know, with India being such a huge country, uh, we can have a real bearing on the future of the global climate justice movement. So people would like to just know a little bit more about that. The climate justice movement in India, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not well versed on the overall total climate justice movement, but climate justice issues are issues for the poor there, land disposition. For instance, these corporates that Modi has supported, Ambani and Adani are, and, and Vedanta, they're waiting, they're poised, waiting to, dis, uh, to, to throw out millions, over a million uh, Adivasis living on the Indian hinterlands, the, you know, territory that has, that is totally unspoiled. They have lived there for millennia, you know, even before the settled civilizations began. Uh, Adivasis, I suppose you would say the aboriginals of India. And they're all in these crucial mine rich uh, mountains. And, 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 and the big plan is to dispossess them and, you know, throw them off the land. So because because this is getting ready for mining and of course Adivasi activists and Dalit Dalits and the Adivasis are the bottom of of Indian society so it's it's a very serious issue that is coming to the fore now and there's a lot of activism and of course uh, the broad Indian left movement is is linked with them that is what I can say but I also saw a comment about Tulsi Gabbard and I would say anybody who uses this Hindu four uh, notion is an absolute no-no. And I just want to, in, in, in relation to that, I want to share something very relevant to Britain because Keir Starmer, when he became leader of the Labour Party, within a few days, he met with the BOD. They were, they were one of the first organizations he met. And then we saw a letter that the Hindu society had written where the BOD had recommended to them, to Keir Starmer, to meet the Hindu society. Within a few days later, he had met with them. And South Asia Solidarity Group, we wrote a public letter and a letter to Keir Starmer, which became an open letter, raising a lot of the issues that I raised today. And, and, and I mean, we have, of course, had no response. The fundamental problem in here is on, on one level, we want to be friendly with corporate India, India, because we want to be, we want to be, um, um, for one reason is to, we are worried about the emergence of China. And so we want to juxtapose India against it. So we want to, privilege in their positioning and, and, and we are willing to overlook. And both, both parties are guilty of this, I, I would say. And the other thing is that we have fundamentally our race policy. We have got it, the Labour Party, got it wrong. We have no understanding of how to look at race. So race, with, as far as the South Asians are concerned, it's all about this culture and faith communities and all of that. And so these issues can be very skillfully wrapped up uh, into culture issues that you, if you are against our uh, cultural practice of caste, then you are a racist. Uh, so it's it's because we have to do a lot of groundwork to understand theoretical, theoretical, political theoretical understanding of how race uh, cuts across these various communities. And I'm sorry, in the Labour Party, I do not find that it has been done. Even the left has, has a long way to go, in my opinion. And that is one reason that we are supporting these kind of, uh, these kind of you know, or supporting or keeping silent when these kinds of grossly unjust and ra radically reactionary um, ideas creeping into, into our, and, and that they can call us, South Asians, are, people like me are going to be racist or exactly like how people in the Jewish Voice for Labour are being called anti-Semitic. We are, going, we are being called Hindu folks. And, and so are our white comrades. So this is something that has to be tackled. Otherwise, we have a serious problem uh, with the South Asian, um, um, you know, having South Asians on side, the left has to think about how to deal with this problem. Because ordinary South Asians, uh, ordinary, I mean, of course, there are the corporate South A Indians um, who are very financially well endowed, powerful, et cetera. But, and the ordinary, ordinary South Asians have always been broadly on the left, voted labor, et cetera. But this is a new idea that we have to deal with. And, and, and that is to understand the 
the race question properly, question of race, is race and nationalism properly, theoretically. And of course, I know I, I'm not expecting much from the Labour Party, the mainstream Labour Party at the moment. So, but we, we have to continue to do the homework there. Well, that was absolutely fascinating. Thank you for that, Namala. I mean, it's just an area of the world that I think most of the British left has just not really focused on before. And it's clear that we're going to have to spend more attention, pay more attention to uh, the political developments inside India and India's relationship with China. So thank you for that. Um, would all, I'll just come back to all the speakers now, just for one minute closing remarks, and then we'll move on to the final rally. So I'll keep in the order that you spoke. So Murad, uh, one minute closing remarks. Yeah, th thank you, Lee. I, I think that the most imperative issue is the, uh, the Cold War um, being instigated under global Britain, um, materialising into a hot war uh, from from sending naval a uh, naval uh, naval cavalcade to uh, the Indo Pacific. That's one thing we must uh, look at uh, very uh, carefully and with much concern. Whilst we've got the government increasing military expenditure and uh, nuclear warheads, uh, when quite honestly the, the demands uh, we've uh, demands in the economy are are much greater in the health service and in our environmental concerns if you want to address them in the immediate future. They are by far the better uh, public expenditure areas than um, any increased military expenditure and uh, increasing warheads. And I think this is only the first part of the international, uh, the uh, integrated review. And I think we've got to be very, very careful. Uh, we, we need to respond with uh, other proposals and suggestions and continue doing that so uh, the, the electorate in future knows quite clearly what they're buying into. The only glimmer of hope I can give you is the one I mentioned earlier. One, uh, one, one party leader dis did say during the last election that she would press the nuclear button and we soon so saw her political career dashed in, 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 <laughs> in, in, in instantaneously. So I, I do think the public are clued up on these things and let's not lose sight of that. Thank you very much, Mark uh, Weisbrot. One minute closing remarks. Again, you're, you need to unmute. Thanks, sorry about that. So, yeah, I mean, these issues are also urgent. I, I don't wanna give any uh, necessary priority to, uh, you know, the ones that I work on, for example, or, uh, I mean, I think, though, uh, one thing that I think doesn't get enough attention and is related to all of these issues is uh, really uh, the uh, the conflict between the the rich and poor countries and the you know the role of the United States and Europe. And I think this is important for a whole number of reasons. Well, I mean, people have already brought up the Cold War. That's just another example, right? So, U.S to dominate China and it can't. Uh, and so, I mean, US government does. And I think that, so that, that affects climate and everything else that we wanna see. But also with the rest of the world that it doesn't have the independence and power that uh, China has, uh, it, it's a more devastating thing if, we, if you think about Africa or Latin America or much of Asia still uh, the, if you don't have, you know, if you don't have self-determination uh, in your economic policies, uh, then you you don't have democracy really. And um, there's a little bit of that problem in Europe, for example. The, some of the countries in the eurozone found that out uh, that they didn't have control of their most important macro policies in the Great Recession, and it hurt them a lot, especially Greece of course, but also Italy and Spain and others. And so uh, I think that this is, this is just a huge problem and it's one that is going to end. And somebody mentioned that China has played a, a big positive role. And I wanna, I, I, I wanna uh, reinforce that, you know, most of the people that came out of extreme poverty in the world since 1980, were in China and the ones that didn't live there, actually China had a lot to do with that as well through its investment exports. Uh, I mean, uh, buying the exports of, of the rest of the world, especially Africa 
uh, and it was a huge thing I mean, because it became the largest uh, economy in the world. So uh, this is the kind of thing, the kind of progress in the world that people don't pay attention to that is really essential. It's really essential for countries to have the ability to determine their own development policies. And they don't have that right now in, I would say, still most of, of the world. Thank you, Mark. Uh, that's, that has to change. Sorry. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah. and to Mark Watts, just one minute on any final remarks or thoughts on the battle for climate justice? Can I, can I just make... Oh, Nimala, I'll come to you in a second. Okay. Sorry, Nimala. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, on the, on climate justice, first, wealthy nations now need to deliver on the much improved commitments that they've made. That means a decisively green recovery from the COVID pandemic, ending all public subsidy for the fossil fuel economy uh, and a decisive investment in uh, new jobs in the new green economy, which is going to become the decisive. And then secondly, we need vaccine equity uh, alongside the, del the delivery of the promise of the $100 billion plus per year of climate finance from the, the West to the global South. Thank you very much. And Namala, would you like to just say one minute closing remarks? Yes, uh, there, there are slight glimmers of hope because after this pandemic, uh, this apocalyptic uh, scenes in India, even Modi's own party members have suffered a great deal. And there have been a lot of questions and he has had to, he has been forced to declare free vaccines to all. And also he, the BJP has suffered some significant losses in the recent state assembly elections and maybe set to lose a few more, which is, which is going to eat into there. But we in Britain have to support the efforts to, to destabilize the Modi regime. That's the biggest um, you know, support we can give uh, to, the, to the left and to the people of India for in, in support of Indian democracy. And, and also identify the forces who are supporting Modi here and engage with them in a different way and, 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 and be very forthright and open about it, uh, challenging, questioning. Uh, and I, I don't see that happening at the moment. So there are few of us who, who are constantly banging on about it. So I will end with the farmer's slogan, save farmers, save democracy in India. Well, that's a powerful way to end the session. So thank you for everyone for participating. And it's clear that we on the left need to be clear that to win a game, as our speaker said, Labour should not only be a clear anti-austerity party, but we need to be a party that's an internationalist party that advocates for peace and not war, takes seriously the international cooperation needed against climate change and the global battle against global inequality, especially at this moment, um, for vaccine equity. So I'd like to thank all the speakers again, and we'll be moving straight over now to our um, final rally, which has John McDonnell, Laura Pidcock, Richard Bergen, and many others. Now, remember, if you can make a donation, the links are in the chat. And please follow our media partner, Labour Outlook, which has got lots of articles by the speakers today, and we'll be covering this event in the next few days. So thank you to all the speakers, and we look forward now to the closing rally. Comrades, it's uh, it's just about time for the closing rally. I'm just going to give it a minute to make sure that we have all of our speakers uh, on the call before we call any of them. Um, so I'll be coming back to you in just a moment.
Well, comrades, uh, we're ready to go now. I think with our uh, with our with our rally. I'm I'm Christine Blow, and I'm absolutely delighted to welcome you to the closing rally of today's wonderful Arise event uh, on taking the fight to the Tories and coming up with socialist solutions, of which, of course, we all know there are plenty. For those of you joining, the tens of thousands of people who've already tuned in today uh, on various platforms. This event is hosted by Arise, a festival of labor left ideas, along with a range of left organizations, campaigns and publications. And many thanks to all of you for coming along and of course to all our speakers. Today's event is the combination of 15 months of online events, of forums, of rallies, uh, hosted and streamed with hundreds of thousands of views. And I'd like to thank in particular Patrick Foley and all the volunteers for all the work they've done on making sure that this could actually come to fruition. We're really delighted to have had so many different speakers and organizations join us. That sense of solidarity of how many there are of us and bringing people together is really, uh, is really important to be able to have these discussions. You know, we've heard how the Tories have had the, one of the worst and most reactionary responses to the, in the world to the coronavirus, but not just the coronavirus, to everything. This is a terrible government. They don't have anywhere near the agenda needed to tackle the climate emergency, and they're using the pandemic to further restructure the economy in the interests of the super rich and away from the many. Such a prospect means that the left must rise to the challenges ahead. And this means working together within the Labour Party and of course, outside and beyond it. It means that at the heart, we need to be at the heart of organising anti-Tory resistance, including of course, uh, and in particular through trade unions, but in our localities and in our communities. And it means not abandoning the struggle in the Labour Party either. We must do all we can to seek to defend the gains that we made in recent years, which face sustained attacks uh, from the ruling class and those who don't, who do their bidding, who, who simply don't want our movement to be successful. So if you can, please donate, uh, as Lee said at the end of the last session, so that we can make sure that we carry on being able to have these events to bring these ideas together, to clarify them and to move the struggle forward. Uh, and without further ado, I'm now going to move on to our speakers. I can't see everyone on my screen. So I'm going to, uh, I'm going to introduce John McDonnell in the fervent hope that he is actually on the call at the moment. Um, John McDonnell MP, founder of Claim the Future. He is of course the former shadow chancellor and a great friend of the Arise Festival. And assuming that John is with us, which I can't quite see if he is, but if up, oh, no John yet, I'm being told. In that case, in that case, Sean, I'm going to give you the heads up that I'm going to move. Instead of calling John, who was due to be our first speaker, I'm going to ask Sean Errington to give a specific plug for Arise and what we've been doing. Luckily, I saw you on the screen, Sean. Thank you very much. The floor is yours. Thanks so much, Christine. Um, I just wanted to take a, a quick moment, really, um, at the start of this closing rally to what has just been a completely brilliant day. Um, and I just wanted to say thank you to everyone who has participated. We've had campaigners and activists from campaigns such as NHS Workers Say No, Stop the War, Momentum, Campaign for Labour Party Democracy, South Asia Solidarity Tribune, The People's Assembly, Palestine Solidarity Campaign, Save Our Socialists, The Morning Star, and of course, our socialist MPs. So it's been really, really fantastic that all those people have um, taken time out to to come and speak today. Um, also wanted to send best wishes to Kat Hobbs, Bel Rabira Addy MP, Laura Pickock and Lara McNeil who sadly had to give apologies but were hoping to take part today. Um, and I think like also especially a massive thank you to every one of you who have watched and listened today. It's been really, really fantastic. We've had over 1,500 of you across all the different and as this um, 
as this video like stays on the YouTube um, page, uh, we know that thousands and thousands more will watch it in the coming weeks because we've seen that happen with previous events. So that's really, really fantastic. And as I mentioned in the opening session as well, we know that there are hundreds of you from all across the country able to take part. And it's been really, really great on the participants list seeing how there's a massive core of you that have stayed with us uh, all day, um, like bobbing off during the breaks to make cups of tea. And we've also seen uh, plenty of you come in and out as well and take part in different sessions. So that's been absolutely fantastic. Um, and it's been really great as well to see some of you acting on the campaign links that have been posted in the chat. Um, a particular link that I wanted to draw your attention to uh, is uh, to the donate link that we've posted throughout the day. And we're always really clear that like, um, only donate if you can. But the reason why it's really important is that actually events such as these do still have costs. Um, much like when we are in physical meetings as a venue hire, actually there is a cost to putting on Zoom webinar and restreaming and so on. Um, a lot of all of this is put together by volunteers uh, giving up freely of their time. And it's really important to us that we're able to continue to have events such as these and that they're freely accessible to everyone. So please, if you can do donate, every little bit helps us um, to, to keep events such as these going. I also wanted to flag up two future events um, that are taking place that people will be interested in. Obviously, we've mentioned it a few times during today, um, but we're going to be on the People's Assembly demonstration on June 26th in a socially distanced and safe way. But we hope to see as many of you there as possible as well. And another event which is coming up, which is hosted by our media partner, Labour Outlook, which is the Labour Outlook Forum on July 3rd. And it's the next in a series of events called um, on, in the Why Socialist series. And this one is Why Socialists Support a United Ireland with Sinn Féin MP Francie Malloy. And um, the last thing I'm going to do before handing back to Christine is I want to read out a message uh, from someone who sadly couldn't make it uh, today, but he is a Labour Party member and a member of parliament, uh, and that's why he should have the whip restored. It's <laughs> Jeremy, who was uh, speaking at the Palestine today. It's also accompanied by a rather fantastic picture of like an enormous crowd. Um, so we'll see if we can share that. Um, but he says, um, greetings. The G7 are faced with crises on, in our environment, COVID, poverty, inequality, and the denial of human rights. None of this will be solved by wars, weapons or neoliberal economics. Let us draw strength from defeating um, uh, fights at home, such as fire and rehire, and taking inspiration from those who win power back, such as in Bolivia. Um, we need to, a platform to follow COVID by the redistribution of power and wealth here and around the world. We are many and we are very determined. Arise, Jeremy Corbyn. So solidarity to Jeremy and um, the, the Palestine demo today looked fantastic. Uh, so I'm going to hand back to Christine now. Thank you very much. Thanks, Sean. And uh, we will be hearing much more about Palestine later in this rally. But I just want to say that here in West London, where I am, uh, it wasn't the size of the demonstration that Jeremy was on, but we did have splendid banners saying from Grenfell to Gaza, from Shepherd's Bush to Sheikh Jarrah, solidarity, which I think is, I think was a brilliant activity this morning. Okay, so now we move to our, our next speaker, whom I know is here because I can see him on my screen. It's Sam Browse of Labour Outlook and an Arise volunteer. Sam, the floor is yours. Hi, uh, thanks, Christine. Uh, yeah, uh, so I'm here on behalf of Labour Outlook. Uh, as um, Chance kind of already elaborated, Labour Outlook is a media partner of um, Arise Festival. Um, we, we publish kind of news and views of a Labour left um, and uh, quite a few of our regular columnists are on this call right now as I'm speaking. Uh, so uh, check us out. Um, you can see uh, uh, you can see our website in the link and just another plug for that event on July 3rd as well. Why socialists support a united Ireland? To find out why, come along to the event. They're interactive. It's all about discussion and debate. Um, so see you there. Okay, uh, it was Rosa Luxemburg who said, if you don't move, <laughs> you won't feel your chains. And in 2015, the people moved and that movement found expression in the campaign of Jeremy Corbyn, propelling him into the leadership of the largest left party 
in Europe. And the conditions, I firmly believe, and Outlook firmly believes, leading to that eruption haven't fundamentally changed. In fact, the pandemic has meant they've intensified. So our so socialist solutions were the only solutions then, and so they are now. The economies have just pitched from juddering stagnation into nosedive, the muscular liberalism that conceived the interventions in Afghanistan, Iraq, and in Libya have transformed into a kind of out and out imperial nostalgia. We heard all about that in the last session. And the racist go home vans have been matched indeed by the scandal of Windrush and the latest deportation of black British people. And all the while the climate emergency has become more urgent while the Tories fiddle with the same market solutions that created the crisis in the first place. But people still continue to fight from the NHS workers demanding a 15% pay rise, all those workers demanding an end to poverty, sick pay, and to the scandal of fire and rehire tactics, the Black Lives Matter activists tearing down the monuments for our colonial past, the countless young people protesting their right not to inherit a burning planet, the hundreds of thousands of people who marched for the rights of Palestinians just a few week weekends ago and today, as we've just heard, and the heroic Glasgow community that lay beneath the, um, the border control buses to stop the deportation of one of their own. And I might also add to, um, leading back to what uh, Sean said earlier on, all those going to the People's Assembly demonstration on the 26th of June, which you should all attend too. People continue to strain against the change. So the Labour Party in all of this has a choice. It can stand aside and it can watch, or even worse, it can become the jailer too, cracking down on its own internal democracy to prevent discussion and debate and to prevent that tide of those movements from flooding into the party. Or it can be the instrument for breaking those chains and unfettering all those who fight to put people before profit. And that's our task, I think, on this call today, to aid that transformation and bring those struggles into the party so that Labour becomes not only the tribune of our members, but of the movements in our streets, in our communities, and in our workplaces struggling for a better world too. And that means forming a coalition based not on waving flags or attempting to appeal to the law and order imperial nostalgia of Tory votes and Tory voters, but based on a vision of society that unites everyone from the so-called red wall to the city centres in defending and extending living standards and offering a place for Britain in the world that engages constructively with the decline of American empire and the new multiple multipolar realities that we face. So that's our choice, I think. And it's a choice of all people who claim to be progressives uh, in Britain today, because comrades, the people are moving. They're straining against their chains. And the only thing that will break those chains are the white heat of our solidarity and the strong and steady beat of our socialism. So thank you today. Thank you for attending. Thank you for, for having me and solidarity. Sam, that was, uh, that's fantastic. Thank you so much for that, for that contribution. Uh, and now, uh, and now, comrades, we are joined by John McDonnell. But you know, it's uh, he, he's it's so great to be able to have John with us that introducing him twice, I think, is not really once too many. So now we're going to hear from John, as I said earlier, founder of Claim the Future, former Shadow Chancellor, and a great friend of the Arise Festival. John, thank you very much for being here. The screen is yours. <laughs> Christine, you've disappointed me. I thought in your long tradition as a teacher, you're going to tell me off for being <laughs> late as usual. Okay, can let me apologise for being late. I've, I just want to. I, people have said a lot today, from what I hear, on range of policies, etc. I just want to just lay a few words, really, which is the reason I'm late is because actually our movement is mobilising so effectively right the way across the country on so many issues. I've been, I spoke today at the Osimi Brown demonstration. People will know about Osimi, the way in which this young man who's on the autism spectrum has been treated, um, ne neglected as a child in terms of the support from the state his family should have got, imprisoned in the, the use of um, joint endeavour in the same way that so many young people have unfairly, unjustly, then comes out and now in true Windrush tradition, and now trying to send him to Jamaica where he, his family never, well, he came here when he was four. Absolutely, it's just brutal. But what was great today, there were 150 people outside the home office chanting in support of Asuma and then demonstrating 
all the way into Parliament Square. And you couldn't move in Parliament Square because you then, I spoke at the Palestine demonstration as well, which was huge, absolutely massive. And again, populated, to be frank, populated largely by young people. And it was just absolutely inspiring. I said at the Palestine demonstration, actually, that, look, I agree we should be demonstrating outside Parliament, but I think now it's time to start demonstrating in the heart of the city of London because the banks and the finance sector in this country financed apartheid in South Africa. They're now financing apartheid in Israel. So what we should be doing is now absolutely solidly swinging behind the boycott sanctions and disinvestment campaign overall. And I, what, I followed a couple of speakers, Jewish comrades, and they were so courageous and I, it was just admirable. I can't, I can't respect them enough because you know what will happen now is that they'll be condemned by trolls on social media as self-hating Jews because they stood up for the Palestinian people. But it was just wonderful. And I just want to say also, you know, with, with securing successes, I know people are still, even now, still recovering from December uh, 2019 lost the general election, but the, the way in which people have bounced back by direct action has been terrific. But also, we're winning. We're winning again. I was part of the campaign in unison, the unison broad left, the time for real change campaign. We've just won a majority on the NEC of unison. Even we didn't win the general election campaign, the general secretary election, because there was a split there's a lesson there for Unite, and I'm hoping this weekend that our comrades in Unite will be able to resolve whatever differences there are and they come out with a single left candidate. Because Unison stood to, the Unison left then learned that lesson, stood together, and we've won an overwhelming majority on the Unison executive, which will have ramifications for the national executive of the Labour Party as well. I expect the bureaucrats within Unison head office will do everything they can to undermine our election victory, but we'll slug that out and we'll succeed again. I just want to pay tribute to those people who organised so effectively in the union. And what was great about today was that there were people there advertising the People's Assembly demonstration in a few weeks' time. And again, mobilising for that. And I think it will be big. We need to make it big and we need to I think make sure it's a consolidation of the work that we're doing in our trade unions in the Labour Party and beyond and all the other campaigns. And the final point I make is that I think people have woken up to what we're facing at the moment and some of the discussions from what I've heard today are doing that. We're dealing with a proto-fascist government. We're dealing with a proto-fascist government. What does that mean? It's a government that fails to recognise some of the basic democratic institutions and democratic norms that we've developed across the globe. But particularly in this country, I've been doing this, I've launched this podcast series on the history of class struggle in our country. We didn't achieve the sort of the right to vote. We didn't achieve the right to organise in trade unions or we didn't achieve the right to have some basic welfare state without real struggle and without real sacrifices. People died for these rights in many of those struggles. And again, what we've got to do now is recognise this is a government that doesn't respect any of those institutions or any of those norms they're tearing them up and that's exactly what the police and crime bill will do it will try to outlaw protest the the way in which people could normally assemble it will also undermine democratic free speech and it just goes on and on under this government so we've got to recognize what we're dealing with usually in a proto-fascist government or a fascist government usually that government is corrupt well we have an inherently corrupt regime at the moment and it's uh, the contract awards to each other their mates etc but also the corruption of the operation of government. And we saw that with the denial of the freedom of information requests from journalists and the campaign that the NUJ has just waged and again, beaten them in court on that particular issue. So I think we know now what we're up against. So how do we respond? Well, in parliament, Richard is here, we'll tell you, in parliament, we'll do everything we possibly can. And but I have to say also now we've got a revolutionary cell in the House of Lords with Christine and others. <laughs> we'll be able to do all we can to undermine them in both chambers now and prevent legislation going through. But with their majority and most instances, they'll be able to force it through. So what does that mean? Well, we have to fall back then on direct action and industrial action. And I just give you one example of what came in the discussions today on the Sumi Brown case is that they come to try and de deport a Sumi. Um, let's do what they did in Glasgow. Let's make sure that actually we turn up in our large numbers, the mass of the people to prevent that sort of abuse going on. 
And it's the same when it comes to industrial action or climate change campaigning now. It's the point that we made in, in our manifestos time and time again. We can, we're, the, we're the many, they're the few, and the many will always win out by force of numbers, but also by force of commitment and the force of mobilization. So I think that's where we are. And to, a day like today is to ensure that actually we have a firm ideological base to our arguments and our campaign. And I'll say this one final point. We developed an ideological base in the discussions in the party through the 2017, 2019 manifestos. They were, I think they were excellent pieces of work that we were all involved in. They took us onto a, a different plateau in terms of understanding the way society works and how we can change it. We need to go further now. It requires much more radical change because the, well, first of all, because the existential, existential crisis that we face in terms of the threat of climate change, but also they need to be much more radical because the scale of poverty that we that we experience within our society as well, as well as the way in which our public service has been stripped by privatization impact upon by pandemic. So therefore, part of our job is exactly as today. Think through the ideas that we have to develop. Think through the program that we need for the future. The Labour Party has launched its policy review. There's a real fear that this will be an exercise in dumping the last two manifestos. What we've got to do now is say, actually, hold Keir Starmer to his word. He said the last two manifestos were his foundational document. They are for us. They're the foundations upon which we can radicalise. They're also put out a consultation paper about the, how they develop policy in the Labour Party. But what we've got to do is make sure we express our views that our policy will be determined by our members democratically and always will be. And that means the sovereignty of conference is upheld. Just on those final points then, Christine, I'm, I'm ebullient about the mobilisation that's going on right the way across our movement. I'm absolutely, I can't explain just how enthused I am by the way in which ideas are being thrown up in meeting after meeting, which I think are going to take us onto a different plane in terms of the political struggles that we have and the understanding of the world that we have. So all we need now actually is solidarity. And that's what I think people are expressing throughout. Solidarity. John, thank you so very much. I have to say in a very long teaching career, that is without a doubt the best excuse and explanation for lateness I've ever heard. I mean, the fact is, John, it, you are doing more than one person normally expects to be able to do it. It's certainly in a day and probably in a lifetime. So thank you very much for being here. Was, uh, those were great words. Um, I'm going to move now to our next speaker, whom I, I must say through the, um, through the Momentum Group in Hammersmith and Fulham and Kensington, Chelsea, I've heard the uh, pleasure of hearing on many occasions. It is Shanali Bhattacharya from the Momentum NCG. Shanali, up to you. Oh, thanks, Christine. Uh, and thanks so much for having me. And, and your local Momentum group are inspirational. So um, massive big up to Hammersmith and Fulham, who um, are just an awesome bunch of comrades and are really leading the way in showing what a local Momentum group is capable of. So thank you. <laughs> Um, so hello, I'm John Lee Bhattacharya, and thank you for having me here uh, this, this evening now um, at this really crucial and precarious moment for our movement, um, which I think John has outlined really well there. Um, so here at Momentum, like, we understand our key challenge in collaboration with all of you, all of our comrades across the UK left, is to ensure that the hundreds and thousands of activists ignited or re-energized by Jeremy Corbyn's leadership of the Labour Party must remain active in our movement. And we really need to break that down and work out what that looks like, which I know so many of us are already starting to do. Um, we can't pretend that this is gonna be easy. Um, there are relentless factional attacks from the right wing of the Labour Party that probably most of us have individually experienced. And of course, as John outlined, there's an increasingly hard right and authoritarian government um, who uh, we cannot, you know, we cannot pretend um, how, how critical this moment is. But I'd also say, I'd echo other speakers here, that again and again we see the resilience and the determination within our movement. Uh, so John talked about units and left activists winning a historic majority on the, their NEC, like an enormous, huge love to NEC, to, to units and left activists, amazing work. We've seen the incredible solidarity of that coalition who formed around Kill the Bill uh, against the Policing Crimes Sentencing and Courts Bill, um, which it will empower an already racist and brutal police force even further 
And we've seen the largest ever Palestine demonstrations in UK history over the past few weeks, as well with an incredible occupation of, of the Elbit site in my hometown of Leicester. I'm so proud of Leicester Comrades. Um, the inspirational anti-racist community organising against deportations in Glasgow. And of course, even in the local elections, we saw Preston and Salford councils bucking the national trend uh, through a programme of municipal socialism and community wealth building. So Momentum's three year strategy, socialist organising for a new era recognises the importance of all of this, how the struggle exists in our workplaces, in our communities, in grassroots campaigns and inside the party where comrades are organising despite the right wing. We recognise all of these wins that I've mentioned here and many others represent hours of work of deep organising and graft by many, many committed activists working in coalition and demonstrating that resilience and determination we badly need to defend our communities and build socialism from the ground up. So what does this look like within Momentum? We've been working to refound local Momentum groups, uh, once again, like the wonderful Hammersmith and Fulham across the country, supporting members to become organisers and fostering democratic decision making on local campaign priorities. So Momentum groups are socialist hubs in their communities uh, and we're supporting activists to become confident organisers with the skills and confidence to campaign against cuts, food poverty, NHS privatisation, unemployment and evictions, all of those challenges that we know we're facing on the ground in our communities. Our national eviction resistance campaign has seen over 30 housing action groups established nationally, working in collaboration with local renters unions and skilling our members up to campaign confidently and effectively. We've just launched the Leo Panic Leadership Programme with the first cohort about to engage in comprehensive training to develop our members' political education, strategic understanding and organising skills and networking those members across the country. And we've just launched, I hope you've all seen, Momentum Trade Unionists to encourage every Momentum member to become an active member of their trade union, to enable the networking of rank and file trade unionists across our movement and to facilitate political education in workplace struggles, how to challenge bosses and how to win. And we're continuing to prepare left candidates for council selection through our future councillors programme, while also developing understanding of municipal socialism and community wealth building among our members. Uh, we've got a brilliant meeting coming up next Wednesday with Matt Brown, Rianne e. Jones and our co-chair Gaia swiss Canton. So I really hope you'll all join that. So this year's Labour Party conference, which John alluded to, will be a crucial arena for our movement to defend and expand upon the advances we made in 2017 and 2019. A few weeks ago, we saw the results of Momentum's first ever democratic policy primary with local groups, affiliates and campaign organisations all drafting and submitting the motions they want Momentum to prioritise at conference. And that ended with an OMOV ballot of our, all of our members. Only we on the left have the ideas to meet the triple challenge of COVID, climate catastrophe and capitalism. And we're also working, we're, sorry, we're deepening our working relationship with a brilliant World Transform team to develop political education to our members as part of the brilliant annual festival that always runs alongside Labour Party Conference, but also throughout the year. Uh, 2020 and 2021 saw momentum partnering with TWT and Labour Campaign for Trans Rights on a much needed trans liberation political education programme designed and led by trans comrades. We're now building on that with sessions around building a socialist feminist movement for the 21st century in the run up to women's conference and also a, a momentum racial justice program, which will see momentum partnering with organizations doing vital work in and around migrant rights and racial justice to deepen discussion and understanding within our movement, to mobilize our members in support of key grassroots campaigns and to foster the self-organization of all of our black, Asian and ethnic minority members. So the bottom line is all of this work is being undertaken by enormous numbers of activists doing the hard graft to create the building blocks that we need to build socialism from the ground up. In the coming weeks, we'll also be inviting members and local groups to build a new blueprint for momentum to reshape our constitution for this new era, because like all of us, we have to be as resilient and as defiant as ever. So if you're not a member, please join us, join your local group. If you don't have a local group, maybe you're the one to start one, join Momentum Trade Unionists, join the fight against the housing crisis. Momentum is the members, and we look forward to working with all of you here this evening. Solidarity. Shani, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And having heard you before, I, I knew that was going to be good. 
And I just repeat that we're in Hammersmith and Fulham, we're now working with Kensington and Chelsea. So, so from all of the local activity where they were doing on housing and, uh, and all of the other issues, building momentum, talking about community organizing, always talking about trade unions. Uh, yes, indeed, we have got an international dimension. Uh, and as I said earlier, on the streets today, we did have banners that said Grenfell to Gaza, Shepherd's Bush to Sheikh Jarrah. And the fact is that if socialists are anything, they are internationalists. So we're absolutely delighted to be joined today by, uh, by a special guest, Kamal Hawash, who is the chair of the, Palestinian Solid of the Palestine Solidarity Campaign, of which I am absolutely delighted uh, to be a patron. Kamal is a leading uh, is a leading activist in the Palestinian community here in Britain, and a and a staunch defender and promoter of the need for freedom and justice for the Palestinians. Kamal, the floor is yours, and we're delighted to have you with us. Unmute. Thank you so much, Christine, for your introduction. And we're very proud that you're one of our patrons, as is Jeremy Corbyn. We're very proud of you both as patrons of the Palestine Solidarity Campaign. Uh, I'm grateful to Arise for asking me again to come and speak. Arise is a good word because the Palestinian people have risen. They have risen as one people across the whole of historic Palestine, from Haifa to Yaffa to Gaza, Jerusalem, Ramallah. They have risen as one people. And that was initiated, uh, as it happens, by Israel acting in such an awful way, starting with a plan to evict the Palestinian people from Sheikh Jarrah. One of the families in Sheikh Jarrah is my late cousin's family. So I've been in touch with them today and I brought a message to the uh, demonstration, which I was pleased to close earlier on. They asked us this question. They said, what do you call a situation where one people in a community are evicted from their homes and another people moved illegally by an occupying state into their homes as Israel plans to do with Sheikh Jarrah. And the answer is simple. It is called racism and it's called apartheid. So it's really important that everybody now takes it as a given that Israel is an apartheid state and then says, well, okay, if that's the case, what action should we be taking? And that was the, the purpose of the demonstration today, following a huge uh, uh, petition, which was signed by 380,000 people calling for a parliamentary debate about sanction against Israel. Uh, so on Monday, Parliament will be debating this. And of course, I have no doubt that uh, the socialist group and, and other MPs will be speaking in favor of saying enough is enough. Israel can't have the impunity that it enjoys. We must impose sanctions uh, uh, against Israel. Let me just very briefly uh, explain what BDS stands for, because sometimes people hear the, the acronym, but they're not sure what it means or what it stands for. So boycott, divestment, and sanction. We as people can boycott. Then there can be divestment, such as by a local pension uh, uh, groups, that they can divest from companies complicit in the occupation, especially companies on the UN register of, of 200 companies, a number of them British, that uh, uh, are complicit in the occupation. But the S, the sanctions, is the one we are calling for, which is where governments say enough is enough. Israel is an apartheid state, and therefore we must act. But the accusation is that movement is somehow anti-Jewish. It isn't. If you take them one at a time, what are the demands? Uh, first of all, the demand is for the end to, end to the occupation. That is a legitimate, legal, and moral demand. Secondly, equal rights for all citizens of Israel. That is a legal and moral request. And thirdly, the right of return of the Palestinian people to their home. That, again, in international law, is a legal right, and it's a moral issue. So BDS and its demands are about pressuring Israel to comply with international law, to fulfill the obligations that it has as it claims to be a normal state, but Israel refuses to do that and that is why the label sticks to it. So it's very important that uh, uh, people who very much uh, care about human rights, as we heard about a number of examples, deportations and so on, well, let's not forget that Britain promised 
my homeland, and I'm Palestinian as well as the chair of the Palestine Solidarity Campaign, campaign, it actually promised our land to a people who didn't come from it. So the problem started there, and it is now incumbent on the British government to stand up for the rights of the Palestinian people and to, to ensure that they, uh, the rights are delivered to them. It was shameful for our prime minister to say to conservative friends of Israel uh, in, in a letter that although Britain supported the International Criminal Court, it made an exception of Israel. And the reason it made an exception of Israel was, was twofold. Israel, he says, are not, is not a member of uh, the International Criminal Court and Palestine isn't a state. Well, those who remember the last war on Gaza in 2014 will also remember that Parliament, the British Parliament, voted to require the, uh, the government to recognize the state of Palestine, which to this day remains an unfulfilled position. The Labour Party has committed to immediately recognize uh, Palestine when it uh, gets into government. Uh, and we know that the, the leadership of the uh, Labour Party has changed, but that commit commitment must be upheld. And it is time, and it was good to see Keir Starmer mention Palestine at the last prime minister's question, but it was a little too late really. Apart from anything else, he's refused to meet the Palestinian community, which I think is an absolute disgrace. And he should immediately pick up the phone to the Palestinian community and talk to them. So we, I, I end my remarks by saying we very much want support from across the board because the Palestinian cause is a just cause. But we realize that there are lots of socialists who very much support the Palestinians in their attempt to, to attain uh, their rights to freedom, justice, and equality. So I thank the, the MPs and today John McDonald and, and uh, Jeremy came and spoke at the protest, but I know that others would have come if it was possible for them uh, logistically. So thank you all very much indeed for your support to the Palestinian people. The Palestinian people are, are, are united as one. They want to end the scourge of this apartheid regime that rules them and they want to be free like any other people. Thank you so much for inviting me to speak. Kamal, thank you so much for, for being with us. And, and of course, we all know that as Mandela said, no one is free, no one will be free until the Palestinians are free. So why don't you write to your, uh, why don't you write to your MP and say, not you Kamal, but everybody, write to your MP and say, Let's have a meeting with uh, Hussam Zumlot, the Palestinian ambassador, who will be able to say, as Kamal has done, exactly what the British government should be doing in these positions. And who will be able to say that, you know, this supporting the Palestinians has nothing to do with anti-Semitism. That's a really critical message for people to hear. This is about freedom and justice for the Palestinians. OK, so thank you very much for being with us today. Uh, and we will continue to support on the streets, in our unions, in our classrooms, and wherever we can until the Palestinians, uh, till the Palestinian cause has been uh, achieved. So um, now we move to our next speaker, who is Dave Allen from the TUC uh, Disabled, he's a TUC Disabled Workers Representative, uh, and he is also a member, as we can see from his very fine polo shirt, of Unite the Union. Dave. The floor is yours. Thank you, Christine. Thank you, comrades, for inviting me to address this uh, wonderful festival. First of all, solidarity, everyone. And can I say, first of all, I would prefer not to be addressing you here today, as the only reason I am here is because my close friend and colleague, Sean McGovern, who normally spoke for disabled trade unionists, sadly passed away last year. He's sadly missed by many people on this webinar today. Sean was one of the true heroes of both the trade union movement and the disabled people's movement, and he effortlessly brought the two together. He was a tireless champion for disabled people. His passion, dedication, and strategic insight is missed. And so his sense of humor, his flawless style, and the grace with which he conducted himself. Comrades, we must be upfront about the facts that this Tory government ignores or downplays. Across the UK, Six in 10 of all deaths involving COVID were disabled people. There have been over 125,000 people died. That means that over 75,000 disabled people have lost their lives. The Tories have made a myriad of excuses, including repeating the mantra that those who died were older people or had underlying health issues. But what the clear underlying meaning is that these lives, disabled people's lives, matter less 
than others. Disabled people have been forced to pay the price for government failings, often with our lives. Our government were looking into herd immunity while other governments were locking down their borders. Our government's initial strategy was herd immunity, protect the economy, and after, if that means some disabled people and pensioners die, just too bad. This was after one of the Prime Minister's aides had been publicly condemned for his views on eugenics. So those of us watching were not surprised by the government's initial response to the pandemic. There was a lot of work for our movement to do to ensure disabled workers are treated fairly and the barriers <laughs> are well removed. Our evidence, UNITE and the TUC's evidence, found in November 2020 that the disability pay gap had increased. In November, disabled workers earned an average 20% less than their non-disabled peers. This was an increase of about £800 a year compared with the 2019 findings. And in the last couple of months, the Office for National Statistics released new statistics. It found that the redundancy rates are 62% higher for disabled workers. The UK is in an economic crisis and a recession, and like the last time, disabled workers are the first to lose their jobs and the last to be rehired, and are experiencing negative changes to our interim work conditions. This is one reason why it's never more, been more important to be a member of a trade union. And the pandemic has brought to the foreground many of the issues facing disabled workers and disabled people. We have seen disabled workers step up and support our employers in less than ideal circumstances. We have continued to work from home, something we had been told for years was not possible without the reasonable adjustments we needed. However, it is now more than a year on since the first lockdown and many disabled, disabled workers are still working from home without the adjustments we need. We have heard that a year on, some disabled workers are still working from ironing boards or without the specialist software they require. Comrades, this is not acceptable. Work pro Place protections under the Equality Act have not changed under the pandemic. Employers need to meet their legal duties and put in place the adjustments workers need to do their jobs. Our members should not dread going into work because they believe they are being set up to fail. And earlier I mentioned working from home, which is for many a reasonable adjustment. And for many it is the reasonable adjustment they were told was not possible. Yet the pandemic has shown that for many working from home has not only been possible, but a reality. We have seen a home working revolution for disabled people, and this must not fade when the pandemic is past. And not all disabled workers for, first to, forced to work from home have benefited from it. Some have said the isolation has had a negative impact on their mental health. However, other disabled members who have worked from home have told us that as a result, they were able to do their job better with less pain, less fatigue, and better allow them uh, to manage their time, health condition, or impairment. We in our movement must continu continue to ensure employers put in place and keep in place members' reasonable adjustments, including home working. And going forward, we must ensure home working is at the worker's request, not the employer's demands. And finally, let me end on this note. It is important we do not forget the social model of disability, a model that this movement and I remain utterly committed to. Disabled people must be seen as equal citizens with the same rights as everyone else. We must not forget that the Tory government were found by the United Nations Rapporteur of creating a human, a human catastrophe and that there was evidence of grave and systematic violation of the rights of people with disabilities. We don't beg, we don't plead, we are not a charity, nor what we are doing is demanding our rights, our rights as full and equal citizens. The social model recognises this and sees us. It will help us remove the barriers which stop our full participation in society. We must carry on fighting. We know we must strengthen our links with deaf and disabled people's organizations like Deepak and Ruffa who are fighting back. But we can't do it alone. As many speakers have said today, we must be united together. I was part of a team with, along with Debbie Abrahams, the then Shadow Secretary of State for Work and Pensions, who wrote the Labour Manifesto for Disabled People for the 2017 general election, Nothing About You Without You. That is the kind of united working we must do. We must work together, we must fight together, and we must win. Solidarity. Dave, thank you very much indeed. And I'm, I'm sure that your, your mention of Sean McGovern was really important. I personally stood on many platforms and uh, spoke from many platforms 
with Sean, but I can tell you that people here on this call today will have been powerfully impressed today by the remarks that you made there on behalf of, uh, of disabled workers and disabled people. Indeed, nothing about us without us is a really critical slogan and it's it's true uh, it's true across the piece we must make sure that we st with, that we are in solidarity with our uh, our colleagues in the disabled workers movement so uh, we're coming we're coming close to the end of the of the rally now um, comrades and friends uh, and I'm going to make a few closing remarks before uh, handing the uh, handing the floor to our final speaker who will wind us up and send us on our way to make sure that we do everything we can to bring socialist policies to the fore. But I, I just want to say before we go to Richard that uh, it's, been, it's been a really inspirational day. In fact, it's been a reason, a really inspirational time throughout the whole of the Arise Festival. Uh, who would have known that we could actually have managed something so good online when we think about the ones that we did in person, which were fantastic, but we have actually managed something really good here. We know uh, that we are confronting a hideously reactionary and as, <clears throat> and as John McDonnell said, a proto-fascist agenda. So our work in Labour for socialist policies and, in, and for Labour Party democracy must go on so that we can show the alternative it's really important that we leave today making sure <clears throat> that we will engage in all of the actions and activities that are being called for today, that we really can promote solidarity amongst our various groups and that we will be uh, on the streets uh, in the People's Assembly in the Arise block. So there's a lot to do, comrades. There's a world to win, but we can win it with solidarity. Uh, I'm sure that I'm sure that Richard will have a great many things to say. So I close by saying we build resistance to the Tories, we popularise social, socialist solutions, and we do it together. And with that, Richard, I hand the microphone to you. Thanks very much, Christine, and thanks to uh, all the speakers, all the participants and all the attendees today. I very much enjoyed uh, listening to the uh, earlier speech, the different perspectives. It was great that there was a message from... Jeremy as well for today's closing rally and I'm glad that he spoke at the Palestine Solidarity demonstration near Downing Street today and as was mentioned earlier it's absolutely ridiculous we've got the situation where he's a Labour member and a member of Parliament but not a Labour member of Parliament as part of showing that we're serious about winning as a Labour Party and bringing the movement together the leadership needs to uh, readmit uh, Jeremy. Stop fighting uh, internal fights against the left and let's take the fight to the Tories. But anyway, having got that one off my chest again, uh, thanks everyone again for organising today's uh, rally. Uh, like others, uh, I've been at uh, a Palestine solidarity demonstration today uh, in Leeds and I want to offer my ongoing uh, solidarity to the Palestinian people. The bombs may have stopped but the oppression continues. And it's up to everyone, everyone on this call today to continue fighting for the people of Palestine so that occupation ends and so that justice is done. And I'll be bringing a bill to Parliament in the coming weeks to end British weapon sales to Israel. And I hope that you'll all encourage your local members of Parliament to uh, back uh, that bill. Now we find ourselves, as speakers have said, in the middle of an extraordinary number of crises, the public health crisis, the economic crisis, a crisis of living standards that was happening way before COVID hit, a climate crisis and even a political crisis. So I very much think uh, that today's title uh, gets it bang on, socialist solutions to the crisis, because we on the left need to be winning the arguments in our party, in our trade unions, in our communities for the way out of these crises. Because I'll, I'll tell you something, the most powerful forces in society are discussing this, they're organising their solutions, solutions that will be paid for on the backs of the 99%. So just as they think, just as they organise, we have to think and we have to organise, but more effectively. Now, a year ago, as the COVID crisis hit, we heard all sorts of rhetoric, didn't we? All sorts of rhetoric about how this crisis would bring us closer together. One year on, we can see 
that this was a downright lie because the British billionaire class has increased its wealth by 106 billion during this crisis. That's 2,000 million pounds per week. That's 290 million pounds per day. So it's been a very good crisis for some, but it's been a disaster for the majority. So many people have needlessly lost their lives from COVID in our country alone. Tens and tens of thousands of people have needlessly lost their lives. We've seen the corporate takeover of the state with a growing stench of corruption as billions in COVID contracts are handed to those with friends in high places. We've seen the crisis used as cover for further privatisation and further outsourcing with track and trace handed over to Serco and the like. We've seen an education recovery fund that thinks working class kids deserve no more than a pound per day. We've seen disabled people given insulting 37 pence benefits increases and many on furlough expected to live on less than the minimum wage. We've seen the crisis used to drive down wages and conditions to fire and rehire. We've seen attempts to pit public sector workers against private sector workers as a ploy to force down public sector pay in a race to the bottom. Now, that's all quite depressing, isn't it? But I actually am feeling optimistic. Optimistic because this crisis has really shone a spotlight on the deep failings of 40 years dominated by neoliberalism, marketization, deregulation and privatization. So this can be, and it must be, the moment when we ditch all of that and build a better society. And I'm optimistic because the public agree with us. The public want change. The polls show people want a more inclusive, fairer, more equal society to be built out of this crisis. And I'm optimistic because the old ideas, they ran down our throats for decades, are on the way out. Those ideas are on the ropes. It wasn't too long ago that we were told the state had no role in the economy, that everything should be left to the invisible hand of the market, an invisible hand that robbed workers' pockets and handed their resources to the already super rich. Well, after the banking crisis and after this COVID crisis, nobody serious is saying there should be no role in the state in the economy. And it wasn't long ago either that we were being told that you had to lower taxes year after year after year to grow the economy. Well, whatever one thinks of the detail of the G7 tax deal last week, it's very different, very different to the rhetoric of the last 40 years. So I think that change is in the air. But if left to its own devices, it will mean a capitalist state serving the capitalist class, bailing out the billionaires and letting the rest of society simply sink. We need to fight for a people state that bails out the people. And here, the wind should be in Labour's sails. We've got a centrist president of the United States announcing the end of trickle-down economics, announcing massive investment in green energy, in modern transport, in high-speed broadband, in social care, in social security, and announcing taxes on the super-rich to fund this. And even the Tories have had to adopt the language of levelling up and building back better. Now, of course, that's empty rhetoric, but it does create a space which the left can exploit, a space that the left can use to fight for a better society. So now is the moment. Now is the moment to fight for society that serves the many, not the few. We are the majority. So let's fight for a 15% pay rise demanded by NHS staff. Let's fight for a proper pay rise for all public sector workers and for a real living wage of at least £10 per hour for all workers. Let's fight for an end to fire and rehire and let's fight for an end to zero hours contracts. Let's fight for a Green New Deal Let's fight for millions of good, unionised, skilled jobs at its core. Let's fight for the building of a million council houses, for a social security system that ensures a dignified minimum income guarantee, for a right to food, for a right to free education, for an end to all NHS privatisation and for a national care service. And let's demand a windfall tax on the companies that have made super profits during this crisis and for a wealth tax on the super wealthy Two, but the powerful, as we all know on this call, will never give an inch without a fight. So we need more than just ideas. Ideas are powerful, but on their own aren't enough. 
We need to get organised around our ideas. We need to build the movements to win that new world. And the Tories will do everything, everything in their power to stop that. They will do their usual divide and rule. So when they come for migrants and travellers, we need to fight that. When they whip up attacks on Black Lives Matter, we need to fight that. Wherever they foster division, we need to build unity. Now, I know that um, I'm out of time. But I know that Matt, who does a great job at organising Arises events, wouldn't want me to end without mentioning the G7 summit. I'll be brief, but I think that the G7 leaders have two key tests. The first is on climate change. We'll only prevent the worst effects of climate change and keep global temperature rises below 1.5 degrees if the developed world meets its global commitments. That means not just doing its proper share so the world can halve emissions by 2030. It means delivering on the $100 billion per year commitment to help developing nations cut their emissions and cope with the impacts of climate change. The second big test that the G7 leaders need to pass, in my view, is to put an end to vaccine apartheid. Most countries don't have enough vaccines simply because the technology is being controlled by a handful of private companies. It's in private hands, even though the vaccines only exist because of massive public investment. As we see in India, millions of lives are at stake. Cornwall, host of the G7 summit, has had more vaccines than 22 African countries combined more vaccinations than 22 African countries combined. How can that uh, be right? So the G7 leaders, especially our own prime minister, need to stop blocking the move by over 100 countries to waive the patents and drive up vaccine production. So to conclude, they're the socialist solutions we need to be fighting for. It's not going to be easy, but as Bob Crow said, if you fight, you don't always win. But if you don't fight, you will always lose. Looking at the increasing number of demonstrations around the country, looking at the increasing number of people at uh, calls like this, listening to the other speakers, seeing our trade unions fighting back, seeing our left MPs fighting back, seeing social movements expand and push forward. All of these things make me know that there's plenty of fight in our movement. The fight in our movement is increasing and we're gonna fight. And I think that's why we're going to win. So thank you for everything that everybody on this call does. Let's carry on fighting together and let's win together. Richard, thank you very much for closing the rally. And I'll just say this, Frederick Douglass said, power concedes nothing without a demand, never has, never will. We have the demands comrades, we need to fight for them. Solidarity.